this.
down with Monroe Doctrine. Down with Monroe Doctrine, we shall not be moved. Down with Monroe Doctrine, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, we shall not be moved. Abajo la doctrina. Abajo la doctrina, no nos moverán. Abajo la doctrina, no nos moverán. Como un árbol firme, firme junto al río, no nos moverán. En la lucha, unidos en la lucha. No nos moverán, unidos en la lucha, no nos moverán como un árbol, firme junto al río, no nos moverán. We shall not be moved, we shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved Just like a tree that's planted by the waters We shall not be moved Pass! Pass! Queremos paz. Should I be helping them? Do you have okay. To, you, uh, okay. <laughs> they they, they yeah. seem like they do need a little help. Okay. okay. We All understand right. it is early in the morning. Entendemos que eh, ya estamos muy temprano en la mañana, pero paz. Paz. Queremos. Queremos. Paz. Paz. Y. Y. y libertad. Libertad. libertad en. En este, este mundo. Mundo. Spanish 101. Mm -hmm. Paz. Queremos paz. Y libertad. En este mundo. Paz. Queremos paz. Y libertad. En este mundo, para las niñas en la frontera, queremos paz y libertad. Para las niñas en la frontera, queremos paz y libertad. Más queremos paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Para los niños en la frontera queremos paz y libertad. Para los niños en la frontera queremos paz y libertad. Paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Ya no más hambre, ya no más tierra, queremos paz en esta tierra. Ya no más hambre, ya no más guerra, queremos paz en esta tierra. Paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo.
Ya no más bombas de radiación, no más ideas de exterminación. Ya, ya no, no más bombas de radiación, radiación no, no más ideas de exterminación. Más queremos paz, más queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Paz queremos, paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Sydney, Sydney Alexander, Eric Sheptock, Hola. Lucy Murphy. Muchísimas gracias. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out on such a cloudy, dismal Saturday morning. Uh, I want to first, uh, my name is Pete Kuznick. I'm professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute here at American University. Is that better? A little deep. Can you hear me okay now? Thanks. How's this? Can people hear? Great, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, my friends from Code Pink, especially Medea, Samantha, and Michelle, for doing the heavy lifting on today's program. I've been a little hobbled myself, having had a knee replacement surgery a couple weeks ago. So I've been depending on them to do all of the serious work on this. And judging from the turnout, it looks like they really succeeded. But since our focus today is on Latin America and the Caribbean, I'm gonna talk about everything else for a couple minutes to introduce our day and put it in context. I want to start with a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, in individuals, insanity is rare, but in groups, parties, nations, and epics, it is the rule. I think Nietzsche's words really apply to what's going on in the world today. And I look back to what Freud said in 1929 in Civilization and His Discontents, when he posed a new duality a duality between eros, the life instinct, and the death instinct. And it seems that collectively, as a species, we're exercising the death instinct. We're facing two major existential crises. One is the intensifying nuclear threat, the threat of nuclear annihilation. The other is planetary suicide with global warming. It was back in 2018 that the experts from the Bulletin Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. The clock began in 1947. Back in the early 50s and 53, after the US and Soviets tested their hydrogen bombs, it was moved to two minutes before midnight. That didn't happen again until 2018, uh, after the US and North Korea almost went to war. In 2020, they moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds before midnight. And then in 2021, they moved it to, or 2022, they moved it to 90 seconds before midnight. That's the reality that we're confronting now, closer to annihilation than ever. Uh, now, given how dangerous the world has become since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I would move it even closer than 90 seconds to midnight. It was a, almost a decade ago when Oliver Stone and I produced our documentary film series and books titled The Untold History of the United States. I like the Spanish title even better. 
which was La Historia Silenciada de los Estados Unidos. And this was uh, we, uh, tracing the history of the American empire back to the 1890s, this latest phase. This was post-slavery, post-genocide against Native Americans. And we're beginning in the 1890s with the Spanish-American War, the United States embarked on a path to become the leading counter-revolutionary force in the world. Uh, and it begins in Cuba, but it also begins at the same time in the Philippines. And the United States begins on this dark path. And the United States, over the next century plus, has been intervening time and again to overthrow progressive governments, to occupy countries in this policy of US domination of Latin America and the Caribbean. It was Samuel Huntington who said that uh, the West, meaning the United States, won the world, not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion, but by the superior uh, application of organized violence. Westerners often forget that fact. Non-Westerners never do. And that's what we're here to talk about in large part today. When Biden took office, some of us had a little bit of hope that he would break with the reactionary and dangerous foreign policies of the Trump administration. But we were quickly disabused of that notion. Uh, and, uh, but what we see uh, among those Westerners who reject that idea are the members of the Global South. And we're seeing them react today. Uh, the fact that, more than, that countries representing more than 75% of the world's population refuse to go along with US sanctions against Russia is not a sign that they embrace Russia's invasion, which they don't. It's a, it's a sign that uh, the world sees it much like the London Economist phrased it. it, says Biden wants to make this a struggle between autocracy and democracy, but the world sees it as a struggle between autocracy and hypocrisy. And that's the way we've got to see it. I got a phone call yesterday uh, from my friend Dan Ellsberg. Now, most of you know Dan Ellsberg is the world's leading whistleblower. Uh, he's also the leading voice warning against the threat of nuclear annihilation. And Dan has been in the news a lot lately. He's 92 years old and was recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, inoperable pancreatic cancer. And everybody has been wanting to interview him. The New York Times, the Washington Post, everybody else wants a final interview with Dan. And Dan called and said, Peter, as my current hopelessness, or fa the fact that I have pancreatic cancer and I'm on my deathbed, or is it because the world is really in such a horrible situation? And Dan understood this because the reality is that we are really closer to doomsday in many ways than we've been. But there is some hope, and this is what I, okay, this, and there is some hope, and this is what we laid out to Dan and I discussed. Now we see the initiatives taken by Xi Jinping with his 12 point peace plan. We see the initiatives taken by Lula with his outreach. My friend Oliver Stone is now producing a documentary about Lula, which is gonna be a major intervention. But Lula's peace initiative, trying to get the world behind a diplomatic solution now to the Ukrainian crisis is a major step in the right direction. Uh, I, 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 I'm about out of time, but uh, we have a day today we're gonna talk about Latin America and the Caribbean and the forces of the third world, the forces of the global south that are resisting this push for war and US hegemony as we bury the Monroe Doctrine finally after 200 years. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, uh, for those words. Um, hello, and uh, a warm welcome to everyone joining us here in person, and to many of you who are joining us virtually. A special thank you to all who have felt helped make this forum a reality, and to those making the forum engaging and accessible, including Lulo, um, who is a talented social muralist, 
will be bringing this form to life through a painting. Patrick, who's doing the live stream, Beth and Sandra, who are doing the interpretation. So for those who need interpretation, please uh, go in the back and see Beth and Sandra. Um, para eh, los que necesitan interpretación, por favor, eh, vayan a donde Sandra para sus equipos. Um, I also want to give uh, a special thank you to Angela, who's coordinating a collective board of ideas over to the left. I encourage everyone to contribute your ideas during breaks. We're here today because the U.S. unilaterally declared itself the protector of the Western Hemisphere, leading to violence and pillaging. However, where there is repression, there's always resistance. Today, we see a new world order emerging where traditional power structures are being challenged by new movements and ideologies. This is a time of change and turmoil, but it's also an opportunity for us to build a more just and equitable world. We must continue to stand up against oppression and fight for the rights of all people. I feel humbled and honored to be in the presence of so many luchadores so many fighters in this room who have been in this struggle longer than I have been alive. One of those people is our keynote speaker, Juan Gonzalez. <laughs> whose sheer determination and unyielding resilience is an inspiration. Juan Gonzalez has been fighting for what, what is right from a young age while staying true to his identity and his roots. In fact, when in kindergarten, teachers suggested that he go by John instead of Juan. Juan knew he had to speak up, and so he did, boldly proclaiming that his name was Juan and always would be. From then on, he was unapologetic about who he was and unrelenting in his pursuit of justice. Through his involvement with Young Lords Party during the late 1960s and the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights in the early 1980s, Juan discovered that he had the power not only to assert himself, but also to work with others to affect real change. Today, Juan continues to carry the lesson with him. He's an award-winning journalist and investigative reporter and author of many books, including the classic Harvest of Empire, a history of Latinos in America. He, ha he has also been the co-host of Democracy Now! since it started in 1996. Please join me in welcoming our, co our keynote speaker, Juan Gonzalez. Thank you and good morning to all of you. It is an honor to be with you all today, to be part of this grand and growing, hopefully, alliance of people's organizations, calling for an end to the Monroe Doctrine and for a new US policy toward Latin America. For more than 50 years, I have been an activist, a journalist, and a chronicler of the evolution of both the Latinx communities in the United States and of Latin America's deeply troubled relationship with US leaders. As someone who was born in Puerto Rico, the last major US colony, but who has lived my entire life in the barrios of the East Coast, I've been acutely aware of the direct connection between Latinos in this country and the peoples of Latin America. There are today 62 million people of Latin American descent in the United States. That's as the Census Bureau is of actually of 2020. 18.7% of the population. It's actually 65.2 million. If you include the people of Puerto Rico, US citizens since 1917, which the Census Bureau never does when counting US Hispanics. 
That is an astounding number when you consider that a little more than 50 years ago, when I was a young radical member of the Young Lords Party, the Latinx population was just 9.1 million and represented a mere 4.5% of the population. So the first thing that we must grasp is the, that we are living through and witnessing an historic transformation of the very composition of the U.S. population. The main theme of my book, Harvest of Empire, when I wrote it nearly a quarter century ago, is that the mushrooming migration from Latin America, Asia, and Africa to the rich nations of the world can only be understood and ultimately will only be resolved by a reckoning with the legacy of the colonial empires of the US and other Western nations that they created in those regions during the previous two centuries. Quite simply, the modern immigration crisis of the industrial direct result, an unintended result, but one nonetheless, of the political upheavals and wealth inequalities those empires produced and sustained to this day. And what, in short, were those US policies toward Latin America specifically? Repeated military, as some people have mentioned already, that led to the economic dislocation and famine in key countries. Siphoning of an enormous share of the region's national wealth to El Norte, especially through Wall Street debt financing. Political repression by Washington sponsored and trained leaders and civil wars fueled by U.S. arms shipments, and aggressive labor recruitment by U.S. industries of Latin American workers to meet the needs of those industries. When President Monroe issued his doctrine in 1823, it was hailed by Latin American leaders. At last, they thought, U.S. neutrality toward their fight for independence from Spain would end. Gran Colombia's revolutionary president at the time, Francisco de Paula Santander, praised it as, quote, an act worthy of the classic land of liberty. With the English Navy and the United States as nominal protectors of Latin American independence, the new countries of the region at least managed to avert the catastrophes that befell much of Africa and Asia when the European powers divided those regions between them during the great colonial partitions of the late 19th century. But subsequent US presidents turned the doctrine into a weapon of systematic oppression. Latin America, especially the Caribbean basin, became a US dominion with North American adventurers repeatedly seeking to grab more territory. South America's great liberator, Simon Bolivar, grew so weary of the constant arrogance from our leaders in Washington that he declared before his death the United States seemed, quote, destined by providence to plague America with torments in the name of freedom. As thousands of U.S. businessmen and adventurers headed south of the border, Latin America became the birthplace of the first great multinational U.S. corporations enriching some of the country's most celebrated families. The factual record of how the entire region was pillaged is so ample, so sordid, that it almost defies comprehension. And I don't mean the simple outright seizure and annexation of Texas and half of Mexico's territory during the Mexican-American War, territory that would later become California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and portions of Colorado and Utah. It was also the exploitation of Central and South America and the Caribbean islands. William Aspinwall, who made millions with his Panama Railroad in 1855, transporting North Americans across the isthmus from the East Coast to the California gold fields. Or Cornelius Vanderbilt's Nicaragua Transit Company, or the psychotic episode of soldier of fortune, William Walker, who during his two-year rule as a dictator of Nicaragua in the 1850s, reinstituted slavery, declared English an official language of Nicaragua, and was welcomed at the White House. More than 11,000 North Americans moved to Nicaragua during Walker's reign, 
with three to 5,000 joining his occupation army. There was the infamous United Fruit Company, the first great U.S. multinational corporation with plantations in Cuba, Honduras, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Colombia, its own railroads and shipping companies, the most powerful force in the region. There was the Havemeyer family, sugar trust that monopolized all sugar supplies to the United States with plantations in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, shipping all their produce to refineries in Brooklyn, Boston, and Baltimore under the name of Domino Sugar. There was the Guggenheim family, with its massive investments in Mexican railways, and the Hearst family, with cattle ranches of more than a million acres in northern Mexico. During the late 19th century reign of dictator Porfirio Diaz, Mexico was basically sold off to foreign investors. By 1910, more than 40,000 North Americans had settled in Mexico. 15,000 of them had gobbled up land and they controlled 130 million acres, 27% of the entire surface area of Mexico was owned by US citizens. Americans own 78% of Mexico's mines, 73% of its smelters, 58% of its oil, 68% of its rubber business. 1898, of course, was the climactic year for the creation of the U.S. colonial empire. It has been stated with the seizure of Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Philippines, and Guam during the Spanish-American War. But the list of direct military interventions that ensued during the 20th century is mind-boggling. The sponsoring by Teddy Roosevelt and the U.S. Navy of a whole country, Panama, just so Americans could secure land to build the Panama Canal. Interventions in Nicaragua five different times, including the war against Sandino liberation fighters from 1926 to 1933 and the CIA funding of the Contras in the 1980s. Mexico invaded three times, Honduras twice, Cuba three times after 1898 not counting the CIA-sponsored Bay of Pigs fiasco in 1961. Guatemala and the Arbenz coup in 54. Chile and Allende coup in 1973. The Dominican Republic invaded three times, including President Johnson's sending of thousands of U.S. troops in 1965 to squash a people's revolt for democracy. Haiti in 1915 and again in 1994. Panama again in 1918, 1925, 1989. If Latin America had not been pillaged by U.S. capital since its independence, millions of desperate workers would not now be coming here in such numbers to reclaim a share of, the, of that wealth. And, and if the United States is today the world's richest nation, it is in part because of the sweat and blood of copper workers of Chile the tin minders of Bolivia, the fruit pickers of Guatemala and Honduras, the cane cutters of Cuba, the oil workers of Venezuela and Mexico, the pharmaceutical workers of Puerto Rico, the ranch hands of Costa Rica and Argentina, the West Indians who died building the Panama Canal, and the Panamanians who maintained it. But all that exploitation sparked a result the empire never expected. By World War II, with migration from Europe closed off, the U.S. initiated the Bracero program, recruiting and contracting as many as 350,000 Mexican workers a year and tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans to work in U.S. factories and fields. The result of all that labor contracting and all the instability our foreign policy created has resulted in multiple Latino migration waves to the U.S. differing not only in their ethnic and racial characteristics, but in their classic origins. Throughout all of this, the Monroe Doctrine has been the excuse for U.S. meddling. It has never been renounced by the U.S. Even the Pope and the Vatican finally rejected this year the doctrine of discovery. The white supremacist theory that justified European domination of the native peoples of America, but our government still clings to Monroe's words, America under Washington control. Thankfully, most Latin American nations no longer follow dictates from the US. 
Recent elections in Mexico, Honduras, Colombia, Brazil, and Chile have brought progressive governments to virtually the entire region, and China's rise in the world economy has meant new loans and financing for the region's needs without the same strings that always came with loans from the Western banks. There are no wars, no major wars in Latin America today, no nuclear weapons, a growing commitment to tackle wealth inequality. The region has gone from a place of despair to one of hope. You don't hear any mention of this in the U.S. commercial media's reporting on Latin American migrants, coverage that always seems to focus on the images of chaos and border at a border overrun. So much of the immigration debate focuses more on heat than light, more on one-sided sloganeering than dispassionate discourse, more on stoking the worst emotions among the American people rather than an honest attempt to understand the roots of the problem than devise the most humane and sensible solutions. Throughout the administration of four presidents, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and now Joe Biden, congressional leaders have failed to agree on how to overhaul the U.S. immigration system. They failed to resolve not just the fate of unauthorized migrants within the country, but also to modernize outdated guest worker programs or to refashion processes for granting permanent visas and handling asylum seekers and refugees. They have repeatedly deadlocked on such an overhaul precisely because the stakes are so high in an increasingly multiracial nation. Any comprehensive re immigration reform, after all, will determine who can legitimately become a U.S. citizen in the 21st century. It will reshape the, vote, the nation's voting population for decades to come and will alter the distribution of political and economic power at both the national and local level, and they know it. That's why they resist immigration reform. Our immigration crisis, however, is not unique. Ever since the end of World War II, the peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, of the third world of the global south, have been coming to the west. England doesn't know what to do about all the Pakistanis, Indians, and Jamaicans. France doesn't know what to do about all the Algerians, Tunisians, and Moroccans. Germany doesn't know what to do about all the Turks and Syrians. The Netherlands about all the Indonesians. And in the United States, our leaders have grappled for decades with what to do about all the Latin American and Caribbean peoples and increasingly Africans and Asians that have migrated here. The key thing to understand is that the migrations have come from the very countries those metropolitan powers once colonized or dominated. And in recent years, we've seen the heartbreaking images of boat people crossing the Mediterranean to get to Italy, Greece, and the Balkan states with thousands perishing at sea in their attempts, but tens of thousands reaching Europe, many corralled into camps and detention centers. Where do these refugees come from? From Syria, from Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, countries where during the past two decades our own government's military interventions, occupations, and targeted bombings and assassinations have tragically led to greater violence and instability than previously existed. The sudden surge of people fleeing one country for another did not arise from thin air or from individual decisions made to simply seek a better life in another country. Rather, they are manifestations of profound flaws in the economic and political systems of our modern world. Much of it, I would submit to you, is the unintended harvest of past colonial empires and of a new stage of economic and political domination where the U.S., an empire in decline, is determined to use its military might to master the world, a rules-based order where Washington makes all the rules. But these migrations have been going on for so long now that they have reached critical mass, where they have begun to transform the actual composition of the receiving nations. Latinos in the U.S. are in a unique position among all the modern migrant groups. We come from a region of the world that has not only provided the bulk of this country's new migrants for the past 50 years, some of us trace our heritage to families that were living on what is now the U.S. before it was the U.S. And a growing number of Latino migrants trace their origins to the indigenous, uh, the indigenous peoples of America, 
or descendants from the enslaved Africans of the region. The enormous contributions of the Latin American diaspora to US prosperity rarely gets acknowledged. It is critically important to extol those contributions when others try to disseminate stereotypes of Mexico and other Latin American nations sending only criminals and paupers. Even today, the hardest, most menial, and least appreciated work in the US is performed by Latino migrants. Those who pick the fruits and vegetables that nourish us, who butcher the meat and poultry we consume, who tend our lawns and repair our roofs, who build our houses and haul our waste, who clean the hotels we use and the office buildings where we work, who wash the dishes and clear the tables in restaurants where we eat, who keep our universities clean and sparkling, are invariably Latino. After 60 years of steady migration, the children of those Latin American migrants, most of them born or raised in this country, are on the cusp of transforming the United States. There are three million Latinx youth enrolled in American colleges and universities today. And the public school population is even bigger. More than 50% of the children in Texas and California public schools are Latino. More than 25% in Illinois and New York. 15% to 17% in Georgia and North Carolina. Many of them have been involved with the Dreamers leading the movement to legalize not just undocumented youth, but their parents and relatives as well. But Latino youth across the nation have said presente to other issues as well, the quest for answers to the disappearances of the students of Ayutzinapa and to all the mass violence in Juarez and all of Mexico, to stopping the detention of migrant children and families at the border, ending police abuse, racial profiling, and mass incarceration of black and Latino youth for minor offenses, winning a big jump in the minimum, in the minimum wage and paid sick leave for all who are employed. But there's much more to do, especially in the area of saving our planet from the ravages of climate change and achieving full equality for lesbians, gays, and transgender individuals. And many of you are involved in those causes as well. In 1969, when I was a young Latino activist, I helped found, as mentioned, the Young Lords, a radical Puerto Rican group, and later the National Congress of Puerto Rican Rights. The Lords, along with the Brown Berets, Mecha, La Raza Unida Party, August 29th Movement, Casa, had enormous influence on my generation despite arrests and beatings and persecution that we endured. Our activism opened these universities to black and brown students. It achieved the creation of the first Puerto Rican, Chicano, and Latino studies programs, the hiring of the first Latino professors, our free breakfast programs, and those of our allies in the Black Panther Party, uh, and our exposure of the ep epidemic of lead-based pain in urban uh, tenements led to reforms that eliminated uh, lead-based paint. That summer of 1969, a, a young Puerto Rican poet and supporter of ours named Pedro Pietri recited for the first time at one of our sit-ins a new poem he had just finished writing. He called it Puerto Rican Obituary. It is one of the great epic poems of the 20th century. And Pedro would go on to become internationally acclaimed for his work. Hearing him recite it, cemented my lifelong commitment to fighting for social justice. I want to share a few lines with you because it still speaks not just to Puerto Ricans or Latinos, but to every North American and Latin American of working class origins. And this was the start of Pedro's poem. They worked. They were always on time. They were never late. They never spoke back when they were insulted. They worked. They never took days off that were not on the calendar. They never went on strike without permission. They worked 10 days a week and were only paid for five. They worked, they worked, they worked, and they died. They died broke. They died owing. They died never knowing what the front entrance of the first national city bank looks like. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga, Manuel, all died yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow, passing their bill collectors on to the next of kin. All died waiting for the Garden of Eden to open up again under a new management. 
all die dreaming about America, waking them up in the middle of the night screaming, Mira, Mira, your name is on the winning lottery ticket for $100,000. All died hating the grocery stores that sold them make-believe steak and bulletproof rice and beans. All died waiting, dreaming, and hating. Dead Puerto Ricans who never knew they were Puerto Rican, who never took a coffee break from the Ten Commandments to kill, kill, kill the landlords of their cracked skulls and communicate with their Latino souls. And that's just the first few stanzas of this remarkable poem that awakened and inspired a generation of the Latin American diaspora. Pedro passed away in 2004 at the age of 59, but he lives in his timeless verse. It is up to us, but especially the young people of this country, to demand a new way, an end to the empire whose evil deeds the Monroe Doctrine first sought to cloak in elegant words. There has been progress. Latin America is no longer the backyard of the empire. It is the front yard of a world movement for social justice and peace. From Mexico to Honduras, from Cuba to Venezuela and Nicaragua, from Colombia to Brazil and Chile, from Bolivia to Argentina, the governments and peoples of Latin America are charting their own future. Take Chile, for example, with one of the world's biggest reserves of lithium, the holy grail of electric batteries. President Rafael Boric announced this week that he will seek to nationalize the uh, lithium mining in his country and will involve Chile's indigenous groups in helping this, to decide a humane way to develop this vital resource. His announcement sent tremors through many capitalist circles. But Latin America no longer, fear, no longer fears the CIA, the IMF, and their own right-wing elites, determined to live in a multipolar in a multipolar world, to sell their goods and build alliances with whoever treats them with respect, whether it is be a European power or Russia or China or the US. They are tired of Washington demanding obedience to its version of democracy and reacting only with sanctions, arrogance, and regime change to all who dare challenge its hegemony. We are here today to say those days are over. It's time the American people learned the truth about the US role in Latin America. Time that Congress, the White House, and all Americans of goodwill demand an end once and for all to the heinous Monroe Doctrine and the ideology behind it. Yeah. We will spend the rest of the day discussing ways to spread this message throughout the land to ordinary Americans and to their elected officials. So let's get to work, and as we used to say in the Young Lords, pa'lante, siempre pa'lante, hasta la victoria. Thank you. Big round of applause, please. Thank you. Palante. So uh, my name is Marco Castillo. Good morning, everyone from uh, Global Exchange. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to be the timekeeper this morning. We want to have a program where everybody gets a chance to speak. And we uh, are going to be just like uh, trying to make sure that we move along the program uh, swiftly. So right now, we're going to welcome the members of our first panel. Please come up to the, to the table, please, at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, our moderator will be introducing them. Great speech, indeed. Uh, please help me welcoming Frederick Mills, please. Dr. Frederick, if you're so kind, take it over. Greetings and Thank you to Juan Gonzalez for that inspiring 
speech that set the tone. <laughs> On behalf of the America's Forum Planning Committee, I'd like to welcome panelists and participants, both present and online, to our first panel discussion on opposing sanctions and unilateral intervention. My name's Fred Mills. I'm professor of philosophy at Bowie State University and deputy director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. We stand at a crossroads, as Juan Gonzalez pointed out, a crossroads of transition in both the geopolitical and regional spheres. These are ultimately immediately related. The Monroe Doctrine today is in part an expression of the contradiction between the US-NATO drive to impose a unipolar world and the already emergent multipolar world. In the Western Hemisphere, the community of Latin American Caribbean states, CELAC, has declared the region a region of peace and rejects pressure to be part of the new Cold War. There's an ongoing clash between Monroeism and the irreversible Bolivarian cause of regional integration and independence. It's time to bury the Monroe Doctrine, which is based on coercion and domination, and for the US to transition to a foreign policy based on respect for the sovereign equality of nations, a sovereign equality which has its seat in the people. Our focus in this panel is a US deployment of illegal economic sanctions aimed at undermining democratically elected progressive governments in Latin America and the Caribbean and limiting their self-determined collaboration with Russia, China, and other trading partners. Combined with hybrid war interventions, these unilateral coercive measures are responsible for mass deaths, hardship, emigration, and billions of dollars in asset theft. These measures are illegal under international and humanitarian law. They violate human rights by disrupting elected governments in their efforts to provide citizens with food, pharmaceuticals, fuel, and sanitation supplies. This panel will address the political, legal, ethical, and economic dimensions of sanctions and their devastating impact on general populations. But it will also address the strategies by which Latin American and Caribbean governments and citizens circumvent sanctions and advance their own approaches to development, foreign policy, trade, and security, despite the hardships. Our first speaker, Dr. Steve Elner, is a US scholar who has taught economic history and political science at Universidad de Oriente, Venezuela, since 1977. He's the author of numerous books and journal articles on Venezuela, Venezuelan history, politics, and organized labor. He's also an associate managing editor of the journal Latin American Perspectives. Dr. Elner received his MA at Southern Connecticut State University and his PhD at the University of New Mexico. All of his degrees are in Latin American history. Welcome, Dr. Elner. Is this, is this mic? Okay, I better turn it on. Just move it closer. No, no, no. Yeah.
Big round of applause, please. We feel your pain. Black people, indigenous people, build this country. We're going to take a five break, please, and then come back to continue with the panel as we um, help us. Here, please. Ma'am, uh, everything you're saying is valid. We're, we're, we're not disagreeing with you at all. You have very good points. If, if you look at me, I'm one of these folks you're talking about. So, so, we're, so everything you're saying is valid. You know, and and we're and we're not at all uh, disagreeing with you. Okay. Yes. True.
the world is gonna last forever and ever. We're gonna change the world. Gonna do that again. No more racism. We are gonna change the world. No more racism. We are gonna change the world. No more racism. We are gonna change the world. It's gonna last forever and ever. We're gonna change the world. No more sexism. No more sexism. We are gonna change the world. No more sexism. We are gonna change the world. No more sexism. We are gonna change the world. It's gonna last forever and ever. We're gonna change the world. The homophobia. We are gonna change the world. No homophobia. We are gonna change the world. No homophobia. We are gonna change the world. It's gonna last forever and ever. We're gonna change the world. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. Thank you for bearing with us. We'll continue with the program. This is the world that we live in. It is okay. It is fine. She's got a, she, she had to express something, and we just wanted to make sure that she didn't feel kicked out of the room, heard, and then we all laughed with her. I think she's in good hands. I think we're good to go with the program. I don't think we need to have any violence and, and to deal with this situation because we feel her pain. We are here to reflect and think, how do we deal with that pain? Because it's a reality. She's carrying the pain of millions of people, centuries. And that's what we're here for. She's another big reason to keep fighting and keep working. So let's get going with the program. And thank you very much. All yours. politicians, uh, the policy makers in Washington are divided over the Baroque Act and divided over uh, U.S. policy in Latin America in general. Nevertheless, there are some people who say, and I'm one of them, that that division between the uh, soft left and uh, the, rather the soft liners and the hard liners in Washington, uh, the difference perhaps in many ways between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, that that division is in essence, it's a division between the good cop and bad cop. Uh, the famous, you know, um, binary of the good cop and the bad cop, but really both are on the same page, uh, both are pursuing the same objectives. But the Republicans in general represent the hard winners when it comes to Latin America. And yet there are a number of very important Democrats who are also in that camp. For instance, Bob Menendez, uh, who heads the Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee. Uh, and some may ask if the Democrats are really serious about representing an alternative to the Republicans when it comes to foreign policy in general, when it comes to foreign policy in, in Latin America, why did they allow a hard, li a hard liner, somebody who many people say is really a Republican when it comes to uh, foreign policy, why did they allow Bob Menendez to hold that position? is best articulated by the neocons. The neocons who say that the Mon Monroe Doctrine is alive and well. And that, those aren't my words. Those are John Bolton's words when he was uh, security advisor, uh, national security advisor. And he said, and I quote, the, in this administration, in other words, the Trump administration, we're not afraid to use the phrase Monroe Doctrine. 
The second position was expressed by John Kerry when he was Secretary of State. Uh, and in a speech, uh, he stated that the U.S. policy is no longer about the Monroe Doctrine. The Mon Monroe Doctrine uh, no longer represents U.S. policy. Um, and his exact words in that speech was, it's about all of our countries viewing one another as equals, sharing responsibilities, cooperating on security issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the United States doesn't renounce intervention. The United States renounces uh, unilateral in intervention. And you might say that uh, in certain ways that idea that the United States um, doesn't intervene unilaterally, that, that very concept goes back to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, some people back in 1823 uh, favored a joint statement between the United States and Great Britain uh, directed against the Euro European powers on the continent of Europe. But in the case, um, what about that statement that Kerry made, that the Monroe Doctrine is over and the United States doesn't intervene unilaterally? Well, what about uh, the UN votes on the sanctions against Cuba during the Obama administration? Um, they all, you know, the, the vast majority of nations voted and continue to vote in f in, uh, against the sanctions against Cuba. Um, and minutes, also please. in the case of Venezuela, uh, it was under Obama that the sanction regime was really established against Cuba, uh, I'm sorry, against Venezuela. When in 2015, uh, Obama declared Venezuela a threat to US national security, and at that moment, uh, seven Venezuelans were sanctioned. And that really opened the doors, that set the stage for the uh, regime, uh, sanction regime of the Trump administration who, and those sanctions were really designed to strangle the Venezuelan economy. But the main question now is with regard to Biden. Um, has Biden softened his position on, on the position of the US government on sanctions and has Kerry's statement with regard to unilateral intervention, the United States uh, renounces unilateral intervention, is that really the policy of the Biden administration? Well, look, at, in the case of Nicaragua, the sanctions in 2022 and up until the present have been tightened, have been intensified. Um, and there is no evidence at all that the Biden administration is <coughs> thinking in terms of phasing out the system of, of sanctions. Um, uh, the um, uh, Biden administration has really changed course in terms of the strategy of the Trump government, because under Trump, the policy was regime change. Uh, and now Biden's policy is not that, not to say that people in Washington don't want to change regimes in Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, just that it was evident, uh, among the Democrats at least, prior to the 2020 elections, that, this, that the regime change strategy of the Tr Trump administration had failed. Uh, Chris Murphy, the senator from Connecticut, stated that prior to the elections, that regime change was a failure and some other policy or some other strategy had to be pursued. Three minutes. How many? Three more. Three minutes. <laughs> I, I was all set on uh, 15 minutes, but I didn't realize that 15 minutes. No, no, 15. sure, 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 you got 15 minutes. What's that? You're how many, for how five. Many minutes do I have? You have 15 minutes. But you're, yes, but you already took 12. 12. 12. <laughs> I'm, it's fun. I'm talking slower than I thought. Time flies. <laughs> okay. Well, um, let me just sum up then. Um, uh, yeah, okay. I, I'll just make this final point. And that is that the Biden administration uh, is in some ways more hypocritical than Trump. Not to say that I'm pro-Trump at all. Uh, but if you consider the rhetoric coming out of Washington, under Trump and today. Uh, under Trump, the idea was regime change, and the regime change to uh, you know, uh, change a dictator 
and bring in democracy in Venezuela and perhaps in Cuba. Uh, that, of course, was a bogus justification. We all know that. But in the case of Biden, the strategy is, is different. The strategy is one of horse trading. We will lift some sanctions if, if Maduro, for instance, uh, makes certain concessions to us. Concessions in the area of geopolitics, concessions in the area of political change in favor of not the opposition in general, but the hardline opposition, who are the people that we're supporting uh, in Venezuela, and also um, economic changes in favor of investments in Venezuela. For instance, in the case of uh, geopolitics, it's been made quite clear to Maduro that if he were to move away from Russia with regard to the Ukraine, Ukraine conflict, that the United States would lift certain sanctions. Um, with regard to economic policy, Bloomberg News, among other newspapers, have indicated uh, in detail that the Maduro government has to move away from status type policies, which he has to a certain extent. Uh, he has implemented uh, certain pro-business or business-friendly policies. And uh, the leftist factions within uh, the left in Venezuela have very, very harshly criticized him, beginning with the Communist Party of Venezuela. But he's made those moves, but Washington wants more. And that is evident reading Bloomberg and other newspapers in terms of the specifics, what uh, Maduro has to do in order to get sanctions partially lifted. And with regard to the opposition, yes, uh, the negotiations that are now taking place um, and uh, the attempt to establish negotiations uh, or re-zoom negotiations in Mexico favors the hardline opposition. If the hardline opposition, which is Guaidó's Voluntad Popular, Acción Democrática, Primero Justicia, Un Nuevo Tiempo, que, their, 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 groupings, uh, their grouping is called uh, La Plataforma Unitaria. Um, if they were to come out against sanctions, the United States would uh, lift the sanctions, but they, they're, they're not. The opposition is divided between those hardliners and a more moderate, pragmatic, I would say sensible opposition that is opposed to the sanctions, that recognizes the legitimacy of the Maduro government. The United States is not with them. They're with the hardliners. And so our policy with regard to sanctions is really designed to favor, to promote U.S. interests when it comes to geopolitics, when it comes to politics, and when it comes to the economy. You'd call, I would call that hypocritical. Now, many of you may say, why am I calling Uncle Joe hypocritical? But the fact of the matter is that there's no veneer as there was under Trump. The United States is out to defend its interests, promote its interests, and at the expense of the people of Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Elner. Our next panelist, Sarah Flounders, has been active in people's movements for change since the 1960s. Presently, she coordinates the International Action Center, the Sanctions Kill Campaign, and works with United National Anti-War Coalition. She's a contributing editor of the Marxist newspaper, Workers' World, and challenges US wars on alternative and corporate media outlets. She has organized past solidarity delegations to countries devastated by US wars and sanctions. She recently returned from sanctioned Nicaragua. Flounders has co-authored and edited 10 books on US wars, sanctions, and expanding NATO. She recently released the anthology, Sanctions, a Wrecking Ball in a Global Economy, and worked on a Chinese-US documentary with Chinese-English-Spanish subtitles called Vaccines and Sanctions. Welcome, Sarah Flounders. Good morning. Let's talk about the death of the Monroe Doctrine. It's an honor to participate in this exchange today, and as part of the Sanctions Kill campaign, I couldn't agree more with the focus on sanctions, blockades, and coercive economic measures. Our Sanctions Kill campaign is dedicated to explaining how sanctions 
as a crime against humanity intentionally targets the most vulnerable and deprives millions of basic essentials. Now, 40 countries, 40 countries, a third of the global population is impacted by sanctions. Mm -hmm. Sanctions by the US and its allies have caused millions of deaths around the world. I've seen this up close in many trips to Iraq during the 1990s. I've seen the impact of sanctions in isolated, surrounded Gaza, in Israeli-bombed Lebanon, in Sudan during famine, in former Yugoslavia. I was there during the US-NATO bombing. And you see it in resilient Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua in this hemisphere. But there are new forms of resistance arising, and I want to deal with three different kinds of resistance. First, resistance by developing economic self-sufficiency. Now, North Korea survived 70 years of the world's harshest international sanctions, and they have a term for self-reliance, juche. Now, I'm going to deal more with Nicaragua because it's so under such harsh attack and propaganda war right now, and because I was recently in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua today, 90% self-sufficiency in food. That's a big accomplishment. <laughs> Nicaraguans coped heroically with COVID, with door-to-door -door healthcare, while the US blocked their access to vaccines. Education is free. The Sandinista government has developed essential infrastructure especially in roads, health clinics, and schools. Nicaragua now ranks among the top in the world in, general, in gender parity. Women fill more than half the seats in the legislatures, local to national, and in administration, medicine, in the rural economy, bottom to top. Yet small Nicaragua is declared a US national security threat. As a matter of fact, an extraordinary threat, hmm. precisely because they're the threat of a good example, an alternative in a neoliberal world. The US tries to justify its inhumane sanctions by funding a whole host of NGOs that interfere in the internal affairs, not only of Nicaragua, but every targeted country. In the midst of sanctioning Nicaragua, a balanced, uh, biased, sensationalized human rights report was leaked this March 2023 with the corporate media playing their usual role. This report didn't take the well-documented material from the Nicaraguan government that was readily available. No, no. And I, I happened to be in Nicaragua when this, when this latest smear campaign report was released. It was to justify US instigated violent regime change operation in 2018 and its host of paid operatives. So-called human rights that the US so frequently accuses targeted countries of violating are little more than a cynical ploy, a weapon, a club. And our role as solidarity activists here in the US is to refuse to be part of the US propaganda machine that promises human rights while delivering misery. I, I hope everyone here will take an opportunity to sign the statement rejecting these fraudulent reports and these continuing attacks that Nicaragua is a threat out at the Nicaragua solidarity table. Now, the second force of resistance is the growing solidarity among the sanctioned countries themselves. For example, Cuba, who provides more doctors than the World Health Organization in Africa, Cuba developed its own COVID vaccine to share with the Cubans and with the world. But they didn't have and couldn't get the syringes for their own population to give them the shot. That took an international solidarity campaign. And that's another part of resistance to sanctions. 
It's all of us here building solidarity and the aid campaigns with the countries under sanctions. We're a part of this, and it's by not being confused by the propaganda campaigns of the U.S. The web of thousands of U.S. restrictions that strangle economies for the benefit of corporate power is growing. In the past 20 years, U.S. sanctions grew from 912 to 9,421. That's astronomical. And I repeat, it's now 40 countries, a third of humanity, under sanctions attack. Five minutes. The third part of resistance to sanctions is coordination among sanctioned countries. Sanctions are part of regime change strategy to promote hyperinflation, chronic shortages, supply chain chaos. These sanctions undermine social progress, such as land distribution, food subsidies, and expanded education and health care. What's new? What's new, though? Change is coming rapidly with earth-shaking implications, and these new developments are burying the Monroe Doctrine that asserted that no foreign power except the U.S. would be allowed in Latin America and the Caribbean, and any intervention in the political affairs of the Americas by foreign powers was a hostile act against U.S. interests. Well, 200 years later, the countries of Latin America are collectively acting and finding alternatives to this continuing threat of invasions and coups and sanctions. China is now South America's top trading partner. partner. Between 2000 and 2020, China, Latin America, and Caribbean trade grew 26-fold from $12 billion to $310 billion. China is now among the top sources of foreign direct investment and finance. And now, sanctioned Russia, Iran, China provide vital lifelines to sanctioned Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Isn't that a change? All of these countries are determined to survive and thrive. The impact is wider than trade just among the sanctioned countries. China is now the dominant trading partner for Chile, Peru, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Ecuador. China, Brazil, and Argentina just signed a deal to trade in their local currencies. The BRICS countries, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and their new development bank, they offer an alternative to the U.S.-dominated International Monetary Fund. U.S. strategists, both Democrat and Republican, are worried because the sanctions are losing their threat. Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Janet Yellen, she's a former chair of the Federal Reserve, she admitted that Washington's imposition of unilateral sanctions on countries around the world could weaken the dominance of the dollar. She conceded U.S. sanctions create a desire to find an alternative to the dollar. And likewise, Republican Senator Marco Rubio complained, we won't have to talk about sanctions in five years because there'll be so many countries transacting in currencies other than the dollar. And Three we minutes. won't have the ability to sanction them. I'm winding up. Of course, these war criminals are concerned about their almighty dollar dominance and not with the human consequences of sanctions. We got to make that distinction. The, it was the imposition of US and EU sanctions on Russia based on the NATO war in Ukraine that undermined the U.S. use of sanctions dramatically. The sanctions didn't create an economic collapse in Russia, as Biden predicted, but cutting the trade hurt the EU economy far more than the Russian economy, and it forced the birth of de-dollarization. There will still be ruthless decisions to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, but U.S. imperialism, the biggest impediment to development and progress in Latin America and the Caribbean, is being severely challenged. U.S. corporate domination is in a constant alliance with the most reactionary forces. Now, in closing, I want to say a word on reparations, because justice demands we support reparations for the sanctioned countries, for the damage to their economy, the shortened lives of their population. In in 1986, the International Court of Justice ruled that the U.S. violated Nicaragua's so uh, sovereignty in the arming and training of the Contras, the mining of Nicaragua's harbors, and was due reparations. 
the U.S. didn't pay. In 2017, Nicaragua revived their claim against the United States for compensation of $17 billion, reparations they should pay. France owes Haiti at least $28 billion in return for reparations that Haiti was forced to pay for freeing themselves from enslavement. How outrageous. Consider the wealth stolen not only from sanctioned Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, but all the countries of the global former colonized South. Just as descendants of enslaved and indigenous people in the US are due reparations for stolen land and stolen labor, so too are the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean due reparations for past US invasions, expropriations, and sanctions. In closing, I want to say a word about the case of Alex Saab, the Venezuelan special envoy who's imprisoned by the US because he helped bring desperately needed humanitarian supplies, food, fuel, medicine, to Venezuela in convention of the illegal sanctions. And he was doing it by legal trade and exchange. I traveled to Cabo Verde when Alex Saab was being held captive, tortured, to bring attention to his case. Alex Saab was kidnapped again and brought to Miami, where he's now imprisoned. His cancer, which was in remission, has reasserted, and he is without adequate medical treatment. And in this emergency, I do want to urge this conference to find a way to go on record calling for Alex Saab's release. So I say to the family here, in conclusion, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua in our hemisphere are targeted for regime change by the US empire. And it's not because of the things they've done wrong. It's because of the things they've done right. They give us a glimpse of a better world, an alternative vision from the imperialist dominated unipolar world order. And that's why they're being attacked. And we got to stand in solidarity with them and their right to defend themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Flounders. As you can see, we have a great mix of presentations. And thanks to Dr. Elner for opening a window on US politics and sanctions. And to Sarah Flounders for the excellent schema for understanding sanctions, and, and in particular, those three forms of resistance. Now I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Liz Oliva Fernandez. She's an award-winning Cuban journalist and producer with Belly of the Beast. She's won a Gracie Award and was co-winner of a One World Media Award for her work presenting the documentary series, The War on Cuba. Apart from her journalism and filmmaking, Fernandez is a dedicated anti-racist and feminist activist. Let's welcome Liz Oliva Fernandez. I feel honored. Um, I know that I have just a couple of minutes, so I'm going to be quickly. Before I start my presentation, I just want to say that uh, the episode we have here today, I have been seeing this pain during the many screamings that we have been doing in the United States. So I just want to say that I stand with this, uh, in, solid, in solidarity with the black people in the United States. We have the same enemy, the US imperialism. So if there is something that I can do, just let me know. Uh, let's talk about Cuba. When I graduated from journalist school in 2016, I never imagined that I would spend most of my career taking, talking about US sanctions against my country. At the time, Young and eager to eat, the, eat up the world, I longed to tell the people of Cuba about our internal problems and hold our government accountable. I felt it was my duty to be the voice of the voiceless. At that time, of course, I knew about the US sanctions against my, against my country. I had been hearing about them all my life, so much so that it had become second nature to me. And I was tired of hearing the same speech over and over again, no understanding how it worked or why we keep repeating the same things decades later. I didn't know the story of Ernesto, a farmer who dreamed of being athlete, but who lost both his legs in the 90s, and since then has not been able to get the prosthetics he needs. 
Not because Cuba doesn't want to buy them, but because it's illegal for Cuba to buy them in Europe, but because 10% of the materials used to make them come from the United States. At the time I finished university, Cuba was booming. Presidents Raul Castro and Barack Obama had announced the normalization of relations between the two countries. Sanctions had been easy, and Havana was a beautiful, thriving place where people around me talk about entrepreneurship and future projects inside Cuba. That was the year I made the most of my friends, US friends. Friends who came to Cuba through exchange programs of all kinds, from academic to cultural ones. Friends who brought their parents to visit my country because it was not legal for Americans to visit Cuba as a tourist. All these things seem very distant, very rare to me because I didn't understand how in the land of freedom one could not have the freedom to travel wherever they want. During that time, I didn't know that Amberly, a filmmaker and photographer from Baltimore, and Alexei, a Newark Cuban hip hop musician, had a painful long distance relationship and were unable to see each other for several years because she, as an American, couldn't return to Havana on her own, and he, as a Cuban, couldn't obtain a tourist visa to the United States. Cuba Cuba has one of the highest rates of denial U.S. B visas, tourists or business in the world. According to the U.S. State Department data, 81.9% of all Cuban applications were denied in fiscal year 2016. Afghanistan was second in application denials, with its refusal rate at 73.8% due in large part to the active war the United States was waging at that time. In November of 2016, Trump won the elections and he became president of the United States. And the hope for a better future in Cuba began to be threatened. At first, I thought it was just Trump's cheap bluster. I don't have to tell you what that looks like, but no, Donald Trump has gone down in history as one of the US presidents who has done the most damage to the Cuban people and unfortunately, he will not be the only one. On the Trump administration, our main sources of income began to be attacked one by one. Tourism, medical missions, the biotech industry. It was as if he wants us to come. And if that were enough, before he left, Trump put Cuba on the list of countries that sponsored terrorism, which was a death sentence to my country. During that time, my friend Alina, an academic and feminist respect not only in Cuba, but throughout Latin America for his anti-racist work, had to start in Colombia for more than 24 hours before he continued, her continued, uh, she continued her trip to the Europe. And although she had a visa to enter to Colombia, she wasn't allowed to leave the airport because she was considered suspicious for coming from Cuba, a country that the United States says is sponsored terrorism. Trump is no longer in the White House, now it's Biden, but the sanctions remain in the same place. It is funny for me to be here to hear about the difference between Republicans and Democrats, because in my experience as a Cuban journalist living in Cuba, the policy towards Cuba is the <coughs> same no matter which party president belongs to. It's frustrating and sad to talk about Cuba nowadays. I used to love to talk about the wonderful country I was born in, the people, the home I live in, but that started to change when the most of my friends began to emigrate to all parts of the world. And I fully understand that why they left. It's very hard to live in a country with one crisis after another, where you don't see that you have a future there, where you spend your time trying to survive as best you can. But know that this is not life that calling ourselves resilience is something that we say to be optimist, but it involves a lot of physical and emotional wear and tear because no one has to survive in this situation. No one should have to survive in these conditions because we all deserve to live in a prosperous countries with opportunities for everyone. But how can, how can this be achieved in a country that has been in economic war with the most powerful country in the world for more than 60 years? Let us not be confused by the mainstream media discourse. 
the vast majority of Cubans who, arri who arrive at the United States border seeking asylum are not political refugees, they are economic refugees. Sometimes I feel very lonely in my struggle to stay in Cuba and build a better country. And I wonder if I'm doing the right thing. Fortunately, journalism has given the opportunity to meet women like Greta, a black entrepreneur who has cosmetic business with natural hair and body oils, and who despite all of the obstacles that exist to make her business grow, and who knows that it's almost impossible to expand her business outside of Cuba because the sanctions doesn't imagine developing her brand Milan in another country that is not Cuba. Five I think minutes. it is because we know that immigration is not easy, as they want to make it seem. That the American dream is a lie that has been sold us since we were very young. That leaving your family and trying to adapt to a new society, sometimes very different from yours, can be traumatic. That the dream can turn into a nightmare. The only problem is that it seems we have no choice because we have no voice or vote in this country. Because it doesn't depend on us if the United States government lifts the sanctions against my country. People ask me what a Cuba without sanctions will be like. I, the truth, and the truth is I don't know, but I would like to find out. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful expression of what we all coincide with is a Cuba without sanctions. Uh, our next panelist, Francis Dr. Francisco Rodriguez, is a Venezuelan economist with decades of experience in public service, academia, and the private sector. Currently, he is the Rice Family Professor of the Practice of International and Public Affairs at the University of Denver's Corbell School of International Studies and director and founder of Oil for Venezuela, a nonprofit organization focused on finding solutions to Venezuela's humanitarian crisis. Rodriguez has held prominent positions in the public and private sectors, including head of economic and financial advisory of the Venezuelan National Assembly and head of the research team of the United Nations Human Development Report Office. He received an MA and PhD in economics from Harvard University. Let's welcome Francisco Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, good morning, almost good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, the America's Policy Forum, uh, for this uh, invitation to talk about uh, the effect of economic sanctions, particularly in Latin America. Uh, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson described sanctions as something more tremendous than war. Um, and the reason that he used this phrase is because uh, uh, sanctions as we know them really came into being during World War I. Uh, although there's a long history of sanctions uh, used previous to that, Sanctions in an interconnected economy really only had the bite that they have nowadays after the world economy had become globalized in the late 19th century. Uh, and in effect, if you consider and think a bit uh, about uh, the way in which uh, uh, economic sanctions and economic blockade were first used uh, in the context of World War I, uh, most of the evidence actually points to uh, the uh, fact that uh, sanctions and the blockade imposed by world powers on Germany during World War I were really what led to the outcome of the war. So the way that Woodrow Wilson thought about this is this is something that can really destroy an economy and should only be used uh, or should only be threatened to be used in order to avoid having another world war. So in other words, Woodrow Wilson was thinking that uh, sanctions were so damaging that they would never be used. Uh, that's the way in which they were set up uh, during the League of Nations. Uh, and I think that he would have been quite dismayed uh, if he had come to this world that we have nowadays uh, and had found uh, the way in which sanctions are uh, recurrently used by world powers to the extent that 
uh, over the course of the past few decades, uh, we've reached the level at which uh, economic sanctions uh, are affect uh, more than one fourth in co of countries in the world and nearly one third uh, of the world's uh, economy. So in a paper that I am just publishing with the Center for Economic Policy and Research, uh, which uh, you'll find a copy of the, the executive summary outside, and uh, I think that you'll be able to download it from, uh, from, from Tuesday. I, I look at the evidence on the effect of economic sanctions, uh, on the standards of living in target populations, in the populations of targeted countries. Uh, I do a comprehensive uh, survey and assessment uh, of all existing studies that use quantitative methods, uh, both econometric methods, calibration methods, uh, in order to quantify the effect of sanctions on living standards. Um, and uh, the results are uh, actually quite striking. Um, uh, there's a near consensus in studies. Uh, 30 out of 32 studies actually find uh, consistently negative significant effects of sanctions on living standards on uh, variables ranging from uh, GDP uh, to uh, health to human rights, uh, life expectancy, nutrition. Uh, every single dimension of living standards is negatively affected. The effects quantitatively uh, are uh, very large. Um, sanctions can cause uh, a recession of, uh, or a contraction in uh, the GDP of targeted countries uh, of uh, up to 26% uh, of GDP. That's the equivalent of a Great Depression. Uh, sanctions on average lead to a decline of life expectancy of between 1.2 and 1.4 years. That's the equivalent of the effect on life expectancy of the COVID pandemic. Uh, sanctions lead to uh, increases in, um, in HIV rates, uh, for example, uh, among both adults and children. Uh, there's a host of quantitative evidence uh, that finds that uh, sanctions have uh, effects which are similar, if not in some cases actually larger uh, than the effects of armed conflict. Uh, there is a sense in which uh, sanctions at this moment are the most powerful, the deadliest weapon that is used by world powers, including uh, by the United States. Uh, nevertheless, uh, whenever we see statements coming out of authorities uh, in the US uh, or in the European Union uh, or even the United Nations, uh, they tend to disregard the effect of sanctions. Uh, they tend to uh, use specialist arguments uh, uh, essentially to claim that uh, these effects are not due to sanctions, that they're due to other causes, um, that if the sanctions were lifted, uh, the targeted governments uh, would not use those resources for the benefit of their population. Uh, and th these arguments are really wrong at a very basic level. They reflect a very basic misunderstanding of the way in which governments work. And even the most authoritarian governments in the world uh, use uh, the resources of their state to provide basic uh, uh, public goods and services, such as health and education. I mean, there's no government that does not do that, and therefore severely curtailing the access that an economy has to foreign exchange, severely curtailing the access of governments to resources, is bound to have an impact on living standards through the declines that it causes in uh, public health, public education provision, and also through the effects that it generates on the economy's capacity to uh, access imports and to access uh, capital flows. Um, in my work in particular, I've looked, and this study looks at um, the cases of Venezuela, Iran, and Afghanistan, and documents uh, the negative effects on living standards in those countries. Um, and a lot of my published research have looked at the case of Venezuela. In the case of Venezuela, it's quite striking. Venezuela uh, has suffered a contraction of 72% in its GDP. That's the equivalent of three Great Depressions. It is the largest economic contraction ever documented in world history in a country outside of wartime. Now, what is it that caused that economic contraction? It's actually not that difficult to understand what drove it. It's a complete collapse of its oil industry. Venezuelan oil exports contributed 95% of exports, of the country's total exports, uh, and more than 50% of fiscal revenue. And oil exports fell by 91% between 2012 and 2020. 
Now, part of that decline was driven by a decline in oil prices, and particularly a decline in oil prices that occurred between 2014 and 2016. Uh, which was when uh, oil, uh, global oil prices fell from around $100 to less than $30 a barrel. Uh, but after 2016, oil prices began to recover. So what does history, what does econometrics, or do all of the studies and all of the literature on the workings of the Venezuelan economy tell us we should have expected to happen when oil prices rose from less than $30 a barrel in 2016 uh, to more than $70 a barrel? We should have expected Venezuela's economy to recover. It didn't. Why didn't it recover? Because oil production started falling precipitously. Uh, so in my work, as well as other Venezuelan economists, have been looking at uh, the effect of sanctions on oil production. And what do we find? We find that every single application of sanctions in Venezuela uh, is associated with a decline in the country's oil production. Uh, Venezuela's oil production, that doesn't mean that all of the decline in oil production is due uh, to sanctions, but it could well mean that most of it is due to sanctions because Venezuelan oil production was actually quite stable between 2008 and 2015 uh, at 2.4, 2.5 million barrels per day. Venezuelan oil production starts declining in two, uh, 2016 at a moment of low oil prices when production was declining in a lot of countries, particularly high cost producers. So that decline wasn't really that surprising. But in all of those countries, when oil prices started recovering, uh, oil production stabilizers started recovering. What we find in Venezuela is that in August of 2017, there's an inflection uh, in the trend of oil production where the rate of decline goes from 1% per month to 3% per month. Uh, then we find another point of inflection in 2019, January of 2019, as oil sanctions are imposed on Venezuela and PDVSA, the state-owned oil company, uh, is designated by OFAC. There we find a decline of 40% in oil production that occurs within two months. Uh, and then oil production stabilizes, and then we have another decline that occurs in February, which is when uh, the U.S. targets Rosneft and other, and other oil partners that were help helping sell Venezuelan oil. At the time at which the U.S. sanctions that, most international companies had decided that they weren't going to market Venezuelan oil because of fear of U.S. sanctions. So Rosneft was actually carrying out 75% of the country's oil trade, international oil trade at the time. And they were responsible essentially for 100% uh, of the country's gasoline uh, imports. So you remember seeing stories about uh, huge levels of uh, gasoline scarcity in Venezuela in 2020, they occurred right after the Rosneft sanctions because Rosneft were the only ones who were willing to bring gasoline into Venezuela. And that's why Venezuela, uh, precisely uh, in uh, an example of the type of solidarity between sanctioned countries that, uh, that, that you had been talking about, that's why Venezuela actually starts importing gasoline from Iran. By the way, there was actually a tanker of oil that had been purchased by Venezuela uh, coming from Iran that was uh, seized in the high waters, brought to the U.S., uh, and actually sold in the U.S. And part of the proceeds did not even go, they definitely didn't go to the Venezuelan government, uh, to the Maduro-headed Venezuelan government. They didn't even go to the government that pretended to be Venezuelan governments, which is why those government, they went to pay for Trump's border war, uh, border wall. Uh, so, so the fact is that uh, you see, uh, we've seen uh, clearly in the data that the decline of oil production is significantly associated with the imposition of, U of U.S. sanctions uh, on Venezuela. Uh, now, with time series data, there are always questions of interpretation. And you know, some people have said, well, but there were other things that happened in August of 2017, and there were other things that happened in uh, January of 2019, there were other things that happened in February of 2020. I mean, those arguments taken by one, one by one might make sense. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, imagine somebody has an episode of anaphylactic shock uh, right after they eat lobster. Well, the first time that it happens, you may come up with an explanation of something else. You know, maybe they had like this really energetic discussion or a fight with a family member at the table, and that's what caused it. You know, the second time that it happens after they eat lobster, then uh, then it's pretty hard to come up with another explanation. The third time that it happens, then it's really pretty much impossible. Um, however, nevertheless, and this is kind of what I have to deal with as, as an economist, I've had to contend with discussions uh, with uh, other uh, Venezuelan economists um, who are very much um, 
uh, align with another vision of the world. Uh, uh, some of them uh, who are, I think are good economists and, um, uh, and, and have done some careful work, uh, but whose work on this issue has tended to be, uh, I would say, somewhat sloppy. And I think that the sign of that is uh, when, when you see people who are very prominent economists but are unwilling to uh, use the peer review process to publish uh, on the issue of sanctions, then that's a pretty good signal. Uh, the, the reality is that every single peer reviewed stu study on Venezuela sanctions finds a negative significant effect of those sanctions. Uh, and uh, in particular, precisely because of the need to uh, to establish this, not just beyond any reasonable doubt, but even beyond unreasonable doubts. Um, we've gone to the length of looking, for example, at uh, firm level data in Venezuela, distinguishing between firms that had access to finance and those that did not have access to finance prior to the 2017 sanctions. Why is that important? Because the 2017 sanctions targeted access to finance. What do we find when we look at the different uh, joint ventures in the Venezuelan oil sector, uh, that those that had access to finance previous to the financial sanctions uh, had seen, it had been seeing production growing. Um, um, of course, they had access to finance, and the finance uh, helped uh, finance investment and helped for that production to grow. Uh, after the imposition of the financial sanctions, uh, we see that they stopped growing, they started declining, they started declining at the same rate as those that had no access to finance. That's what's called a difference in differences uh, analysis. It's in a paper published in the Latin American Economic Review uh, last year. Uh, so the evidence here, the bottom line is that the evidence is very clear that sanctions have had a negative significant effect and have contributed significantly uh, to Venezuela's economic implosion. Um, we've had a decline of 78% in food imports. And actually, this is quite interesting. We had a decline of 91% in imports, but we had a decline of only 78% in food imports, which means that uh, there was a prioritization of food imports during uh, the period starting in 2016, uh, precisely as a response to the sanction. Uh, and uh, there were significant increases in the food coverage uh, through the government's uh, CLAP program, uh, which in fact, if you look at the amount of resources, it's about uh, the subsidy uh, implicit in the government's food bags program uh, is of around uh, $800 million a year, which is more than 50% of uh, all of the economy's food imports. Uh, I would say that without that program, uh, we would have most definitely seen a famine in Venezuela. One minute, um, So uh, just to round up, the, uh, the fact is that there is very clear evidence that uh, sanctions have negative significant effects uh, on uh, the populations, on uh, the living standards of populations in target countries. Uh, this has been well identified in the empirical literature. It's very clear in Venezuela, it's very clear in Iran, it's very clear in Afghanistan, it's very clear in just about every single case um, in which uh, sanctions are imposed. Uh, the fact that this debate, which has been more than established in the scientific literature, that these results are routinely ignored by U.S. policymakers is something that should really concern us. And it reflects uh, a callous, and I would say even a criminal disregard uh, for the suffering of people in developing countries. And uh, it is my belief that no country that expresses such disregard and such uh, contempt for the suffering of some of the world's most vulnerable groups can call itself a champion of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. It's especially important that we're armed with empirical evidence, peer-reviewed empirical evidence, uh, to dismantle the myth that sanctions are targeted. They're not targeted. They have negative side effects on the general population. Um, our last panelist uh, is Mark Weisbrot. And uh, Mark Weisbrot is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. He's author of the book, Failed, What the, quote, experts, unquote, got wrong about the global economy. Co-author also with Dean Baker of Social Security, The Phony Crisis. And 
uh, Mark Weisbrot has written numerous research papers on economic policy. He writes a regular column on economic and policy issues that's distributed to over 550 newspapers by the Tribune Content Agency. His opinion pieces have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Guardian, and almost every major US newspaper, as well as in Brazil's largest newspaper, Folha de Sao Paulo. He appears regularly on national and local television and radio programs. Let's welcome Mark Weisbrot. Thanks, thanks for the intro, and thanks to everybody for organizing this. And uh, I want to talk some, I mean, Francisco did a great job, and he knows the Venezuelan, I'm going to say this because he won't brag, I mean, he knows the Venezuelan economy better than anybody, I think, and also is one of the, probably the leading expert, probably the leading expert in the world on, on sanctions. So I, I won't add uh, too much. Uh, I will just add one thing to the collapse, you know, the 72 percent decline, which is the worst peacetime decline uh, in, in, in history, pretty much. And, uh, it, and I think uh, one part of it could be the hyperinflation was so, so prolonged. You know, hyperinflation is a disaster, basically. Uh, it, well, the classic definition is 13,000% uh, uh, annually or 50% a month. And, uh, and Venezuela, and you know, you've had like eight, seven, I think seven episodes since World War II in Latin America, and the median uh, duration was four months. Venezuela had over three years, okay? And why is that? You can see, in addition to all the things he said that uh, the sanctions do, I think one of the things they do is they prevent you from recovering. It's not always that hard to recover from hyperinflation, which really destroys your economy. People don't want to hold the domestic currency. And so you can do exchange rate-based stabilization in some cases. For example, in Bolivia, they got rid of hyperinflation in 10 days in 1985. And the other ones I said, you know, were not that long. This is three years of a, a really uh, a, a terrible destruction of your economy, and a lot of it is uh, is the hyperinflation. I say that because, you know, in the media, you hear about the inflation in Venezuela and, you, and the government is blamed for it, and they did have high inflation before uh, the sanctions, but they could have, you know, this is a country that had 300 billion in oil reserves. They could have gotten uh, some foreign currency <laughs> somewhere to stop the inflation depreciation spiral, for example. Uh, they could have gotten, you know, they could, they could have done so many different things, and they couldn't do it because these sanctions blocked them at every level, in the, as, as Francisco described. And that's, I think, part of it. And, and this gets to, and I want to talk more about um, you know, what can be done about this, because this is an audience that is doing something. And I want to thank you all again for that. Uh, because uh, this is uh, something that they get away with. As Francisco said, it's, it's, it's really become a, a main uh, weapon of the United States, I would say probably, possibly more important than the military uh, right now in terms of coercion in the world. And uh, now, this is largely because the U.S. controls the international financial system. That's a, a huge part of it. Uh, uh, and so there are countries right now as we speak, because the progressive governments have come back in a number of countries now, and uh, they're looking for ways to, uh, to create some uh, alternatives to their dependence on the US-based uh, financial system. Uh, I think it was mentioned the, um, you know, that it's a dollar-based system, and, but that isn't gonna change that fast, you know. 60% uh, of central bank reserves are uh, dollars, or dollar-denominated assets, and, uh, that's about the same as it was 40 years ago. So uh, that will move too, but there are other things, and I won't have time to go into those now. But one thing we can do here, because we're here in the United States where the source of the uh, problem is, uh, and is, is the Congress. And I want to read something from uh, Jim McGovern, who some of you saw yesterday, because he was chair of the House Rules Committee. This is less than two years ago. 
he said this, and so he's a powerful member of Congress, and he wrote a letter to Biden calling for an end to the sanctions against uh, Venezuela. And he said, uh, beginning in 2017 under former President Trump, the U.S. began to impose uh, ever wider sectoral and sec secondary sanctions on the oil economy, the Maduro government, and en entities supporting the government, and the, the, you know, the justification of these sanctions was to force a regime change, he said that. And he said, uh, most importantly, uh, that the, in the impact of sectoral and secondary sanctions, the sanctions they impose, is indiscriminate and purposely so. Although U.S. officials regularly say that the sanctions target the government and not the people, the whole point of the maximum pressure campaign is to increase the economic cost of Venezuela of failing to comply with the conditions that the United States imposes. So he said it straight out. You're targeting the civilian population in order to undermine and overthrow the government. That's what the United States does with sanctions. And the reason they get away with this is because almost nobody knows that. Most of Congress doesn't even know it. And I'm not saying a lot of them would care, but some of them do, would, actually. And some of them do already. And so this is, I think, how we're going to win. That's why I want to emphasize it. You know, This is what happened, you know, if I want to go into the little hopey, changey thing, the positive side, OK? I mean, we did pass a war powers resolution in both houses of Congress just a couple of years ago. And uh, that was the first time that the Congress used the 1973 legislation to uh, tell the president to get out of the war in, in Yemen, okay? And it hasn't, it's not over yet, but it, it will be, and that, that was, a, that was a, a first, and that was a product of a lot of work. It took six years, and that's way too long. And so I think that this is also winnable, but the way we're going to win it is we have to keep, uh, we have to keep saying what sanctions are doing. They're killing people. McGovern was polite. He didn't use the word kill. He, he said harm. But, you know, you know, when I uh, first started looking into this, I wrote a paper with uh, Jeff Sachs in 2019, and we looked at the mortality, because for the first, you had some mortality data from these uh, three uh, universities who were opposition, and they didn't release it. It came from the UN, because they leaked it. And so, but it, it, then it became established. And, uh, and it showed a 31% increase in mortality from 2017 to 2018. One year, okay, uh, that was 40,000 dead if you calculate it. And uh, so we, we did that uh, paper. And, and uh, we were just talking about this yesterday, you know, we need more to show uh, very clearly the link between uh, the sanctions and mortality, but that was kind of obvious at the time. Like, Francisco said, okay, we had a lot of lobsters now, and <laughs> they're all causing the same thing. And, but this is, uh, this is really uh, serious. You know, I, I'll put just uh, to uh, a little bit more economics. There's uh, econometric research by the Bank for International Settlements on the link between recessions and mortality. So it shows how in developing countries, when there's a recession, a lot of people die. In fact, their, uh, their regression controlling for everything they could uh, showed a 0.5% increase in mortality uh, for uh, a 0. Point, not percent, 0 0.5 per thousand people increase in mortality for recession and uh, twice that in the bottom uh, quinta. So if you just look at that, you know, even the, lo the small estimate, it's, that would be 15,000 people in a country the size of Venezuela. And that wasn't a recession. That was the worst depression ever in Latin America. So it, these, these, these data make sense, okay? These data in the tens of thousands and, and probably hundreds of thousands worldwide of people dying because of the impact in of, of sanctions on the economy are very uh, believable uh, to me. So, uh, oh, and then you also, I should say, you have people like Mike Pompeo who said that that's what they do with the sanctions, and I won't bother to read it, but he's bragging about it, okay? He's saying that, you know, well, I will say it, you know, 
Well, he says to uh, a reporter who's asking him, how's it going in Venezuela? He said, this was 2019. Well, we wish things could go faster, but I'm very confident that the tide is moving in the direction of Venezuelan people and will continue to do so. Uh, the circle is tightening. The humanitarian crisis, crisis is increasing by the hour. Uh, I talked with our senior person on the ground there in Venezuela. You can see the increasing pain and suffering of the Venezuelan people. That's, you know, how he, and he did this, said the same thing for Iran. So these people didn't even care. They, they, they just said it straight out. And, but McGovern is the first U.S. official to actually say it from the point of view that this is something wrong. And again, that's why I think it's so important that we get that out there. Whenever we talk about sanctions, we have to talk about uh, the, the mortality and the deaths that you have uh, from these uh, sanctions. Now, the other part I think that uh, people can understand, the media will eventually report, and by the way, since Juan is here, you know, uh, we sent out a press release when the government made that statement because they didn't do it, and, uh, and Democracy Now! was the only one who picked it up, so uh, <laughs> I, I just want to give that shout out to Democracy Now! because that was pretty important news, and, uh, and, and the media ignored it. And they're still ignoring this impact uh, of sanctions. So we have to go to the media as well. But the extent, the extent that we get more members of Congress and other uh, government officials to say this, uh, you know, it'll get out there. Um, now, the sanctions, the other part of it that I think uh, can, can help this effort to get rid of them is uh, the, the, the legal part of it. First, they violate U.S. law because they issue those executive orders saying that Venezuela and these other countries are a threat to, a, a usual and extraordinary threat to U.S. national security. That's obviously a lie. And so that could be challenged in court uh, also. But I think uh, you, have, you have treaties, and one that resonates more with older people who can remember the Geneva Conventions being talked about at least, you know, not necessarily lived uh, through it, but uh, it's, you know, it, the, uh, the Geneva Convention prohibits exactly the, what they call the collective punishment that sanctions uh, inflict, and, but there's a technicality that it doesn't, so it's not a, a war crime because there's no war. So the UN has put out several statements saying, you know, if something's a crime, a war crime, when people are shooting at each other, uh, it ought to be a crime when they're not. And so that, I think, can be used also in terms of uh, convincing people on this. And um, so uh, I, I want to also put the sanctions in the context, too, because this is about the Monroe Doctrine, which is, uh, you know, an example of, OK, I've got two minutes to say this. I will do it, OK? Do it. This is part of a system of domination that, you know, that is really led by the U.S. with its European allies. They control the IMF, the World Bank, mostly the WTO, uh, because they couldn't even get, you know, the developing countries wanted vaccines, and they couldn't even get that passed. And so you see, the sanctions are, the we are, are a weapon uh, that really, I've only mentioned the direct uh, harm and death that they cause, but there's an indirect harm. It really prevents uh, countries from developing. And I'll give just one example from Latin America. When you had what many people called the second independence of Latin America in the first decade of, the, uh, of this century, uh, poverty from uh, 2000, no one disputes these, po poverty from 2002 to 2013 was reduced from 44 to 28 percent after it had been increasing for two decades under the U.S. sponsored uh, neoliberal uh, economic policies. So that's the other cost of this uh, sanctions and the power that they, uh, the destructive power that they have. They actually uh, keep countries from getting and exercising the sovereignty they need to save lives and improve their living standards. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark Weisbrot, because not only in this uh, discussion that you've had today, but in previous research, uh, you've helped expose the human impact of sanctions. 
let's give a hand to the entire panel. It's been great. Well, a lot happens in between sessions, so I trust that uh, you'll be able to engage in, in conversation uh, with the panelists and others uh, as the conference proceeds. Thank you so much to the panelists. Great Thank job. You. Because of the, the time that we lost, we're not going to have a break now. You can get up and stretch, but don't leave, just because the other panel's coming up right now, and then we will have our lunch break. So uh, if people want to do any kind of uh, activism yoga, <laughs> you can get up. <laughs> Reach for your dreams. Reach for your dreams. Move to your left. Pull the people from the right. <laughs> Move to your left. Stay in place. And history teaches us that as the U.S. hegemony declines, the U.S. imperialist offensive grows. We know that. The expression of this are their effort to expand NATO, their strengthening of sanctions, their uh, desire to continue to push retrograde policies internally in the U.S. and also abroad, the ruling class and its two-party system continues to lie to justify a military budget of, guess what, 
$900 million. They continue to lie to continue to justify 800 military bases all over the world. They continue to lie and tell not only the US population, but the rest of the world that is in our, is in our best interest to have killing mechanisms like NATO, like AFRICOM, like the Southern Command, and we know that they're lying. The good news is that many, many, many nations in the global south have woken up to those lies. And they have created mechanisms and structures to counteract what the US imperial force has been, not only in our region, but globally. The Valerian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution Two socialist projects, because that is also a model that we need to uplift. Two socialist projects have been at the head of the creation of organisms like CELAC, like ALBA TCP, that are models that oppose US imperialist force in this continent and provide a model internationally. And so today this panel will speak to these two opposing forces, two opposing forces, again, that are very decisive, not only to nation states, but to people of good consciousness. Do we stand behind death and mechanisms of war and militarization, or do we stand behind mechanisms of life and projects that are there to make sure that there are democratic negotiations among state, nation states, that there is collaboration, and that there is a policy that is invested and has at the very core the needs and interests of the working class people of the world. That is what this panel is about. So I would like to invite you all to give a great round of applause to our panelists. And now I'm gonna read because I don't wanna mess up the introductions. So <laughs> our first speaker is Francesca Emanuel. She is a Peruvian analyst and researcher and regular contributor to the online newspapers Huayca and Noticias Ser. She is currently pursuing a PhD in public anthropology at American University. Give it up. <laughs> Focusing on international organizations, in particular, the Organization of American States. Francesca is also a senior research fellow at CEPER. Previously, she was the director of publications for the sexual and reproductive rights nonprofit Promix in Peru, and is a columnist for Peruvian da uh, dailies Diario 16 and Exitoso. Let's welcome Francesca. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, it is an honor to be here today with these great speakers and moderator. Thank you very much. Let me tell you about the most dominant regional diplomatic organization in the Western Hemisphere, the Organization of American States, the OAS. <laughs> today, almost all countries in the Americas have a permanent representative in this organization, except for Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. These three are the precise nations in the region subjected to unilateral sanctions by the United States. And the connection appears less coincidental when you learn that while the OAS comprises 34 member states, the U.S. provides around 50% of the organization's annual budget. When factoring in additional don donations, this contribution increases to 60%. For those unfamiliar with the OAS, its headquarters is here in Washington, D.C., right across from the, from the White House. It is a beautiful building that has a statue of Queen Isabella I, at the entrance, which was donated to the OAS in the 60s by the Spanish dictatorship of Francisco Franco. As you know, 
Queen Isabella was instrumental in funding Columbus' expedition to the Americas, leading to the invasion and colonization of the region, which resulted in the worst genocide in human history. Despite this, Isabella's image welcomes visitors to the OAS. Some might argue that at very least, or at the very least, this symbolism demonstrates the OAS transparency regarding its core values. Well, if there is an international organization still in existence that was founded reflecting the spirit of the Monroe Doctrine, it is the OAS. The OAS is an initiative that originated in the United States, tracing back to the late 19th century when US Secretary of State James Blaine co-opted Simon Bolivar's honorable idea of a League of Hispanic American Republics for regional solidarity and collective security to safeguard the sovereignty of the newly independent countries. Blaine's goal, however, was to solidify US control in the hemisphere by establishing an organization to facilitate commercial advantage for the US. In 1890, Blaine convened 17 Latin, America's country, Latin American countries in Washington, D.C., right here, and celebrated the first International Pan American Conference, which resulted in the creation of the Commercial Bureau of the American Republics, initially housed in the State Department before moving to the current OAS headquarters in 1910. Blaine understood that US investors could ex expedite the process of capital expansion under a legal framework established at the state level and controlled by the US. So in other words, for my Marxist friends, uh, friends here, the direct forerunner of the OAS played a crucial role in sparking the process that shaped a trend of capital accumulation in the North and economic poverty in the center and south of the hemisphere. But of course, this discussion is for another panel or another conference. So later, the Commercial Bureau changed its name to the Pan American Union. The US kept leading Pan, Pan American conferences and also invading countries in the Americas during that period. Uh, and with a more careful approach in the 30s under the good neighbor policy. At the onset of the Cold War, the U.S. pushed for a mutual defense agreement to consolidate influence in the region and counter the spread of communism, particularly from the Soviet Union. This agreement, known as the Rio Treaty, stipulated that if any foreign power attacked the countries in the Americas that had signed it, they would unite and collectively resist the aggression, of course, uh, militarily. The OAS, and this is important, was founded one year later, later in 1948, primarily as a decision-making forum for implementing this treaty, for implementing the Rio Treaty. Naturally, to maintain a permanent diplomatic forum, it was necessary to enhance it with additional mandates, such as fostering economic development, um, promoting democracy, peace, justice, and so on. As a, a, a critical aspect of the founding of the OAS was the US acceptance, at least in writing, of the principles of sovereignty and non-intervention in the internal affairs of other member countries. This acknowledgement was considered a significant victory for Latin American nations that had been urging the US to embrace these principles since the early 20th century. However, as long as the OAS pursues goals of US superiority, achieving these principles will be challenging. The OAS was not merely a US initiative, but has consistently adapted to the US needs to strengthen its dominance in the region. Initially, it functioned as a platform to facilitate favorable, favorable, business, uh, favorable business contracts for the US and draw investors to its member countries. 
Later, it transformed into a regional front to confront communism, while under the banner of ideals of self-determination and sovereignty. But soon, it became evident that these principles were dispensable. The case of Cuba is a primary example. The OAS remained silent during the US-sponsored Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, which was an attempt to overthrow the Cuban government. Shortly after, the OAS expelled Cuba from the organization after Fidel Castro declared the country's alliance to Marxist-Leninist principles. This revealed that the non-interventionist commitment in the OAS charter had ideological limitations. In essence, the OAS implied that hemispheric integration was contingent on supporting capitalism, especially capitalism favorable to the United States. The OAS helped in isolating Cuba. It voted to impose sanctions and further assisted the US by providing the legal basis through the Rio Treaty to impose a blockade on Cuba during the missile crisis. Meanwhile, the OAS was silent towards long-standing, openly oppressive regimes allied with the US, including the Somoza regime in Nicaragua, Estrosner in Paraguay, and Duvalier in Haiti. But not only are the OAS principles selectively implemented or respected, the organization itself also exhibit, exhibits a broad and changeable nature, making it challenging to understand it and anticipate its moves. Its regulations are vague, and the Secretary General, who heads the organization, has almost unquestionable authority, even over member states. This gives the Secretary General significant power to dominate the most debated issues in the forum. Additionally, the OAS has been an incubator of all kinds of ideas and initiatives, primarily conforming to the key objectives of its main contributor, the US. For instance, the OAS served as, a, as the platform for introducing the Alliance for Progress in the 60s, an interventionist initiative designed to counteract the proliferation of communism in the region, and that ultimately contributed to the rise of dictatorships and the perpetuation of economic dependency in Latin America. Moreover, the concept of the Inter-American Development Bank was first conceived during an OAS meeting. And to fully grasp the intricacies of the OAS, it is important to understand its significant and somewhat disorganized growth over time. The OAS has established numerous bodies over the years, such as the Summit of the Americas, which in its inaugural meeting in the 90s, or mid-90s, 1994, aimed to promote a free trade area of the Americas that would consolidate the Washington Consensus. This could have had disastrous consequences. On the other hand, the OAS also has bodies more favorable to public opinion, like the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Both entities are well regarded in our countries for their role in reporting human rights violations. This intricate network of interrelated bodies within the OAS, occasionally marked by contradictions, contributes to the organization's resilience, making it difficult to contest. Furthermore, this complexity has allowed the OAS to endure despite involvement in serious offenses against the sovereignty of multiple countries in the region. Taking this complexity into account, I would like to discuss the more recent OAS our OAS right now, and please note that I will only address a fraction of its latest interventionist action, uh, which are, of course, always aligned with US foreign policy. During the 1990s, the OAS continued its tradition of evolving along the US foreign policy paradigm. This shift led the OAS to prioritize the promotion of democracy. As a result, the organization established the Department of Electoral Cooperation and Observation, which has since carried out more than 200 electoral observation missions throughout the region. Today, the OAS has positioned itself as the leading authority on electoral integrity in the Americas. When countries in Latin America and the Caribbean hold elections, it is widely expected that they invite the OAS to observe. 
in order to establish the legitim legitimacy of the electoral process. This significant influence has provided the OAS with the capability to destabilize democracies without resorting to invasions, as the United States has done in the past with their, within the region. In 2011, the OAS arbitrarily changed the results of the first round of Haiti's presidential elections. And in, in 2019, it played a direct role in unleashing a coup d'etat in Bolivia by falsely claiming that the presidential election results, which declare Evo Morales the winner, were fraudulent. In the aftermath, a far-right government took power in Bolivia and subsequently orchestrated two violent massacres targeting indigenous population. In both cases, Haiti and Bolivia, it was later discovered that the OAS mis misrepresented facts and undermined the democratic process. In my view, the role of the OAS in laying the foundation for the coup in Bolivia represents the most egregious crime by this organization in recent history. And it establishes a precedent that should not only place the entire region on alert, but also prompt a strong desire to reform within the organization. Now, I'm almost there. Now, as an anthropologist, and considering the limited time at my disposal, I would like to zoom in and address the influential players within the OAS. Well, I'm convinced that the OAS suffers from a fundamental structural flaw tied to its inception. I also believe that we activist citizens, academics, can reduce damage if we identify where the power lies and push for accountability. And this power in the OAS is concentrated in the hands of the Secretary General, Luis Almagro. Throughout his two terms as Secretary General, Almagro has resurrected the Monroe Doctrine. Remember when Trump entertained the idea of invading Venezuela? Well, Almagro claims that he was the architect of US policy towards Venezuela. But Almagro has gone even further, turning the OAS in into a hub for international right-wing Latin American politicians. His office serves as a central point for far-right figures in the region, and he uses the OAS apparatus to empower or rescue these individuals. Recently, he secured an OAS position for Ecuador's former president, Len investigations in his home country. Almagro also established a so-called pact of impunity with the former president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who is now in prison in New York on drug trafficking charges. Almagro supported Hernandez's grip on power by sabotaging an OAS-sponsored commission investigating corruption in Honduras. Ultimately, Almagro has taken control of the entire organization by abusing various regulations and infiltrating all levels, even extending his influence to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which compromises its autonomy. And of course, Almagro played a crucial role in the coup d'etat in Bolivia, and even now, despite the abundance of evidence debunking the OAS falsehoods, Almagro continues to uphold the lie. It is worth noting that a group of Democratic Congress members recently sent a letter to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken calling for an investigation into Almagro's wrongdoings and other related issues. The crimes, or these crimes, are still fresh. And therefore, it is imperative to hold Almagro and the OAS accountable if we want to build an independent and sovereign future for the region. These actions by the OAS must be investigated and brought out of the obscurity which the organization promotes. We must demand reparations. The people of Bolivia who experienced a fascist dictatorship and the people of Honduras who endure a violent narco state deserve that the OAS make amends for the harm it caused. Addressing these issues is key to paving the way of, uh, for comprehensive reform of the OAS. This may involve rethinking the organization's structure, functions, and goals, relocating its headquarters, and adjusting the contributions of the member countries. Without these changes, the OAS will continue to prioritize U.S. interests and empower a Latin American political class that is content with maintaining the region as the U.S. backyard. In parallel, it is essential to strengthening 
alternative regional cooperation initiatives, such as the UNASUR, which already has an established headquarters and reinforces the formation of a South American region, or La CELAC, promotes a vision of unity and cooperation among Latin American and Caribbean countries. It is more likely that Latin Americas can break free from US interference if they, we, work together and present a united front against attempts to subjugate the region. It is time to reclaim Bolivar's dream of a united and independent region that works together for the benefit of all its people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca. Um, we're gonna hear from Dr. Jemima Pierre. She is professor at UCLA, jointly appointed in the Department of African American Studies and the Department of Anthropology. She is also a research associate at the inaugural Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class at the University of Johannesburg. Her research and teaching interests are located in the overlaps between African studies and African diaspora studies and engage three broad areas, race and political economy, transnationalism and diaspora, and the cultural politics of knowledge production. A first generation immigrant from Haiti, Dr. Pierre has also published extensively on the impacts of ongoing US imperialism in Haiti. She serves as a co-coordinator for the Haiti America's team of Black Alliance for Peace. Let's welcome Dr. Jamima Pierre. Thank you all. You should just, oh. yeah, it's on. You should just move it forward. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm, I'm excited to be part of this conversation and to be with you. Um, and, and to be speaking on behalf of the Black Alliance for Peace. In December 2019, President Donald Trump signed into law HR 2116, the Global Fragility Act. While this act was developed by, neo by the neoconservative and ironically titled United States Institute for Peace, it was introduced to Congress by Democratic Representative Elliot Engel, then chair of the House Committees for, uh, on Foreign Affairs and co-sponsored by a bipartisan group of representatives. The Global Fragility Act represents a new set of strategies for deploying US soft power in a changing world. It focuses US foreign policy on the idea they are so-called fragile states, which are a threat to the US because of their, quote, instability, extremism, conflict, and extreme poverty, end quote. Things which would lead, according to, to this act, to significant mig uh, migration, which the US wants to prevent. Therefore, the stated aim of the Global Fr Fragility Act is to tackle the quote unquote root causes of instability in fragile states. Haiti, I'm sorry, held as landmark legislation as, as, and as a potential game changer in the world of US foreign policy, the act seems to be resetting be a resetting of that policy in ways that shift tactics while maintaining the objectives and strategies of US global domination. The act clearly state, articulates its main goal, to, a, to, a, to advance US national security and interests and to manage rival powers, and that is specifically Russia and China. In this sense, the Global Fragility Act, especially for governments and societies in the Western Hemisphere, seems to be a revamping of the Monroe Doctrine. One of the stated event, uh, uh, objectives of the Global Fragility Act is for the US government to be proactive in preventing conflict and instability. Preventing conflict, promoting stability in, in countries prone to violence, the support of locally driven political institution. This is the language that the act uses to, add, to hide the legislation's real intentions, to rebrand US imperialism by using a wide range of actors and resources, including neo-colonial governments and their local and regional structures, to enact policies aimed at upholding US global power. What is significant about this uh, act is the way that it uses other nations to carry out its objectives, a point that I will come to later. In April 2022, the Biden-Harris administration affirmed its commitment to implementing the Global Fragilities Act by issuing documents outlining a 10-point 
plan that will allow the integration and sequencing of U.S. Diplomat diplomatic, development, and military-related efforts. Funding was allocated in the 2023 budget. The management of the Global Fragilities Act formally brings together the U.S. Agency for International Development, its parent, the State Department, and the Department of Defense. These, there are th five trial countries for the implementation of this act, and Haiti is the first. My comments today focus on the one key point, that Haiti has been and continues to be the main laboratory for U.S. imperial machinations, both in the region and throughout the world. It is no surprise, therefore, that in the rearticulation of a new policy for maintaining global hegemony, the Global Fragilities Act, Haiti is the first target. Without understanding this point, without seeing Haiti as the site of the longest and most brutal neocolonial experiment in the modern world, we cannot fully understand the workings of U.S. and Western hegemony. And if we cannot understand the full extent of U.S. hegemony, we cannot defeat it. Consistent in its hypocrisy, in its deliberation on the Global Fragilities Act, U.S. officials label U Haiti as one of the most fragile states, even as the supposed fragility is caused by more than a century of U.S. In interference and consistent push to deny Haitian sovereignty. It is therefore important to understand the long history and nature of U.S. imperialism through militarization, militarism in Haiti, a clear model of both the role of militarism and the intricate and diffuse enactments of militarism as, of this militarism as imperialism. To begin with, we must recognize that Haitian sovereignty has been stuffed now, stuffed, snuffed out and that Haiti is under current foreign military and political control. Of course, we know the first military occupation occurred from 1915 to 1934. But Haiti lost its sovereignty this time, beginning February 20, 2004. Its state has been dismantled and its government taken over by occupying foreign forces. The plans for this intervention and occupation were hatched in Ottawa, Canada in 2003, dubbed the Ottawa Initiative in Haiti. The objective was to decide the future of Haiti's governance. The administration of Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien and his Liberal Party government organized a two-day conference at Meech Lake, attended by top officials from the U.S., the European Union, and the OAS. There were no representatives from Haiti. Canadian journalist Michael Vastal, who got wind of the secret meeting, reported that the discussion in Ottawa included, quote, the possibility of Aristide's departure, the need for a potential trusteeship on, over Haiti, end quote. By the end of February 2004, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the popularly elected president of Haiti, was deposed, bundled onto a flight by U.S. Marines, and flown to the Central African Republic. U.S. President George W. Bush announced announced almost immediately that he was sending U.S. forces to, quote, help stabilize the country, end quote. On the same night of Aristide's extradition, 200 U.S. troops had already landed at the airport in Haiti. By the evening of the day of the coup, 2,000 U.S., French, and Canadian soldiers were already on the ground. In the meantime, at the behest of the members of the, uh, of, of the United Nations Security Council, U.S. and France, the UN Security Council passed a unanimous resolution that authorized, quote, the immediate deployment of a multinational interim force for a period of three months to help secure and stabilize the capital, Port-au-Prince, and elsewhere in the country, end quote. UN Resolution 1529 was passed under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which authorized the deployment of UN military force to, quote, take all necessary measures to fulfill its mandate. Now, unlike a chapter six resolution, which refers to peacekeeping missions where parties of conflict give their, give their consent, a chapter seven resolution demands no such consent. Haiti is the only place in the world that was not embroiled in civil war, but that received a chapter seven deployment, where UN forces are allowed to use military force to quote, pacify the population. Thus, it is important to note that the 2004 illegal coup d'etat was both enforced and cleaned up with the sanction of the UN. On June 1, 2004, the UN officially took over from U.S. forces and established the United Nations Stabilizing Mission in Haiti, or MINISTA, the acronym for its French name, for the task of military occupation, 
under the guise of establishing peace and security, a multi-billion dollar operation minister had at any given time between 6,000 and 12,000 troops and police stationed in Haiti alongside thousands of bureaucrats, technical staff, and civilian personnel. And we all know, in a horrific parallel to the first occupation, minister soldiers committed numerous acts of violence against the Haitian people, including massacres and rapes. Minister soldiers are responsible for bringing cholera into the country, a disease that officially killed 30,000 people and infected almost a million. But what's most solidified this occupation was the creation and opera, opera, operationalization of the core group, the core group, an international coalition of self-proclaimed and non-black friends of Haiti, <laughs> friends in quotes, was established as part of the UN resolution that brought these foreign soldiers and technocrats into Haiti. Its stated goal was to oversee Haiti's governance through the coordination of various branches of the UN mission. While it is claimed that this occupation officially ended in 2017 with the formal drawdown of the minister mission, the UN has remained in Haiti through a new office with a new acronym, BINU, the, UN, the United Nations Integrated Office in Haiti. BINU's mandate has been continuously renewed from 2017 um, um, to now by the UNSC, the U United Nations Security Council. BINU has had an outsized role public role in Haitian internal political affairs and is the mouthpiece of the core group. While the core group's membership has fluctuated since its initial formation, it currently has nine members, Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Spain, the US, the European Union, the Organization of American States, and the UN. Significantly, this group has never had a Haitian representative and often meets without Haitian representation. Neither neutral nor passive, the core group plays an active interventionist role in Haiti's everyday political affairs. The overwhelming pov power of the poor core group is blatant pu public, visible to all who want to see it. At a special session on Haiti at the UN Security Council just this week, it was the head of the BINU the UN mission in Haiti, who took the lead in presenting Haiti as a basket case of unthinking and violent gangs. Thus unelected and unaccountable by the Haitian people, the core group is the arbiter of neo-colonial indirect rule in Haiti. US imperialism in Haiti is a hierarchical structure established through the power of the US as a superpower, which then outsources the colonial control of Haiti to others. Thus, for example, one of the reasons that this occupation of Haiti, which began in 2004, is not seen as such, is that while it was initiated and largely funded by the United, US and the United Nations, Haiti's sovereignty has been extinguished by a multiracial, multinational coalition of Caribbean, Latin American, and African countries. This may be the most sinister and least talked about aspect of this occupation, but it's also the most effective. In a classified diplomatic cable from 2008, and thank you for WikiLeaks and free Julian Assange, the US Ambassador, the, the US Ambassador Janice Sanderson explained the significance of minister in the shifting US strategy for military intervention and occupation. Sanderson wrote, quote, minister is a remarkable product and symbol of hemispheric cooperation in a country with little going for it. There is no feasible substitute for this UN presence. It is a financial and regional security bargain for the US government. We must work to preserve MINISTA by continuing to partner with it at all levels in coordination with other major donors and MINISTA contributor countries from the hemisphere. That partnering would also counter perceptions in Latin America, in Latin contributing countries that Haitians see their presence in Haiti as unwarranted." End quote. Brazil, for example, was in charge of the military wing of the occupations in 2004. It spent more than $750 million on maintaining military control. For Brazil, the country in Latin America with the largest black population and leftist government at the time, Haiti was its imperial ground zero. But there was also buy-in from other marginalized governments from the Caribbean and Latin America. At one point, ministers' leadership included a representative from Trinidad and Tobago, and an African-American attorney and diplomat. 
And this leadership was accompanied by a multinational military force made up of a number of South American, Caribbean, and African countries, including Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Jamaica, Grenada, Benin, Burkina Faso, Egypt, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, Guinea, Cameroon, Niger, and Mali. How do you hide an occupation? You diversify it. U.S. imperialism involves a gamut of activities from diplomatic influence to cultural warfare to military intervention. It, depend, it depends on a wide range of institutions, of actors, and diverse set of strategies, including the U.S. State Department, the CIA, the USAID, which effectively determines how the occupied states' funds are distributed. It includes, you know, funds, um, it distributes funds, it includes Western NGO projects, controlled opposition of youth, group, youth groups, the use of the National Endowment for Democracy, and then U.S. media and Western media, which often serves as the mouthpieces for the ruling class, preparing the cultural ground for the outside world to accept whatever actions are planned for those under occupation. And here we have to acknowledge the deep racism in the representation and treatment of Haiti. It also includes local and Western-based churches and missionaries, and most importantly, neighboring neo-colonial governments. For Haiti, these governments are the Re Dominican Republic, and more recently, surprisingly, Mexico, who worked with the United States as a co-pen holder for Haiti at the UN Security Council last summer to advocate for foreign military intervention in the country. It is significant that the Global Fragilities Act lays out a plan to see if the U.S. actions in Haiti over the past 20 years lays out a plan that if we see the U.S. actions in Haiti over the past 20 years has already been implemented in Haiti. If we look around, the U.S. has already used this practice in Haiti to extend a different kind of rule over the region. Militarization of the region, for example, has shifted. The U.S. Southern Command, Southcom, is key example, incorporating the Caribbean and South and, 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 South and Central America Southcom claims to be protecting human rights as long-term responsibility to the development of regional militaries controlled and facilitated by the U.S. I want to wrap up by pointing to the need to recognize Haiti's significant critical place as both a laboratory of U.S. militarism and imperialism, but also as a site of, of uh, not, on, as not only laboratory of U.S. militarism and imperialism, but also as a site of one of, of the longest struggles for both black liberation and the anti-colonial independence in the Americas. It is for this reason we also understand why US, the U.S. empire's interest in the expansion of its hegemony has resulted in the constant reactionary onslaught against the people of Haiti and decades of instability for the nation as a whole. The two centuries long imperial counterinsurgency against Haiti has aimed to terminate the most ambitious revolutionary experiment in the modern world. It is no coincidence that the attacks on Haitian sovereignty through an arsenal of tactics has been consistent and consistently banal. We ignore these tactics, we ignore how these tactics will be used on the rest of the region to our peril. The Black Alliance for Peace is team is, is coordinating with collective campaign to fight for a zone of peace. And this peace in the region must begin with Haiti. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamima. I just want to raise, if folks want to applaud when they actually are in, you know, believe that what folks are saying up here is true, you could feel free to do that. Because I saw so many shy moments. Like, do that. You know, energy, we need to also raise the energy in our movement. So do that. All right. So I want to introduce Dr. Jorge Suniga. He earned his doctorate in philosophy at the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. He has published a series of articles and book chapters on the theory of action, ethics, critical theory, social philosophy, biopolitics, and governmentally uh, governmentality in Foucault. He has delivered lectures at conferences in Mexico, the US, Germany, Greece, Costa Rica, Chile, South Korea, Argentina, and Peru. He is professor of practical philosophy in the Department of Philosophy and Letters at Autonomous University of Mexico. Welcome, Dr. Suniga.
Thank you for the introduction and the presentation. Uh, I'm glad to be here with these great colleagues and with the moderator, as well as with the, uh, with this diverse uh, um, uh, audience you know, uh, who is uh, with us. So uh, my colleagues, they talk about uh, this panel and the, the last uh, uh, panel. They, they gave us uh, a lot of data, a lot of statistics, a lot of uh, description of facts that are uh, happening in, in, in Latin America. So uh, I think uh, they, as I, so you, uh, I, just, as I uh, could figure out, uh, they did a, a good job. So in my case, I don't want to, to stress this, this data uh, from the from economics or from from political sciences, I would like to uh, talk about more about uh, how to construct uh, alternatives, or uh, in other words, how we can construct alternatives. Because I think that that is one of the main points of this uh, of this symposium, uh, because. Monroe Doctrine belongs to the uh, territorial uh, coloniality, but in, in Latin America, we have two challenges. Um, the, colo the territorial coloniali coloniality, as well as uh, was what we, with Pablo Gonzalez Casanova, uh, can identify as domestic coloniality. This is one of the most uh, important challenges we have to assume in uh, Latin America, because we lived the first independence, the first emancipation in the 19th century, but we have uh, our countries, our people lived coloniality, in, uh, intern colon coloniality, you know? because of the elites, uh, criollas, because of the, uh, the, the elites, the elite, the elite uh, that um, took the power of our countries, of our people, and they, I di they didn't make justice. Our original people, our Afro-descendant uh, communities, people from Latin America uh, and from, Car uh, from the Caribbean. So I think that uh, we, if we want to undermine this kind of ideological weapons of death, like the uh, Monroe Doctrine, we, at the same time, we have to undermine this uh, domestic uh, colonialism that we live in Latin America and in the Caribbean since we uh, became independent by the first time, when, uh, when we became national states. No, the national, the modern national states in Latin America, they perceive the coloniality in their own countries. So uh, it is not enough to criticize the ter territorial uh, coloniality as um, uh, well as it was well placed by my colleagues with the OEA, uh, for example, with the uh, Monroe Doctrine, no, no, that's not enough. We have to fight in our countries in order to uh, make justice to this, uh, to the excluded from the first independence uh, in Latin America. So um, why do we have to, to think about it, uh, to think of uh, this, this kind uh, of situation? Because if we, we are in a kind of, in, in a, a new call of history. Um, due to the conditions, uh, the U.S. government has to, have to, has to uh, concede many uh, policies they pushed in an imperialistic way. So this is the, the reason why, for example, in South, in South America, from the global south, uh, we are constructing or we push the alternatives to uh, this neocolonial, uh, neoliberal order that we live uh, since the last 
cent, uh, century, uh, the last uh, 30, uh, 30 years in the last century. So, uh, I thought, why in the global south we construct, we push the alternatives to this, to this uh, colonial or neo-colonial order? Because we have to live, because we want to live, because we can live with this, uh, with this uh, order, political order of death. No? For that reason, I stated that uh, Monroe Doctrine is an ideological uh, weapon of death because there are not only political, economical uh, weapons, like the sanctions for, sanctions, for example, economical sanctions, like, for example, uh, subordination, or these strategies that my colleague uh, described well. No? The domination is is ideological as well. And this, um, this idea that, uh, uh, and this tergiverse idea of Amer uh, America uh, for Americans, that is something that uh, is exhausted. Um, and it, uh, it is valid anymore. So uh, this reminds me the a statement on uh, uh, on the other side that uh, a few weeks uh, ago uh, the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, stated clearly uh, to the uh, U.S. government, "We are uh, nosotros ya no somos una colonia. We are not we are not a colony anymore." So. So in this, I, this is what we need in Latin America. Uh, any more, any uh, neoliberal governments that are supported by the U.S. governments. Uh, we need new political leaders who take, who assume a ethical responsibility uh, in relation to uh, regarded to, to our people, to our communities, and that ma can make justice as uh, the uh, well-known uh, efforts by Lula da Silva or Lopez Obrador have uh, have, have been made. So, Yeah, uh, one, one point more. And this is not only, we, we, are, we agree that this fight is political. Yeah. We have to fight, we have to, to, to construct the alternative no? in these two ways I underline uh, in relation to the uh, territorial coloniality and the domestic, domestic coloniality. But at the same time, and this is uh, maybe uh, a call for my uh, colleagues in philosophy or sociolog sociologists and, and professors, researchers, we have to think about the theories that uh, combine, accompany, uh, combine? accompany, Company, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, you have to think in theories that uh, plays as company uh, in this process of uh, liberation towards a second emancipation in Latin America, because uh, here uh, and maybe it's because I have in, in mind some uh, criticism uh, from uh, compañeros y compañeras that critics, uh, are really critical to, to ideas. But the problem is that ideas and new concepts help us to understand the social world and the social, uh, the, the political world, the social world, the social uh, sphere from other, from other, uh, all with all other lens. 
And we need that. We have new con uh, concepts, new ideas, in order to understand our current world. And that is maybe the, I see many uh, uh, um, journalists here in, in, in this room. But for example, this is the reason why. And at least I see that situation clearly in Mexico. That is the reason why progressive journalists don't understand, for example, uh, progressive uh, governments no, from Latin America because they are building something new. These governments like Lula da Silva, like uh, Andres Manuel, Lopez Obrador, and they are really complex f figures. No? And this is the reason why uh, progressive uh, journalists, for example, I think in two in, in CNN, no, that uh, they are in Mexico, they are progressive and they they work for the for, for CNN, but they don't understand this uh, this kind of of changes in Latin America. They don't understand this kind of uh, political figures like Lopez Obrador, like uh, Lula, no. That is the reason why, for example, it's easy to, to, to describe these figures as uh, caudillos, for example, as di uh, dictators, and, and this is other thing. No? So no, yeah, I, I put only the, the, the example, I, place, I display this example with journalists, but what I want to, to mean uh, is that uh, all this, the social sciences, all the humanities, uh, on, and now I relate direct to, di directly to the, to the theories. Ha, we have to be in, um, in the level of the current social world. And we have to develop uh, these new theories that are a companion, a, a, a company, a, a company, sorry, a company of these political processes. No? And we have here in this room as well, uh, important and relevant authors that have developed this kind of, of theories, like the decolonial theory. That is one, one theory that we need in order to achieve this second emancipation. There are other, one, uh, other theories like philosophy of liberation, for example, critical, uh, Latin American critical theory, and many uh, the dependence theory, the economical dependence theory, uh, and we need these, these, uh, these theories just a, back, a, a ground in order to construct uh, new ideas, new con uh, concepts, and new conceptions of the complex social world that we live in Latin America. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shuniga precisely for reminding us of the battle of ideas, which is very important. Battle of ideas and the battle for emotions. All right, so our last speaker um, is going to be Professor Maldonado Torres. He's a professor at the Department of Latino and Caribbean Studies and the Comparative Literature Program. He obtained a PhD in 2002 at Brown University, Religious Studies with a certificate for Outstanding Work in Africana Studies, Distinction Phi Beta Kappa. He is also co-editor of Latinos in the World System, Decolonization Struggles in the 21st Century, U.S. Empire, and guest editor of two special issues entitled Thinking Through the Decolonial Turn, Post-Continental Interventions in Theory, Philosophy, and Critique. Welcome, Professor Maldonado. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure being here with you today. I am now teaching in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut, but I'm coming here mainly as the co-director of the Franz Fanon Foundation. And it's a special pleasure coming from the foundation and seeing this event that is being organized and then sponsored by a great number of grassroots organizations. And I think that already that speaks to the kind of solutions that we want to, uh, uh, to advance. It's also a pleasure to be at an event that on the one hand we're meeting today to share some ideas, different forms of analysis, 
but that it started with a policy day yesterday where uh, an organizer had the pleasure of joining uh, uh, the morning section of the discussions and preparations and some of the initial visits uh, to legislators. So I think that that again presenting a kind of a combative paradigm for knowledge sharing and knowledge uh, production that uh, we definitely need uh, more of. So my congratulations to the organizers for uh, for gathering us, for bringing us together, and for offering us this uh, model of building together. Now, when I uh, initially learned about the event, and I'm going to uh, be somewhat brief, I'm going to outline a series of points that are the ones that I would like to leave on the table for you. And one of them is when I uh, uh, first was invited to, uh, uh, to the event to think about borrowing the Monroe Doctrine, to see about uh, a new policy, a potential developing a new policy or advocating for a new policy in the US for a new Latin America and the Caribbean, um, I was, my, one of my first thoughts was how are we going to advance in advocating for a new policy towards Latin America and the Caribbean when we live in a country that is keeping still very old policies, colonial racist policies towards its own indigenous people. And when in the t still in the 21st century, we have to march and go to the street to shout Black Lives Matter. And when, and when also still in the 21st century, the US remains a colonial power that controls the oldest colony in the modern world the unincorporated territory of Puerto Rico. So where to begin? Where, you know, what are the bases that we think that we can generate that change when already, w look who we're talking about, look, see about the public policy you know, in place. So how to advocate for a change of foreign policy um, is my, was my question when these are the conditions, right? And then how to do so then, maybe to engage in advocating for foreign policy while also simultaneously advocating for dramatic public policy change, both simultaneously and in an interrelational form. How to do that? Um, that was one set of ideas and questions that emerged. The other was that when I look at Latin America, uh, as it has been commented you know, uh, here, uh, uh, that Latin America is still largely uh, anti-indigenous, anti-black region. And with the, with the exception of Cuba and Venezuela, uh, m most of the territory probably, I mean, I'll, I'll go there and put it like that and we can then uh, uh, modify it, but you know, most of the territory is somewhat or greatly indifferent to the condition of, of Puerto Rico uh, because it's being incorporated in the US. So Puerto Rico is neither the US or Latin America. It is in this limbo zone and again, with the exception of Cuba and Venezuela, which was, uh, have tend to always come out in, in bringing out the topic about the colonization of Puerto Rico, um, Puerto Rico barely matters in the rest of the, of the territory. So I was wondering whether, in addition to burying, burying the Monroe Doctrine, we have to think about burying an old-fashioned 19th century idea of Latin America. And therefore, if we have to build with indigenous movements and other movements that had advocated for different imaginaries and different conceptualizations of the region, like Avia Yala, Gran Comarca, and so on, that these are not simply slogans or kind of aesthetic or kind of literary provocations, but I think they are actually very important sociopolitical, uh, cosmological, geographical, geopolitical implications of what that is. So what would it be to enter this debate not thinking about a new Latin America, but about thinking of somehow going beyond Latin America itself, right? Because that, that notion of the Latin America. And I think we can take our lead from places like the Caribbean and Haiti will be in the, in the leading, uh, in, the, in, in, in a leading role, thinking us, taking us beyond these ideas, I think, too. Um, now, Coming from, I am, I am Puerto Rican, and I, this is the, the panel on militarism. So I, I could not uh, obviate the fact that, uh, particularly in this panel, that right now, to t 2023, this year, is the 20th anniversary 
of the expulsion of the Marines from the island of Vieques in, in Puerto Rico, in the archipelago of Puerto Rico, right? It was May, May 1st, so almost literally 20 years, right? And so I think that, you know, Vieques is part of the story of the Monroe Doctrine. And the, and the expulsion of the Marines 20 years ago is part of the story about how to bury it, right? And so uh, the Marines occupied about two-thirds of the islands of Vieques, and they remained there for about 70 years. Uh, and there has been opposition to that presence for, for decades, but in 1999, there was the uh, death of David, David Sanas Rodriguez during a military exercise, and that led to massive forms of coalition and protest that ultimately led to that expulsion. And from, and, uh, uh, from Vieques, or with regards to Vieques, I would like to highlight two things, and one was the power of those mobilizations and the strong forms of solidarity until then, it, until that moment, right? Uh, the mobilization in support of Vieques and against the presence of the Marines in the island of Vieques, they led to the most massive mobilizations known in Puerto Rico until that moment and brought people from the different political parties, no matter the status they prefer for the island, the political status, many of them were supporting uh, that the Marines had to go. What used to be a slogan only for independentistas or those who advocated for independence uh, then became a slogan for the entire uh, our nation. And so I think that there is something there very important, really very important about those junctures and conjunctures where those forms of solidarities take place and how do they take place. And so they remain there as forms of you know, effective burying of something when we come together in that powerful way. Uh, more recently, we saw then a, another massive form of manifestation, even more massive, which was in 2019 in the Verano Combativo, the Combati Summit of 2019, that led to the outskirts, uh, to the expulsion of the governor, resignation of the governor, right, of the island. So again, I think that the island colony, the archipelago colony, um, is providing some, also some uh, fundamental examples and ideas and proposals about how to uh, bury effectively some of these uh, policies and ideas. Now with Vieques, the other point that I want to highlight is the, the strong environmental, social, and economic impact of the military presence there. So Vieques is clearly an example that simple departures, retiradas, from colonial armed military power from territories that they had possessed for a long time are not enough to address the impact of their domination, right? So the impact of the Marines and Vieques cannot be solved without major reparations for Vieques. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has is, uh, stood for some, you know, a number of, of responses from the U.S. government to address the situation in the island that is now also a sort of a, a, a bill that is being circulated by a very right-wing uh, um, Puerto Rican politician who also is expected to run for governor um, soon. But the a great irony of that proposal is that wrapped around the notion of rehabilitation, that these rehabilitations run short of the actual reparations needed in the island. And second, that how to address then reparations in Vieques without thinking about reparations for the entire, to the entire archipelago of Puerto Rico for more than 100 years of colonialism. And so uh, it's a tragedy and a catastrophe that among the options for, of political status in Puerto Rico, you don't find anyone, any of them that tells the, the people of Puerto Rico, well, you can decide for this status, but this, this status will require, and potentially all of them, massive forms of reparations uh, to undo the damage that the U.S. presence has done in the island. And I think that the reparations would not ha uh, have to be limited to the archipelago of Puerto Rico. They would have to extend to nearby islands and nearby territories as well. And something else to point out is that it doesn't suffice either with reparations for Vieques or even reparation for Puerto Rico. Or how ironic would it be now for anyone to talk about rehabilitating Vieques particularly when they are advocating for the presence and continued presence of the fiscal board in Puerto Rico, PROMESA, that was created under Barack Obama, not Donald Trump. Right? 
and that became a quite direct form of economic colonialism uh, today. Now, the, the second point that I wanted to highlight uh, is that this is also the year 2023 represents 125 years after 1898 when uh, Puerto Rico then comes to be a, a, a territory of the United States. Uh, and so with 1898 then, uh, there was, a, of course, a heavy military presence uh, of, uh, in Puerto Rico through the different military bases, not only in, uh, in Vieques, but also in other parts of the island. And also, um, since then, then Puerto Ricans have been participated uh, uh, forcibly in many cases when there was the, the draft uh, in the wars led by the US, Puerto Ricans in the Korean War, Puerto Ricans in the First and Second World Wars, Puerto Ricans in the War in Vietnam, and so on. So when we think about militarism and colonialism today, we need to think about, look at about these examples. And Puerto Rico, as, as some here in this group have uh, well documented and pointed out, that Puerto Rico becomes a land, a kind of zone for military recruitment uh, today, right? So the island colony that, among other things, becomes a source for uh, uh, military power even as it suffers from the presence of the military in the island. Now, I, I wanted uh, uh, then to think about, you know, what are the sources in a place like Puerto Rico and going beyond Puerto Rico about how to overcome this uh, militarism? I mean, how to explain the fact that many people in the island, colonized people, joined the, joined the military of the, of the power that is dominating that very land, right? And you know that you have to prepare the ground for that. That doesn't happen automatically. You have to have a system of education that leads people to see this as completely normal, that they don't see uh, the current status or the presence of the military as a problem. So you need a kind of heavy education system that is uh, leading everyone to see themselves as the benefactors, as the recipients of the graces of US power, right? So the question is how then to intervene with another education, I think is part of this, of our, of our way of thinking about undermining militarism, undermining the desires that, every, that anyone can see in wanting to join the military, for example. What would that be to have an education that will lead to that, other, to that kind of thinking? And I want to point out that the University of Puerto Rico actually has been traditionally a site of, of counter-colonial, anti-colonial, and counter-military stuff. And that it is not by chance then that the University of Puerto Rico has been kind of the target of these forms, heavy forms of, of impoverishment, of the investing from, from the uh, uh, local uh, commonwealth, quote unquote commonwealth. So I think that whatever, uh, whatever response we give to the problem of militarism uh, in Puerto Rico, but also in other places, is connected with education. And it's connected with a kind of education and alternatives to a military way of being and a military outlook in the world that are provided in schools and universities. Puerto Rico has actually, the University of Puerto Rico has been characterized for being particularly, again, counter-colonial and counter-military, but not necessarily a, a countering anti-blackness. And that has been until very recently when we have, right now at the moment when the university is so impoverished, we have some of the most, the strongest forms of efforts with recently a, una segunda cumbre afro. There was a second uh, summit uh, dedicated to uh, uh, African people and African descendant peoples in Puerto Rico. And right now there's been a resurgence. So I think that that is connected to the possibility of then reimagining the University of Puerto Rico as a site of both counter-colonial, counter-military, but also counter-anti-blackness uh, generally. And finally, I end with this, as much as the university can offer, it will not be able, I think, to offer this kind of education soon. The best examples of this kind of counter-colonial, um, counter-military, and, uh, and counter-anti-black racist forms of thinking uh, appears on the ground in the education of groups like La Colectiva Feminista in Construcción, which offers uh, workshops and that educates the entire uh, people of Puerto Rico and beyond into what is a radical feminist, uh, they call it a radical feminist uh, thought grounded on decolonial thought and black feminism. And by doing that, they are bringing, they are putting themselves in Puerto Rico, drawing from 
black feminism, US black feminism, and drawing from anti-colonial uh, theories from Latin America and the Caribbean, and they, I think, are at the leading edge of this kind of education that hopefully we can see at the University of Puerto Rico and that hopefully we can see in the schools, and then that can animate this larger resistance against colonialism and militarism in the island. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Let's give them another round of applause. I think one important element to take from this panel is that part of burying 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine is also uncovering our truths as Latin American and Caribbean countries, as oppressed people generally, our histories of resistance, our mechanisms of survival, detached from capitalism and imperialism, understanding that capitalism and imperialism are antithetical to anything that has to do with solidarity, collaboration, democracy, and therefore we need to reimagine new ways of living, new ways of relating, and there are models that have been set out for us, models that have been uh, suppressed, that have been attacked, that have been in a lot of ways um, attempted to be buried themselves, and they have resisted. They are still here. When Chavez passed, people thought that the Bolivarian Revolution was gonna die. The Bolivarian Revolution's still here. When we had the passing of Fidel Castro, it was the same thing. These imperialists believe, they really do believe, that they can counteract the people's will. And they do not count with the fact that when the people, the force of the people, is behind a revolutionary process, they cannot defeat it. And so let's be fed by that energy. Thank you so much for everything you've shared. Que viva Puerto Rico Libre y Socialista. Que viva Haití Libre. Que vivan todos los pueblos del mundo de Latinoamérica. Compañeras, y que viva Perú también. Que viva Perú también, soberano. Um, lunch is ready. Um, let's try to be back here. Oh, special guests first. Let's try to be back here by 2.20, please. We're going to get started with our next panel, hopefully on time. Special guest first, lunch is ready. Thank you very much.
PowerPoint for this. I'm just gonna have Liz hang out and take pictures on there. <laughs> All right, we're starting the next panel. Yay! Good afternoon. Can you see me? Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Christine Espinel. I'm the co-chair of the Colombia Human Rights Committee. Um, and I'm here, and I'm very happy to moderate this panel, and also a little nervous, <laughs> because this, <laughs> okay. Um, this panel on foreign and independent economic model will examine the regional shift away from neoliberalism and toward the new economic proposal to rebalance power in the hemisphere. Before giving the floor to the first panelist, I would like to say that this is a, is a vast topical with, with ramifications in all of our economies. In my own country, Colombia, we see how the embrace of neoliberalist policies uh, beginning in the early 90s and has led to the destruction of much of our, our agriculture and domestic food product production, leading Colombia to depend on food imports, despite we have a, a lot of land and fertile land. And this has only exacerbated all these um, neoliberalism and all these policies. The only thing that is doing is in exacerbate the rural inequality. Colombia has the highest rural Gini coefficient in the world, a crucial factor for driving the ongoing violence as many young people in rural areas see join one of the armed forces. In looking for a salary to live because they don't have anything to do in the, in the countryside anymore. Um, okay, and even the progressive governments in the region, including Colombians, most content with neoliberalism economies and uh, as they are bringing them under control and adopt regulations that uphold people's rights and lines to profit and power of private capital. And now I'm going to, um, now I'm going to give the floor to the first panelist is Kevin Young. Okay, Kevin Young is a teacher um, on Latin American history at the University of Massachusetts. He is the author of the Blood of the Earth. 
Resource National Revolution in Empire in Bolivia, 2017. And, um, and he also, uh, also wrote a book about Venezuela's under siege, about US sanctions and Venezuela's communist expiration in participatory democracy. Kevin? All right. Have the, <laughs> you have okay. the floor. Thank you, thank you. Um, so let me preface this by saying that uh, I think that not everything I say uh, is going to be news uh, to all of you today. Uh, some of it you will have heard before, but I am gonna try to provide a little bit of additional information and evidence uh, that you can hopefully use in your own work uh, once we leave this room today, uh, your education and your organizing work. Uh, so please feel free to steal anything that you want from the PowerPoint that I'm going to show. So these are the three questions uh, that I was asked to address, and all three of these questions are huge. Um, there's no way to address them comprehensively, so I'm going to try to hit on a few key points. So the first question, uh, what strategies do U.S. and Latin American elites use to thwart progressive reform? Well, a lot of the strategies are actually very similar uh, to what we see in the United States, things like the, the strategies that you see on this slide here. Um, these strategies are described in detail in a report from 2018 from Oxfam and Claxo, uh, which I really recommend. It's really a detailed report on exactly this question of how Latin American elites try to thwart um, attempts uh, specifically at progressive tax reform in uh, different Latin American countries. Um, but the same mechanisms really do apply in all different policy areas. Um, the report itself uh, doesn't actually deal with uh, some of the other mechanisms that elites like to use, though. Uh, so I'm going to focus on some other things today. So, of course, U.S. military aid, uh, U.S.-led political subversion, the things that we've been talking about all day today, uh, and uh, two other mechanisms in particular that I'm going to focus a little more on uh, because they relate directly to the economy. So U.S. sanctions being one. We've already heard uh, quite a bit about sanctions today. And there's a fourth form of coercion uh, that I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about, which uh, stems from the structural power that capitalists enjoy because of the fact that they control investments and they control the resources that the rest of us depend upon. So it's not just uh, U.S. government imposed sanctions that inhibit attempts at reform. It's also the fact, the very fact of the structure of our economies, of our global capitalist economy that gives private investors and markets so much control over the decisions that affect our lives. Uh, so this sort of refusal to provide the resources that people need is much more routine, in fact, than sanctions. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that. So these last two strategies that you see derive their coercive power from the fact that we depend on the resources that capitalists control. So that's jobs, it's loans, it's the availability of housing, it's all of the essential goods and services that we depend upon. Those who comply with the wishes of US and Latin American elites are promised new investments, new loans, new products, while those who dissent are threatened with the withdrawal of those resources. Now this is similar to the structural power that capitalists wield within the US economy. Here, whenever government signals the slightest challenge to business prerogatives and privileges, government is threatened with the loss of jobs, loans, investments, and everything else. We see this, for example, in Chicago with the recent election of a progressive mayor, right? The way that business is reacting to Brandon Johnson's election. We see, we see the same dynamic at play in somewhere like Brazil after Lula's recent reelection. Business leaders uh, looking at Brazil are now warning about the disinvestment of capital that is going to follow uh, from even the slightest progressive reform that Lula tries to uh, enact. Uh, so take, for example, Lula's recent uh, announcement of a new tax on crude oil exports. 
As the oil giant Shell uh, recently threatened, uh, this is going to lead to uncertainty about new decisions regarding investments. So that's a thinly veiled threat that we are going to deprive your economy of the resources you need. These threats of disinvestment are sometimes just hot air. Sometimes they're just hyperbole, but sometimes they are carried out. Sometimes they actually become what we can call capital strikes, the withdrawal of investments. For instance, Venezuelan capitalists waged a capital strike against Hugo Chavez government from his first term on, culminating in a uh, massive oil industry lockout, 2002 to 2003, and continuing after that in a variety of other forms. The flip side of these threats is the promise to deliver new investments and aid if government behaves properly. So basically, do what we want and you'll be rewarded. So in the case of Central America, Biden has this thing called the Partnership for Central America, which uh, involves pledges of several billion dollars in new private investments in the region. However, US-based corporations have made clear that in return for those investments, they expect further deregulation, uh, as well as infrastructural investment from both US and Central American governments, All right? So the goal of this strategy of leveraging your control over capital is to induce a change in policymakers' uh, behavior. So it's having some effect in Brazil already. Lula was in Portugal this week courting business, courting investors, and trying to reassure them that you can still come to Brazil, right? And what he was promising specifically is that his government will maintain fiscal discipline the way that investors like, right? So that's what business tries to achieve with these threats. Now, another expression of this reward and punish approach involving the structural power of investment capital is uh, the so-called free trade agreements. And I know that Jose Luis is going to talk a little bit about these, but you know, we're talking about NAFTA uh, and its uh, successor agreement, CAFTA, and other bilateral trade agreements. Um, without going into much detail here, I want to make two points about the misnomer that is the term free trade agreement. Uh, free trade agreements are not about freedom, and they're not centrally about trade either. So what do I mean by that? Trying to get my slide to advance. There we go. Oh, at once. So they do, they do involve greater free freedom, but for people with already with uh, resources, right? They don't involve freedom for the, for the rest of the population. So a uh, few examples. Uh, they eliminate tariffs. Uh, between countries, but they don't uh, eliminate subsidies to industry. So the U.S. Uh, agribusiness sector has long enjoyed lavish subsidies at taxpayer expense. And one of the reasons why NAFTA had such a dev devastating impact on Mexico's agricultural sector was precisely because the, the long-standing U.S. government aid to private agribusiness. Uh, so, you know, CEPR uh, has done a lot of great work on the, the impacts of NAFTA. Uh, 1.9 million uh, net jobs lost in the, in the Mexican agricultural sector as of 2017. Right. Uh, another example, uh, they free up cross-border investment. They don't free up uh, cross-border migration. So glaring uh, contradiction there, at least if we're uh, taking them at their word that they're trying to promote freedom. A uh, second reason, oh, sorry, let me go back. A second reason why free trade is a, is a misnomer is that these agreements are not primarily about trade. They're actually more about giving investors extra privileges, enhancing the, the advantages that investors already enjoy. So through some of the mechanisms that I've shown here, right? And I won't go into to detail on these, uh, but just to say that the FTAs are another example of capital wielding its structural power over governments and over populations and actually codifying that, that power into law. Uh, one of the explicit goals of agreements like NAFTA and CAFTA is precisely to lock in, as commentators often said, lock in neoliberal economic policies such that when new governments come to power, uh, reform-oriented governments, they find it very hard to break out of the mold of this neoliberal straitjacket. Right, Jose Luis can talk a little bit about that in the case of Mexico. 
So what this effectively does is it insulates crucial decisions about economic policy from the democratic will of the population. Now, most of what I've said to, to this point also applies to our domestic US political context in the United States. This structural power that is wielded by the owners of capital is clearly apparent in the US as well. In the context of Latin America, though, threats of economic withdrawal are accompanied by other weapons that magnify this corporate and imperial power still further, such as sanctions enforced by the US government. So what the sanctions effectively do is intensify the structural advantage that businesses and investors inherently enjoy within a capitalist economy. Sanctions constitute capital strikes that are ordered and enforced by the US government. Now, the official justifications for this kind of policy Five minutes. Are, are familiar. Uh, we you know, heard a lot about national security and so on. Uh, Obama's famous declaration in 2015. Uh, there is some precedent for this sort of outlandish claim. If we go back to uh, the case of Cuba in 1961, this is what the, US, um, uh, the Mexican ambas ambassador to the US had to say at the time. Uh, we can't, you know, Mexico is a US ally, but even this was a bridge too far for them. They said, we can't publicly declare that Cuba is a threat to our security. Uh, 40 million Mexicans will die laughing. So the powerful always gaslight their victims, of course. So it's not about uh, uh, national security, maybe it's about democracy and human rights. Uh, this doesn't pass the laugh test either uh, for a number of reasons that we can talk about. Um, so the real justification, the real logic behind these sanctions policies uh, goes to the fact uh, that uh, Latin American autonomy has always been viewed as a threat. Uh, and this is clearly uh, articulated in the internal government policy documents. Um, now, the logic of sanctions follows directly from that. Uh, so I'll just give you a few uh, historical examples. Maybe they're familiar to you, maybe not. Uh, the explicit uh, intention of these sanctions, uh, they're very clear about it. So we're not imputing motives when we're saying that sanctions are designed to strangle civilian populations. Uh, if we go to Chile, 1970, uh, perhaps even more uh, direct, uh, the quotation from the US ambassador, and a uh, quotation from the Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, talking here about uh, one of the, the larger goals of uh, the sanctions against Chile, which was to prevent the prospect that Allende can consolidate himself and that the picture projected to the world will be his success. Because if that happens, Chile's model effect could be insidious. So the threat here is that it could convince other people in the global south that maybe they have a right to control their own destinies as well. All right, so this goes to the, the heart of what we're talking about in this panel about the threat of an alternative in, uh, economic model. So the same logic behind these sanctions applies today in the 21st century. I'm not gonna dwell on this, uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, we can talk more about this. Uh, this. The panel earlier this morning also uh, uh, reference the quote from Mike Pompeo from 2018. Um, it's worth emphasizing here that there is a bipartisan agreement on the goals behind these policies. Uh, so the, the criticisms when they do emerge are basically about uh, the execution, right? They're about the tactical failure of the policy, not the fact that they're killing tens of thousands of people, not the fact that they're illegal, right? Uh, to give you one, uh, to go back to this report, which uh, if, uh, it was mentioned earlier, if you haven't read it, I uh, definitely recommend it. But this report from CEPR, which found that there were 40,000 uh, uh, casualties in Venezuela in just the first year of the financial sanctions. Uh, this is, by any reasonable standard, one of the most important documents uh, of recent history about Venezuela and the impact of sanctions. Yet, how many times has it been mentioned in the US press? Well, I did some database searches, and by my count, it's been mentioned once, right? One time in four years, right? And that's at a point when the, the US press is mentioning Venezuela constantly. All right, now, just to uh, skip forward here and um, say a word about, I always try to fit too much into a presentation. Um, alternative policies, right? So. 
this is a big question, um, but you know, we can look to the experiences of Latin American social movements, Latin America's own progressive and revolutionary movements over the last century, including over the last couple of decades. Um, so uh, the kinds of alternatives that movements in Latin America have been promoting are a combination of what we might call social democratic reforms, which are things like uh, all of the stuff that you see here, you know, it's pretty common sense stuff. None of these ideas are coming from me. They're not original. Um, but uh, in relevant to the, the, the theme of the panel here and what I was saying about structural power, uh, it's, it's uh, also important to think about the kinds of reforms that are going to reduce and eventually eliminate capitalist ability to disrupt the economy, to remove that structural power that capitalists enjoy by virtue of the fact that they control all of the resources that society depends upon. All right, so uh, some of these are not just social democratic reforms. Some are actually uh, 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 involve uh, wholesale uh, transformations of economic structures to deprive capitalists of that ability, all right? Uh, so I think I will uh, leave it there. I know I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. And now we're going to go to the second panelist, Jose Luis Granado Ceja. <coughs> Jose Luis Granado Ceja is a journalist and political analyst based in Mexico City. He is the staff writer with Venezuela Analysis, covering regions and <coughs> international issues and writes a monthly opinion column in the Mexico Solidarity Project. He is currently pursuing his master's degree in defense of human rights in the University, La Universidad Autónoma de la Ciudad de México. Jose Luis, tiene la palabra. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I decided to title this Mexico and the Cost of the Defense of national, national Sovereignty because that's kind of the basis of how the political struggle, especially over the last few months, has been expressing itself and it's sort of a way for me to kind of sum up what's happening. And I think if we're looking at Lopez Obrador's economic policy, it can actually be somewhat summed up by this quote from him himself, where he says, we, show, we must show that modernity can be forged from below and without excluding anyone, and that development does not have to be contrary to social justice. And for those of you who are familiar with sort of the developmentalist uh, history of Latin America, that's sort of the same kind of a rescuing of that kind of thinking. And I'm gonna use that word intentionally a lot. I think we can sum it up, uh, you know, Mexico's fourth transformation. We call it the fourth transformation because the first one was the independence struggle, the second one was the reform period, the third one being the Mexican Revolution, and this one being the fourth. And like I said, you can basically sum it up as being an anti-neoliberal and nationalist development strategy to redistribute wealth via the state and to drive economic development in the country. So there's been a massive expansion of direct cash transfer programs under this administration to the degree that now 71% of Mexican households benefit from at least one social program. Uh, the minimum wage has been increased 90% in real terms over the last few years of this government. And then I wanna focus on these last two points, which is what we've seen, which is the, what we call the rescue of Pemex, the state oil company, and the Comisión Federal de Electricidad, the electricity company. Of course, also coming with that is the nationalization of lithium. This is just a quick graphic that shows um, the priority programs of the government. I'm gonna go through it and just pass it real quick, but it gives you an idea of just the broad range of what the government is trying to do in various areas of, of the Mexican economy and social life. So when we talk about the National Electricity Company, what we've seen is a reversal of the liberalization that happened over the neoliberal period, which is to say basically since the late 80s in Mexico until the revival of Lopez Obrador in 2018, what we're calling the second nationalization of the electricity industry. It was originally nationalized in 1960. And what this is is basically trying to bring the Mexican state back as the majority uh, uh, generator of electricity. So that gives them control over the actual market. Very recently, the government actually purchased 13 power generation stations from the Spanish multinational Iberdrola. Gives you an idea. So instead of selling off public assets, they're actually buying it and bringing them in. Uh, and now the Mexican state will maintain 65% of energy generation by late 2024, which is when Lopez Obrador's term will end. He cannot seek re-election due to the Mexican constitution. 
The next one would be Pemex, the state oil company. So it was like so many things that we've seen, I think particularly in the United States uh, and Canada, uh, which is that they s deliberately starve it of investment to try to basically suffocate it. Uh, and it was part of a neoliberal scheme aimed at privatization, which is to say that, oh, it doesn't work as a publicly owned, state-owned company, so let's privatize it, right? But that's actually all been turned around, in fact, deliberately so as part of the, uh, the economic policies of the government, which is to say that an actual turnaround in oil production, they purchased the Deer Park refinery in Texas, six existing refineries that were basically rusted out, have been uh, rehabilitated and now refurbished, and, are and they're building a brand new refinery called Olmeca in Dos Bocas, Tabasco. And so you can get, see the figures there. The, the expectation is by 2024, there would be energy self-sufficiency. The next one is the creation of Litio MX, which is the lithium, the state-owned lithium company. Uh, Mexico has uh, many reserves of lithium. As we know, it's the new white gold. It's a key to the energy transition. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of interest by multinational companies to control this, but we're seeing this trend throughout the region of bringing that under state control in order for it to benefit the population. And that's no exception in the case of Mexico. Uh, the, they were actually officially nationalized in April of 2022, and the state-run oil company will have exclusive rights to mine lithium. And I think it's important, as we continue talking about this, to focus on a second on the political reality in Mexico. So 2018 saw a landslide victory for López Obrador and the uh, Morena party, his political party. And since then, I think this is really important because it informs the way that uh, the opposition has been responding, is that they've actually won 12 out of 15 governorship races. There's one coming up very soon, which uh, Morena is also expected to win in the state of Mexico, which has been ruled for nearly a century by the PRI. Uh, so the opposition parties, the PRI, the PAN, the PRD, and Movimiento Ciudadano, they have been unable to articulate a coherent response to this political reality. So the opposition finds itself compelled to mobilize in the streets, but it struggles to engage citizens and win support on a political basis. And so what does that lead to? This. And I think this is kind of the central uh, hypothesis of, of my presentation here. They're unable to win, the pop win over the population, and so they seek to assert power and influence via other means. Uh, and what are those other means? Well, we have, if, if you've been watching the news, you've probably and been t and seen the news around Mexico, it's been around this reform to the electoral body. We call it the INE. Um, and so what they've done is try to kind of latch on to this issue in order to try to win some legitimacy, win some support from the Mexican population. Uh, I want to go really quickly just because of time, but you know, they obviously, like other Obviously, like um, in, in other parts of the world, you know, they retreat into the private media, they use the courts, and what our topic of today, right, into the arms of imperialism. So this is, a, this is the way that the elites in Mexico are trying to, despite not having political power, be able to try to influence the situation inside of the country. And so I call them Mex the, the conservative strongholds. So, you know, I was talking about this, uh, the defense of the Electoral Institute. Just really quickly want to mention, you know, so the opposition mobilized its supporters. They held a successful rally. A lot of people took to the streets, 200,000 people. I think we should be honest that they were able to mobilize around this. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. Lopez Obrador called for his own demonstration in kind. And in that case, there was actually an estimated 1 million people in the streets of Mexico City. And so you can see, this is an iconic picture of the day. I didn't take this picture, it's by a colleague of mine, but you can see kind of like the sea of people and it's, 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 quite, it's quite the powerful image. But you can, here, this is a picture of mine. You can see, uh, you know, the people coming out to the streets, showing their, their demonstration and answering on the streets in, in, by mobilizing to say, um, okay, fine, you took your supporters out, well, we have ours and we're five times as much. Hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, as they were going through the, this process of the, of, uh, ultimately they weren't able to get the constitutional reform passed because you need a, a supermajority to do it in the Congress. Um, so they presented a plan B. Same thing, opposition sees this plan B, decides to mobilize against it, and same thing. Uh, in this case, I would say that it's important to point out where the first one they were trying to seem like, oh no, we're just here to defend the Electoral Institute, we're just here to defend democracy, where have we heard that before? The second rally, they were explicitly political. They were mobilizing on a political basis against Lopez Obrador, against Morena as a party. And so, 
as, as, as should be done in these cases. What did the president ask for? Well, he also asked for his supporters to march again. And similarly, we see a mass turnout filling the Socalo, an estimated 200,000, 250,000 people, again, larger than the opposition's demonstration. You can see here another picture of the Socalo. Anybody who's been in Mexico, it's that huge public plaza at the center of the city, totally filled with the supporters. And I wanna really focus on this last one. You can see that banner at the top um, where it says, uh, in defense of national sovereignty. And I think that's really important because they're doing it on those terms. We're rescuing that kind of terminology and the people who are attending these demonstrations understand what it means to stick up for their own country's sovereignty. And I think that's in the face of attacks of imperialism, that's really critical, right? Um, and you can see there, there's this deliberate effort to tie to historical moments. This, this, this rally was called on the 85th anniversary of the nationalization and the expropriation of the oil industry in 1935, you can, or sorry, 1938. See the picture of President Lázaro Cárdenas there. Uh, and then on two López Obrador's left, that's López Mateos. He's the one who originally nationalized the electricity industry. And in the middle, López Obrador, wh uh, who nationalized the lithium industry in 2022. So you can see that, that this effort to construct ties to the historical situation. So, and like I said at the, at the end there, there was deliberate effort to tie the current government policies to the monumental and popular decisions by previous governments to put the resources in the service of the welfare of the people. Uh, I want to feature this quote from somebody who I spoke to. Uh, he's a member of the Political Education Institute of the Morena, the, the ruling party, and he says, we in Morena feel we are the heirs of those struggles. Our heritage is the fight for social rights, for political rights. That's why we connect ourselves to these old struggles. Although they are from the past, although they are still very present because today it is still necessary to defend everything that Cárdenas fought for, what López Mateos fought for, what Pancho Villa and Mariano Zapata and so many other popular leaders fought for. And so I was talking about these conservative strongholds. So like I said, um, despite the fact that the opposition had its own mobilization, they haven't turned it into electoral victories. They continue to be very marginalized in terms of public support. There are states where they will probably still win, uh, but mostly we can say that they are declining in terms of their political power. So again, they, re they retreat into their conservative strongholds. And in this case, we can see at the top there, this headline where the electoral reform was was halted by the courts. The second there is the free trade agreement uh, that Mexico has with the uh, United States and Canada. Uh, you, that's a pretty uh, offensive headline for me. U.S. plans ultimatum. There we go. A U.S. plans ultimatum in Mexico, uh, energy dispute raising threat of tariffs. And this is what uh, Kevin was uh, alluding to in his presentation, this idea that you can use these instruments, these agreements that have been signed by these countries in order to directly interfere and force the country to do the bidding of the transnational companies and of international capital. And then that last one is the one that I'm going to conclude on, which you can see this headline, Mexico takes another step towards authoritarian past. And this is what's going to open up the path to interference from U.S. imperialism. And I, I want to read this first quote from that last uh, headline that I read, where it says, the last thing that AMLO wants to do at the swearing-in ceremony for Mexico's next president is place the presidential sash over the shoulders of an, op over the soldier shoulders of an opposition president-elect, and in doing so, jeopardize the legacy of his so-called fourth transformation and the survival of his pet projects and policies. What does that lead us to think? Well, it kind of sounds like they want to commit fraud, right? It makes it sound like, well, the only way that the Morena is going to stay in power is if they manipulate the vote. It couldn't be further from the truth. Obviously, politics is very fluid. Things can change. But as it stands today, overwhelmingly, it doesn't matter who the candidate is because they haven't chosen the successor yet. Morena wins the next election. And so they're laying this, they're laying the foundation for this undermining of the legitimacy of the next government in Mexico. In order to do what? Well, to apply sanctions, to start to question the legitimacy, question their ability to say we have a mandate to do what we're doing. And like I said, the, this labeling of a, le of a leftist leader is a threat to the country and democracy. It's a, it's a classic strategy. We've been talking about it all day here at the conference, right? And I think there is a danger, right? Is the, by laying this foundation, this is, as someone who, I, I work a lot on Venezuela, this is how it begins. 
right? This is how they start. Now, these days, you read any mainstream coverage of Venezuela, and they talk about 2018 like it was a flat-out fraud, right? But they never justify it. They, but they've managed to install it into the mainstream discourse, and this is what they're trying to do in Mexico. This is why we've seen all of these uh, uh, op-eds and, 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 and opinion pieces talking about the so-called authoritarian regression in Mexico. But obviously, this is also an issue of class struggle, right? His policies are a threat to US and Canadian capital, right? When you nationalize key industries, those industries that are interested in extracting surplus value from those activities feel threatened, and they ask for their state actors to support them, right? This is why we see headlines like that, where the US is threatening uh, ultimatums. Like, who is the US to, to, to give us an ultimatum, right? And so, like I said, it says here, Mexico to act now or else, you know, uh, in terms of, or otherwise we're going to apply tariffs. We're going to collectively punish the Mexican people by making them have to pay more for collective goods, right? USMCA, uh, the, the, the free trade agreement, this is important in that speech that he gave in the Socalo, he mentions this, right? It fills me with great pride to be able to recall today that despite the policy of granting concessions that prevailed before we came into office, we were able to remove a long chapter from the free trade agreement that compromised our oil and put in place a small paragraph, which I'm going to read to you, and you can see it there. The United States and Canada, this is in the free trade agreement. This is something that his negotiators put in. The United States and Canada recognize that Mexico reserves its sovereign right to reform its constitution and domestic legislation, and that Mexico has direct, inalienable, and imprescribable ownership of all hydrocarbons in the subsoil of the national territory. Yeah, I think that deserves a round of applause. But this is how bad it's getting. We're literally seeing now threats of invasion, right? Uh, and they're using the drug war as an excuse, but this wouldn't be happening if it wasn't Lopez Obrador or Marena in power. They're, they're threatening us literally with drone strikes without the authorization of the Mexican government. What is that? It's an act of war. And these absurd ideas have started out as fringe ideas and have become mainstream, certainly in the Republican Party, but also the Democrats have failed to push back on this. Instead of saying, no, we're not going to bomb our major trading partner, they've been saying, we'll take it under consideration. That's an insult. With friends like that, who needs enemies? Okay. And so I just want to end with this, with a one minute, I know I only have a minute left, but I want to end with a one minute clip from Lopez Obrador from the demonstration that day, because the Lopez Obrador in front of a massive crowd is the best Lopez Obrador, you know? <laughs> it's really where you get to see his, uh, his roots as a social leader. And it's subtitled, so don't worry. Le recordamos a esos políticos hipócritas e irresponsables que México es un país independiente y libre. No una colonia ni un protectorado de Estados Unidos. y que podrán amenazarnos con cometer cualquier atropello, pero jamás, jamás permitiremos que violen nuestra soberanía y pisoteen la dignidad de nuestra patria. Cooperación, sí. Sometimiento, no. Intervencionismo, no. Oligarquía, no. Corrupción, no. Clasismo, no. Racismo, no. Libertad, sí. Democracia, sí. Honestidad, sí. Justicia Social, sí. Igualdad, sí. Soberanía. There you have it. One, one final point, and I'll close on this because I know I'm out of time, that there is a struggle that's happening. We're going to need to ramp up our solidarity efforts. Uh, I want people to, I'm involved with the Mexico Solidarity Project. Please get in touch. Please join our newsletter because this is what's coming next. We know that 
there will likely be a deepening of the process, a radicalization of the process, and that's only going to bring more attention, more of our enemy spears towards us. And you can see this quote was also from that same day. I am convinced that we will continue to receive the port of the people to consolidate, and I put that in bold, the first stage of the transformation. There's more stages to come. I ask myself this question. How do you move a political project forward when the political media and economic establishment is largely dead set against you? By turning to the masses, by flexing your capacity to mobilize to your rivals. You know, and this final quote from the person I quoted earlier, I think it's very important that the opposition knows, and I would add imperialism, that there is a population here who is defending a national project that is popular, that is from the left, that is progressive, and is trying to do what's best for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Viva! Viva! Viva. Um, thank you, Jose Luis for your presentation and from bring us these beautiful words from the president of Mexico. Um, now we're going to present Alex Main. Alexander Main is director of the International Policy and Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, DC. His areas of expertise include Latin America, Latin America in integration and regionalism. U.S. security and con contra, contra narcotics policy in Central America, U.S. development assistance to Haiti, and U.S. relation with Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Honduras, and Venezuela. He holds degree in history and political science from the Sorbonne University of Paris. Oh, thank you, Christina. Okay, this thing's working. Um, okay. Um, well, first of all, um, I want to say a big thank you to the organizers of this terrific conference. Um, they worked their asses off, Michelle, Medea, and others, so let's hear it for them. Um, congratulations on pulling it off, and it's great to have a conference like this with, you know, a big diversity of perspectives and covering so many topics. I think it's something that was really missing here in Washington. And, um, so I'm at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, uh, which is um, a think tank here in Washington, D.C. Um, that some of you may know. Uh, you can find our work at CEPR.net. And since I'm at a think tank, I'm going to talk about a wonky topic, uh, the International Monetary Fund, policy from the International Monetary Fund. But I want to start out by saying that this is not such a wonky topic for many people in Latin America, where it has a real effect on people's everyday lives, and often a very painful effect. For instance, when the price of public transport suddenly goes up, or public health care services disappear, or masses of public sector employees are laid off, millions of people across Latin America have taken to the streets to protest IMF-backed structural adjustments in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Brazil, in Venezuela, all over the place. Many of these protests have been violently repressed, such as the Caracaso in Venezuela in 1989, in which thousands of low-income Venezuelans were massacred, or the protests in Ecuador uh, more recently in 2019, when at least seven indigenous protesters were killed and over a thousand were injured. You may wonder, since we're talking about burying the Monroe Doctrine here today, what does IMF policy have to do with the Monroe Doctrine exactly? And as it turns out, a hell of a lot. The US, the US government has enormous control over the policy decisions of the IMF and I would argue has used that control to maintain a neo-colonial grip on economic policy making all over the global south and especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. The IMF was set up shortly after World War II, mostly with the input of the US government, a little bit from the UK government, and it was designed in theory to promote global financial stability by being the world's lender of last resort for countries facing major financial difficulties. So when countries in the global south reach a point where they need, they need more outside cash to keep their economies going and have trouble borrowing that cash from private markets, they often turn to the IMF. 
but they don't do it with much enthusiasm at all. Uh, the IMF imposes conditions on their lending, often including major structural reform that sets countries on very different economic courses than what they started with. And they're often very painful, very harmful economic courses that create a lot of human suffering. So the U.S. is the biggest shareholder at the IMF and basically has veto power over many of its major decisions. And together with a cartel of other wealthy countries, they set policies that make sense for big creditors in wealthy countries, but very little jobs, all sorts of good stuff. In reality, due in large part to U.S. influence in the institution, the IMF has been an aggressive instrument of economic intervention in favor of Wall Street and neoliberal policy. Great for foreign corporations and big investors, but really terrible for ordinary citizens and for long-term development. And the IMF has had a particularly destructive role in, the, in Latin America. Its influence grew enormously in the early 1980s as a result of the Latin American debt crisis, which, by the way, the U.S. played a big role in, but I don't want to digress on that too much. But as a result of that debt crisis, Countries in Latin America ended up turning to the IMF, and the IMF's lending portfolio became really huge. And this happened to coincide with the very moment when there was a global neoliberal offensive in full swing, led by the governments of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And archival research uh, that was recently done has shown that in the early 80s, the Reagan administration heavily intervened in the IMF to expand the scope of its involvement in so sovereign economic policy making in countries. And as a result, in countries where the IMF had lending programs, the IMF began aggressively pushing a very neoliberal agenda, downsizing of the public sector, privatization of public services and en enterprises, cuts to social programs, deregulation, the elimination of capital controls, and very importantly for Latin America, the abandonment of state-led industrial policies aimed at protecting and fostering domestic production. And these industrial policies were prevalent throughout Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s, and then, in large part because of the IMF's influence, they were abandoned. Now, the promise that the IMF makes to um, the peoples of the countries where they're involved in is that if you, may, if you let the markets rule, that will eventually lead to more productive investment in trade relations. It'll create more prosperity for everyone. But this free market trickle-down theory has largely been debunked and perhaps nowhere more than in Latin America where the growth numbers, the economic growth numbers speak for themselves. So you often hear of a lost decade of economic growth in Latin America. And the reality is even uglier than that. As my organization showed in a report we did back in the early 2000s, for the two decades from 1960 to 1979 in Latin America, per capita growth totaled around 80%. Now, if the countries of the region had continued with that growth rate for the next couple of decades, they would be um, among the advanced economies, the wealthy countries today. Instead, from 1980 to 1999, precisely during the era that IMF-backed neoli neoliberalism was dominant, growth in Latin America only reached 11% during those two decades. So during the 1980s, the average yearly per capita growth was negative, negative 0.3%. During the 1990s, it averaged less than 1.5% per year. Fortunately for Latin America, during the early 2000s, when the first pink tide swept the region, almost all of Latin America had weaned itself off of the IMF and countries were able to implement more independent policy agendas and with very strong results. So sectors that had been privatized were renationalized in many cases. Social investment grew enormously. More of the national income of countries was redistributed to the poor. And as a result, tens of millions of people were lifted out of poverty throughout the region. And growth rates also improved. So with the IMF out of the picture, 
things were starting to look much better. But the reason that we're talking about the IMF today is that the IMF is very much back in business in Latin America and in much of the rest of the global south. And this comeback really began during the global financial crisis. And then it became an even bigger comeback during the pandemic when dozens of countries ran out of foreign exchange, out of dollars, with which to address the public health emergency and economic Response to the global economic downturn caused by the pandemic, the IMF did do a couple of positive things. First, it initially provided tens of billions of dollars of emergency financing without all the usual strings attached. So countries weren't, didn't have policy agendas imposed on them by the IMF. But more importantly, due to unprecedented outside pressure from a lot of the world and from the US Congress, from some members of the US Congress, it actually did a really good thing. It, it issued hundreds of billions of dollars of free financial resources known as special drawing rights to all of its 190 member countries. I'll get back to that. But for the most part, the IMF was back to its old tricks. Even at the height of the pandemic, traditional IMF lending programs remained in line with the, us the usual um, neoliberal agenda. And for example, in Ecuador, the government made major layoffs. Um, tens of thousands of public sector workers were laid off in the middle of the pandemic and greatly exacerbated the, the public health catastrophe there. Today, the pandemic isn't even totally behind us and the IMF is systematically calling for austerity, austerity, cuts to public budgets. Countries that haven't even recovered from the pandemic and they're being hammered by escalating food and energy prices are being told to tighten their belts. So something else that really needs to be emphasized about the IMF, and that takes us back again to the Monroe Doctrine, it doesn't treat all countries equally. In fact, the treatment countries get often ally aligns with US policies towards countries. And in many ways, the IMF is really an arm of the US foreign policy machine. So for instance, as I'm sure you're all aware, the US is increasingly engaged in a new Cold War with China. And recent research uh, published by some academics from Boston University has shown that countries with close relations with China, with the closest relations with China, and that have lending agreements with the IMF have faced more invasive economic policy conditions from the IMF. And they've been forced to engage in more austerity. Whereas countries that are closer to the US have had much more lenient conditions from the IMF. And in Latin America and the Caribbean, historically, we've seen the IMF play the same role as the US government. So in Latin America, the Supreme Machine is often described in the United States as the US um, program provided the Cuban government, the US Cuban government, the Dominican Republic, the US nearly $60 billion one year ahead of the presidential election there. And it's clearly designed to help boost democracy ahead of that election. Unfortunately, he completely mismanaged the economy, uh, unfortunately for him, and um, fortunately for the country, he lost to a progressive candidate by Jose Fernandez. But Jose Fernandez ended up with the $60 billion debt to pay back. And that's created enormous constraints on economic policy making in Argentina and has really contributed to the country's current economic crisis. Another important case is Venezuela. In 2002, um, you had a coup against Hugo Chavez that lasted just 48 hours. Well, during that coup, you had the IMF spokesperson who said, we stand ready to assist the new administration in whatever manner they find suitable, which was completely in line with the US throwing its full support behind the coup government of Carmona Estanga. And more recently, the IMF has been supporting the current policy towards Venezuela, effectively sanctioning the country as a result. In 2019, when the US administration created a parallel fictitious government under Juan Guaido, and stopped recognizing the government of Maduro, the IMF abruptly stopped recognizing Maduro as well. That decision had a major impact during the pandemic when first of all, 
Venezuela didn't get any of that emergency financing. It could have, could have gotten $5 billion worth of emergency financing. It was barred from getting that. And more importantly, it didn't get $5 billion worth of these special drawing rights that I mentioned earlier. To this day, the IMF continues to not recognize the Maduro government, and Venezuela is still unable to access its SDRs. So even though both the Maduro government and the Venezuelan opposition have asked for these SDRs to be released, they haven't been released. So by, at this point, you're all asking, what the hell are SDRs? Um, so <laughs> I'll go over that very, very quickly. They are a positive policy from the, the IMF, but we haven't seen much of them. They're issued by the IMF. They are assets that are issued by the IMF at no cost. They don't create debt for countries. There are no conditions attached. Therefore, the U.S. has generally opposed them. Um, but there was a major allocation during uh, the pandemic in 2021. $650 billion worth of these SDRs went to countries and provided an enormous amount of relief, and again, without any strings attached. The world could use another allocation of SDRs right now, but unsurprisingly, the U.S. Treasury doesn't like this idea. They don't like the idea of countries getting resources for free. I've just got a minute. I'll be really quick. And so all of this, I think, is just a reminder of the fundamental flaw with the IMF. It's not a democratic institution. It is U.S. controlled and responds, above all, to the U.S. government and, by extension, to the interests of the U.S. financial sector. So in summary, and I'm going to skip over part of what I was going to say, but if we really want to help bury the Monroe Doctrine, then we need to take on the IMF. We need to hold it to account done and is continuing to do in Latin America, and we need to support the development of an alternative financial architecture. So we can work with progressive members of Congress to hold the IMF accountable for its deadly austerity policy. We can push for more of the one good policy at the IMF, which is SDRs, which is something that progressive leaders in Congress are already doing. There's a coalition of groups working on this issue. If you're interested, please connect with me. Um, and then here in the U.S., we need to build awareness and support for the efforts of progressive governments to consolidate Latin American independence. Right now, just last week, as a matter of fact, the leaders of Brazil and Argentina um, called on the other progressive leaders of South America to help them relaunch UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations, to build closer political and economic cooperation between the countries of the South American continent. And they are dusting off an old project of, from the early 2000s of a Bank of the South um, and a common unit of exchange for South America. They are trying to create an alternative financial architecture to counter the influence of the IMF. So we need to support these efforts. We need to show solidarity with these efforts. And we need to stop the US from interfering to prevent these efforts from taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And now we're going to present you Nick Stiff. He's a PhD. He is from the, he's a citizen of the Lower True Tribe. He is, an, he is an assistant professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University, at the University of Minnesota. In, for, in 2014, he co-founded the Red Nation, an indigenous resistance organization. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, was the American Democracy Fellow of the Charles Warren Center for Studies in the American History at Harvard University. Yes, you have the word. I'm a Takiapi. Um, my name is Nick, and I'm from I'm Kulichasha from the Lower Burl Sioux Tribe. And today, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the political economy of U.S. settler colonialism and imperialism as it relates to the Monroe Doctrine and the so-called Doctrine of Discovery, as well as the present moment and the energy wars that are taking place in Latin America, in uh, in Europe. Uh, as well as here in North America. And lastly, I want to talk about alternatives and what burying the Monroe Doctrine 
uh, after 200 years uh, is, is opening up in the possibilities uh, for not just this hemisphere, but for the rest of humanity. So I want to begin with the doctrine of discovery. Uh, in 1823, there was a Supreme Court decision uh, that was determining whether or not the Cherokee Nation, which was targeted for, for removal in the state of Georgia, uh, had rights or had standing within the United States. Chief Justice John Marshall cited 15th century uh, papal, uh, 15th century papal bull, uh, which is you know kind of commonly known as the doctrine of discovery, as the 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 governing principle by which the United States asserts its ownership of this land. Meaning that you know the United States is not a Protestant nation by any means, but it inherits the Catholic right of discovery from the Pope himself. Uh, as, a, as a way to uh, enact ownership of the land and to dispossess indigenous people. And within this, this decision, uh, John Marshall wrote, the Indian nations had always been considered as distinct ind independent political communities retaining their original natural rights as the undisputed possessors of the soil from time immemorial, but they were, quote, the weaker power, thus surrendering their independence to a more powerful nation. And out of this Supreme Court decision came other Supreme Court decisions that went on to define indigenous nations within the United States as so-called domestic dependent nations. And the relationship is one of, to quote Marshall again, a state of pupillage uh, or as a ward to his guardian. So this happened the same year that uh, James Monroe went forward and made his famous speech that became known as the Monroe Doctrine. Um, this Monroe Doctrine actually descends or traces its origin to the original debates uh, when the founding, you know, with the founding of the Constitution in 1887. It was Alexander Hamilton who pushed uh, for what he was calling a fiscal military state to levy taxes on the new citizens of the United States to raise a standing army and to create a centralized military system to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, attack from two dual threats, one of which was named uh, in the Declaration of Independence as the 23rd Grievance against the King, and that was the so-called merciless Indian savages on the Western frontier, and the second was competing European powers, such as France, Britain, and Spain. So to kind of fast forward a little bit, um, the other founding father, Thomas Jefferson, created a system of treaty making that would he, what he called binding the indigenous nations to uh, the United States. And this was part of his broader vision of what he called the um, empire of liberty, right? Which would start from the, the North Pole and go all the way to the South Pole, where America was the center, you know, the central sort of project, the, the political, cultural, and racial project of the Western Hemisphere. And what he meant by binding indigenous nations to the United States was essentially if they signed a treaty with the US, they could not go and sign a treaty with another European power. Um, so this policy of what we know as Indian policy or domestic policy is intrinsically tied to the United States foreign policy and how it's beginning its, its first relations, international relations with what they saw as independent nations, as indigenous people, and then you know, you, you know, newly independent states in Latin America. So fast forward to 1893. The United States was on the verge of war with Spain to expand its overseas colony. It was the same decade that the US Census Division had declared the Western frontier officially closed. Uh, and at, at a time when the American Indian population was believed to have reached its lowest point in known history, decimated by more than a century of genocidal war, famine, and disease. Um, and in 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner, who's an American historian, uh, famously known for you know, developing the so-called frontier thesis, said that he found the germ of the Monroe Doctrine and the genocidal wars waged against indigenous peoples in the Ohio Valley. Meaning that those lands initially, initially desired by the United States were the same lands that the colonists cited when they were declaring independence from the British Crown, saying that the British Crown had prevented them from expanding their institutions of chattel slavery, of expropriation into the Ohio River Valley. 
Um, but this, you know, the violent westward drive from the Ohio Valley to the coast of California, Turner, Turner argued, was the start of the definite independence of the United States from the state system of the old world, the beginning, in fact, of its, its career as a world power. And it was also this year that in 1893 that uh, the United States overthrew the Hawaiian Kingdom in the Pacific. And in fact, the grandfather of uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, who was known as Grand Foster, or Grandfather Foster, um, was the first Secretary of State to participate in the overthrow of a foreign government. And in this case, it was an indigenous government. And he, he, he said, the native inhabitants had proved themselves incapable of maintaining a respectable and responsible government and lacked the energy or will to improve the advantages with provident, or which providence had given them. Grandfather Foster went on to mentor his two grandchildren who became one, the founder of the CIA, right? John Foster, or uh, Alan Dulles, and then a uh, former, you know, a, a subsequent Secretary of State, uh, John Foster Dulles. These two individuals uh, engineering their own coups in Latin America and throughout the world, but taking inspiration from their grandfather, who was the first Secretary of State to overthrow a foreign government. And so I want to, I want to take that, those principles and thinking about how the United States has structured its relationship both internally to indigenous nations, as well ex externally to the Western Hemisphere. And I want to look at two policies. The first is uh, the Obama era policy known as American Energy Independence. And under this program, Obama increased domestic oil supply or oil production by 80%, specifically targeting indigenous lands or federal, federal lands itself. Um, this was largely due to what is known as the fracking boom right, the, the, the new technology in fracking. But also it coincided with um, a, a, uh, a broader sort of drop in price of oil as, some, as uh, the economist this morning mentioned earlier. I'm not an economist, by the way, um, I, but I'm on an economy panel. <laughs> um, but I want to say that there, is, there was a direct link between the ongoing in Be uh, Venezuela crisis and oil production in North America. When global oil prices began to fall, there was a subsequent North American oil boom, both in Canada and in the United States. And in the United States, they were developing the tar sands in uh, Alberta. So they also began to target and to, they also began to target and to uh, isolate the Bolivarian government of Venezuela, who was using the money from its own oil production for the benefit of its, of its own citizens, its own, you know, its own uh, countrymen. Well, at the same time, you know, this oil boom that happened in North America began to wreak havoc on indigenous nations with the creations of new oil pipelines, the tar sand dead zones in Alberta, the fracking rigs and refineries, locking these North American economies into a drill and drill mentality at the expense of indigenous lands and lives. This boom also weaned the United States off of its oil imports uh, from, uh, you know, countries like Venezuela as well. Um, and it was, you know, it was during the, tr or during the Obama administration, during the Dakota Access Pipeline struggles that there was a protester who was interviewed in, on Democracy Now! running to the pipeline uh, front lines. And she said that the reason why they're building the, the Dakota Access Pipeline is because they're sanctioning the oil in Venezuela because it has the largest oil reserves in the world. So indigenous people on the ground were not confused that this was not just a domestic pipeline struggle but it was a power, it was a geopolitical struggle between the United States and the alternatives that were being created and fought for in Latin America. So both Canada and the United States drilled their economies out of the gutter following the financial collapse uh, in the, from 2008 to 2011. Meanwhile, Venezuelans voted in of the Bolivarian Revolution into power, which in turn increased the participation in social, economic, and political life of indigenous peoples whose rights were codified in the, new, uh, the newly minted Venezuelan um, uh, constitution, as well as women, LGBTQ people, black folks, and poor people. The nation's oil wealth was, in a sense, redistributed to the lowest sectors of society. And this also, this oil wealth was also redistributed to North American indigenous nations. 
And in fact, my first uh, entry into uh, Venezuelan politics or understanding the Bolivarian Revolution was when Sitgo um, had gave my tribe heating assistance during the cold winter months. And I remember this because my dad called me and he said, son, they're filling up the propane tank. I told them to stop. I don't want to pay the bill. And so, <laughs> so we, uh, we called and I, I found out that this was a, um, you know, solidar an act of solidarity on behalf of the Venezuelan government. And it, it meant a lot to me because during those winter months, they jack up oil prices. They artificially increase or inflate oil prices, as well as the local uh, utility commissions. They pop off electric um, meters in the middle of winter on the reservation. And to give you an idea of how devastating that is, Buffalo County, which is across the river from our reservation, which is the Crow Creek Nation, the Crow Creek uh, Sioux Reservation, is one of the poorest counties in the United States. And they were popping off electric meters in the middle of winter. There was no national coverage of this whatsoever. So that single act of solidarity resonated within our communities and I made it a point that if I ever traveled to Venezuela, I was going to thank um, Hugo Chavez, but unfortunately he had passed away. So I, I thanked his predecessor, Nicolas Maduro, who is the same height as me, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I thanked him on behalf of my family and my community, as well as our nations, for being there when the United States, the most powerful, richest nation in the world, lets its original people go without heat or choose, have to choose between food and heat during cold winter months. So skipping ahead, I want to talk a little bit about, of course, we, we know what Trump did under his uh, unleashing Amer American energy independence and the ramping up of the development of o oil and gas production in the United States and Canada and, and pushing through pipeline after pipeline. Um, but also, I want to talk about the success of the resistance. And the success of the resistance within North America is that the indigenous-led movements, whether it was from Standing Rock to Line 3 to even the, the North Slope of Alaska, those indigenous-led movements were challenging 27% of greenhouse gas emissions from both Canada and the United States, which is huge. So as they were challenging these greenhouse gas emissions uh, during these decade-long you know, struggles against carbon infrastructure, carbon extraction, you know, the Willow Project just recently went through because Biden, Biden said that it was, it was to offset the price of uh, oil and heating in Europe uh, because of a war that he's backing in Ukraine, right? So we can even see the proxy war in Ukraine that the US is backing is also fueling uh, dirty, car dirty carbon projects here in the United States that are affecting indigenous lands. But also the Biden administration has committed to green energy. And that's where we, that's where we, we have to take a critical look. While we all want a sustainable transition, it can't be the, at the expense of indigenous people. The, we can see that the lithium mines that are being developed at Thacker Pass in Nevada or at the um, at Oak Flat in, uh, in Arizona come at the expense of indigenous people. Copper is essential for the transition for creating um, you know, green renewable batteries and electrical systems. Of course, lithium is for uh, batteries themselves. But this so-called green energy revolution uh, is also looking to the south and looking to push out countries like China who have invested into uh, Latin America to help these nations develop their own you know, path to resource nationalism. And in this case, it's a you know, green resource nationalism. And in the case of you know, certain countries, negotiating what those contracts mean for indigenous people and development to offset the most deleterious aspects. Whereas the, whereas the Biden administration isn't negotiating whatsoever with indigenous nations. So even though the Pope has repudiated the doctrine of discovery, in action, the United States is still practicing it, right? So even though John Kerry repudiated the Monroe Doctrine, the series of sanctions that followed in the Obama administration, the Trump administration, attempted to strangle and to choke out the, the alternatives that were rising against neoliberalism in places like Cuba, in places like Venezuela, but also the plurinational governments of places like Bolivia and the overthrow 
of Evo Morales. And so as indigenous people in the United States, we, our policy, our policy for green energy is fundamentally anti-imperialist, has to be fundamentally anti-imperialist, and it cannot come at our expense, nor at the expense of our relatives. So as we bury the doctrine of discovery, let's bury the doctrine, or the Monroe Doctrine as well. Okay. Um, thank you very much to the panelists. And they led us with a very good analysis and resources to continue to fight against all this injustice. As I mentioned at the beginning, in Colombia, the, the, all these politics that we are talking about here cause a lot of problems, especially to the peasants, the indigenous, and the Afro-Colombians. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for the panelists. So we're going to take uh, a break. We're going to have. We're going to continue at four o'clock. Just remember, we're going to take a, a short break and to come back into the auditorium at four o'clock. And over there, on, uh, towards my left, we have an idea a collection board. If you folks want to write, and uh, there's this beautiful art right here to check out. Wow, it's coming out well. Right. Who's ready to bury the Monroe Doctrine? Yes. Also, you've probably seen the beautiful Cuban art exhibit that's there. They are also for sale. We just sold one.
causes of immigration. Is everybody excited? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Is everybody ready to grab a shovel to bury the Monroe Doctrine? There we go. All right. Thank you, Yamir, for the excellent job. So, um, in a way, I am really happy that we are the last panel because it's going to be an opportunity to reflect back on many of the things that were said in uh, the previous panels. It would be an opportunity to try to round up some ideas. And uh, right now we're going to hear from Yesenia and, and Carla and then Gustavo, three amazing leaders, which I'll be describing their amazing work in a minute. But we're very honored and happy to have them. And um, before they speak, I just want to say, just like we heard today, sanctions, fake free, free trade agreement, and all the other mechanisms that the US have established to keep Latin America against the wall are purposely planned, and they know the consequences that all of these actions have. The same happens with migration. It's been proven by academics from the US and across the world that forced migration across Latin America it's mostly a consequence of neoliberalism. When the United States tried to redesign the market economy of the region, they knew and they projected, it's, it's been documented, that there was going to be human displacement. They knew that the markets will scatter around the region and as a consequence, people will move across the region. As the previous panel mentioned, one of the parts of, of the free trade agreement with Mexico was to stop subsidizing uh, agricultural industries in Mexico, not in the US. So they always knew that campesinos and indigenous folks will be forced to the, the, uh, move out of their communities. So migration is another form of displacement, another form of sanction, another form of fake promise of economic progress. But, but it's one of the most harshest and the consequences of this bad planning are one of the harshest, saddest, and most terrible consequences that our region has played as a consequence of the Monroe doctrine. And I'm just going to close by saying um, we've learned today that it is proven that the Monroe Doctrine has failed over and over and over again, but not for the US. It has not failed for the purpose of the US. So it is not going to stop just because we proved them wrong, but we cause, because we uh, break free in Latin America, because we stop cooperating, collaborating with this policies of death, as they were mentioned. And, and uh, we'll, we'll say it at the end, but when our countries break free from the Monroe Doctrine, that day the US will be on its own and will be forced to reflect and, and, and ask for help to, to the countries in the region because the main reason why the Monroe Doctrine is in place is because the US needs our labor, our resources, our land, and by itself, it's not the same country that is right now. Let's please let me welcome um, Yesenia, Yesenia Portillo, please. Give us a big round of applause, please. Let me just read a little bit about her very quickly. Yesenia is the program director at CISPES, the committee's, uh, the committee's solidarity with the people of El Salvador. In her role, Yesenia has supported coalition building and strategic campaigns 
to raise awareness and push back against the most harmful impact of US policy in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. In 2022, she helped uh, lead a delegation of progressive members of Congress to Central America to learn from grassroots groups about the consequences of the mil militarized and corporate-driven solutions that drive U.S. policy in the region, including through the Biden-Harris plan for Central America. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Um, so I have some slides. Yay. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's really an honor to be here, especially with Carla um, and Gustavo. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Biden-Harris um, camp uh, program to supposedly address the root causes of migration first. Um, so the Biden-Harris campaign platform on immigration included um, a focus on addressing the root causes of migration from Central America, particularly from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, which was echoed in the U.S. Citizenship Act proposed by Democrats in February 2021, shortly after Biden took office. After the proposed legislation sweeping pro-immigrant elements were watered down and mostly died in Congress, the elements related to addressing the root causes of migration made up the White House's U.S. strategy for addressing the root causes of migration announced and published in July 2021. This policy framework has seen more than $1 billion in development aid from the U.S. State Department via USAID and other programs and the creation of the 501c3 Partnership for Central America with over $4 billion committed from the private sector. The next slide. Um, a couple of years prior, as yet another mass migration crisis moment hit U.S. mainstream media headlines in the form of caravans of people banding together in numbers larger than ever to migrate, migrate through Guatemala and Mexico, I noticed a shift in the way the mainstream media was talking about migration from the region. At first, it seemed like finally an acknowledgement of the role that the U.S. has played in the conditions that continue to lead to mass forced displacement. A closer look makes it clear, however, that these conversations fall short. Um, in the bottom right uh, is a, a, a screen grab, I guess, of a five-minute clip from Samantha Bee's full frontal segment, which aired in June of 2019. She focuses on El Salvador and describes the billions that the U.S. spent there in the 80s to fight communism. She even talks about the major role that tough-on-crime policies of the 90s in Los Angeles and Bill Clinton's immigration reform played in the birth and expansion of MS-13, the transnational gang that became the major scapegoat against migrants under Trump. In the end, however, Samantha Bee's segment made it seem as though Salvadorans are only migrating because of gangs, mentioning nothing about um, more contemporary U.S. police and military security financing in the region or the impacts of current U.S. economic policies towards El Salvador. I find it interesting also that even though at the time a large portion of the migrants in these caravans were actually fleeing Honduras, the focus of the segment was El Salvador in the 80s, rather than the ongoing political support for the coup government and narco dictatorship in Honduras that continued on from when President Obama and Vice President Biden uh, were in office. The other image is from a 10 minute MSNBC segment where the speakers react to a press conference um, held by Vice President Harris in Mexico City after receiving major backlash for telling migrants in Guatemala do not come. In the press conference, the Vice President explains some of the work she's been doing within the framework of the U.S. strategy for Central America. During the segment, host Joanne Reed does a really important job of acknowledging the long history of U.S. profit-driven destabilization in Central America and its deep impacts mentioning the United Fruit Company and the U.S.-backed coup against Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, for example. While an acknowledgment of the history of, exploited, of the exploitative nature of the U.S. relationship towards Central America is necessary, I'm sad to report that the analysis in this segment also assumes that this relationship is in the past. After several minutes dedicated to explaining how, quote, the United States used much of Central America as essentially a giant plantation, the speakers ultimately go on to say that the U.S. needs to now fix the economy, the instability, and the corruption there, applauding vice, the vice president for her efforts 
And remember, this is just a day after the scandal surrounding her do not come um, warning to migrants. Congressman Espiot says in the interview, I think we have to d uh, take a deep dive to find the root causes. Here, uh, her going there is taking the first step, take a deep dive and find out what must be done to build public-private partnerships. Maria Hinojosa says, I'm very happy to hear that there is going to be such an extraordinary investment. And Joy Ann Reed, despite her acknowledgement that the quote, um, that quote, the deep corruption in the region is in part um, because of our policies, closes by app applauding the anti-corruption elements of the plan. Ultimately, what is happening here is a co-signing of the current White House strategy um, and a discussion of it that assumes there's something novel about it. Today, US foreign policy towards the so-called Northern Triangle is increasingly discussed as a necessary part of the plan. Oh, sorry, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, for curbing migration, uh, what we've been hearing from Democrats is that in order to address the issues of massive flow of migrants to the US, uh, to the US's uh, southern border, the US must solve the root causes of why people are fleeing. This is an appropriation of the demands coming from popular social movements in the region and grassroots solidarity organizations in the US, which have for decades denounced the destabilizing role of US intervention. So if you look at the plan, it identifies these things as the major root causes of migration from the region, corruption, violence, trafficking, and poverty. And then if we can go to the next slide. Um, so let's look at the strategy for addressing poverty with some highlights here. Um, promoting, promote investment enabling reforms, address structural impediments to investment and facilitate greater private sector par um, participation, partner with the private sector, partner with international financial institutions and multinational, multilateral development banks. So does this look like something novel to us? <laughs> okay, so next slide. Um, how much time? skip this one. Um, well, anyway, so it's within this framework. Ooh. Okay, it's within this framework that the Vice President makes her call to action to the private sector to deepen investment in Central America and an NGO made up of the uh, top leadership of corporations like Nestle or Nescafe rather, Microsoft, Pepsi, and MasterCard is created. It's described as a coalition of private sector organizations driving practical solutions to advance economic opportunity address urgent climate, education, and health challenges, and promote long-term investment in Central America. Next slide. Um, the strategy for addressing violence and trafficking can be summed up with these highlights. Professionalized security forces, improve civilian policing, counter-organized crime, increase capacity of law enforcement, and other security forces. And now also, it's important that while the strategy claims to be aimed at addressing uh, the root causes of poverty and violence, or the root causes such as poverty and violence, it's also explicitly talked about as necessary for curbing China's economic influence. Uh, next slide. Um, so the next few slides is a timeline of US foreign policy towards Central America since the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, it is informed heavily by Aviva Chomsky's excellent article, The Root Causes of Migration from Central America, the US. Uh, the first slide is a little more reflective of the nature of the article and that it does it doesn't just look at the policy frameworks towards the region, but also the way they were implemented. Starting here with the Monroe Doctrine in, 19, in 1823, reinforced in 1905 by the Roosevelt Co Corollary. Next slide. Um, for the next couple of slides, I included just the policy frameworks and the names of where they came from. The Alliance for Progress under Kennedy, which Francesca ta mentioned, uh, the Santa Fe docs and Christinger reports that informed Reagan era policy and really post Reagan era policy. Um, and I'm really going to plug Aviva Chomsky, the Aviva Chomsky article here again because she provides crucial insight on the impacts of these policies and hint they led to worker disenfranchisement and increased mass displacement. Uh, and she also provides some insight as to how the workers and negatively impacted communities of Central America responded. And so the next slide. Um, taking us into the 2000s, we have CAFTA uh, and billions of dollars of military and security financing through the Merida Initiative, the Central American Regional Security Initiative, or CARSI, and I think Plan Frontera Sur should go here as well. All policies to promote a favorable climate for the private sector and to secure police and military control over the region for border enforcement and to supposedly combat organized crime. The Obama era also heavily promotes private public partnerships, 
and the Alliance for Prosperity in included hundreds of millions of dollars for international narcotics and law enforcement. This policy was also supposedly in response to what's known as the child migrant crisis and claimed to be the answer to addressing the reasons why people continue to flee the region. The Biden-Harris strategy operates under similar frameworks and promotes similar solutions. Uh, and again, I'll close this by naming that a root cause analysis is something that comes from the radical left and it's being co-opted in order to justify policies that are a mere continuation of foreign policy frameworks towards the region that are at least two centuries old now if we start with the Monroe Doctrine. Thank you. And the next slide. Um, of course, we know that resistance to the U.S. economic model is long-standing in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, while U.S. development aid is based on a logic that is that it will supposedly improve things like uh, systems of healthcare, education, electricity, and water in Central America. We know that what it actually promotes first and foremost are privatization schemes, um, bringing in private corporations to run these essential human goods and services under the logic that corporate management will make them more efficient, or that exploitative industries like mining corporations will create more jobs. But we know that corporations increase their prof profits by any means necessary, to the detriment of consumers, workers, and the environment. In El Salvador in the 1990s, in the decade following the signing of the 1992 peace accords, over 30 state institutions were privatized, including national banks, electricity, and telecommunications. In the early 2000s, Salvadorans organized mass resistance against the Central American Free Trade Agreement and against efforts to privatize the healthcare system there knowing full well the negative impacts that these policies had in the previous decade. Two historic struggles that I, I have had the opportunity to learn about through my work with CISPES are the fights against water privatization and against metallic mining in El Salvador, which, are, which, is, also, uh, which is also ultimately a water defense issue. In 2010, I participated in the Radical Roots delegation, which was CISPES's first delegation to El Salvador for the Salvadoran diaspora. Uh, at the time, El Salvador was being sued under CAFTA after communities successfully organized to pressure the Salvadoran government to temporarily halt mining, a struggle that led to a historic victory in 2017 when it became the first and only country in the world to ban metallic mining. <laughs> um, in 2018, mass protests in El Salvador to push back against emboldened right-wing efforts to pass a national water privatizing law um, I, yeah, through, so um, when that was happening, I learned more about that history, including that in 2007, the right-wing government of Antonio Saca was promoting a water privatization plan using the language of decentralization, was, which was a concerted effort by the Inter-American Development Bank, providing loans to the government for the promotion of private sector pri um, participation using specialized consultants to give support and financial advice to the government towards the effective organization of PS, uh, private sector participation schemes. Water defense activists mobilizing against SACA's water privatization were the first to be arrested under the 2007 anti-terrorism law, which shouldn't come as a, as a surprise since it's the same tactics used in all territories with major U.S. influence and increasingly within U.S. colonial borders as well. A little over a year ago, CISPES had the opportunity to work with other anti-imperialist international solidarity groups like Witness for Peace, folks from the Honduras Solidarity Network, School of the Americas Watch, and the Network in Solidarity with Guatemala to coordinate a, de de a delegation to Guatemala and Honduras, where I witnessed um, and learned oh, with progressive congressional representatives, did I say that? Um, <laughs> where I witnessed and learned about resistance to several different mining projects, many that received financing from the Inter-American Development Bank or the World Bank, uh, or that depend heavily on the corruption of the Juan Orlando Hernandez government, um, that for example, in, Wapim in Wapinol, uh, um, gave land concessions in uh, national reserves, illegally, to some of the richest men for open air mining. Um, this, uh, uh, under a government that despite the U.S. government's stated concerns over corruption, received unconditional political support and military and police financing. Some of the most devastating moments of the delegation were meeting with communities in resistance who had experienced deadly police attacks 
while putting their lives on the line to defend their rivers, and a mother in Shinka territory that detailed her sadness and fear of her children making the decision to migrate because the Escobar mine had made life unlivable for them and not knowing um, ooh, if her children would survive the journey. Um, okay. So I'm gonna spend the last, I told you one minute, um, <laughs> I have to discuss the uh, fascistic and dictatorial government of Nayib Bukele in El Salvador. Most known to many, oh, we can change to the next slide. Um, most known to many uh, for making El Salvador the first country to make Bitcoin a legal tender, a policy that, like everything else about the government, was nothing more but a major publicity stunt and a mechanism for corruption. Most recently, known for his war on gangs, which, was, which has suspended some of the most basic constitutional protections of all Salvadorans and has led to the arrest of over 70,000 people in just a little over a year. And mainstream headlines claim that Bukele has eliminated gangs in El Salvador. But behind the spectacle of Bukele's mega prison lies mass human rights atrocities and a systemic attack against his opposition, particularly against the left and against organized communities in El Salvador. El Salvador's prisons are 300% over capacity and tens of thousands of people from El Salvador's most marginalized communities have been arbitrarily arrested and held in months on end of pretrial detention in torturous and deadly conditions, with hundreds already dead as a result of their imprisonment, many with signs of violent death and reports of mass torture. The Bukele administration rose to power by co-opting the frustration that Salvadorans felt from the negative consequences of the neoliberal economic model. Um, we cannot understand Bukele's rise to power in El Salvador without the longer context of U.S. military and security financing. Um, while Samantha B. mentioned how MS-13 was birthed, she did not discuss the U.S. role in maintaining those conditions, even through the present day, with billions of dollars for police and military training that limited the response um, to gangs, to punitive policing, a tactic Bukele is using in its most extreme form. While doing business with organized crime and arresting union leaders, vocal opponents, and I have to mention our comrades from the historic community of Santa Marta, who led that struggle that secured El Salvador's anti-mining ban, which Bukele intends to reverse and are now under arrest. Um, in pretrial, in an automatic six month pretrial detention in deadly conditions. Um, the silence of the US Embassy and, and the State Department, along with ongoing military and security financing, under the excuse of the war on drugs and border enforcement, exposes the hypocrisy of US foreign policy that is supposedly based on fighting corruption, defending human rights, and spreading democracy. And so I'll just close by saying. You know, Bukele has um, a, a large, an extremely large publicity apparatus, um, and a lot of people, even on the left, gave him a lot of um, benefit of the doubt. Um, but he's clearly promoting the in interests of the global elite via police and military repression. Um, and I welcome everyone to join CISPES and the um, Salvadoran organized communities um, in denouncing what's happening there and in denouncing U.S. complicity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yesenia. <clears throat> very informative and uh, moving presentation that reminds us that what's happening at the border, Mexico-U.S. border, it's not an spontaneous crisis. It's provoked, made, and planned by the United States with the complicity of corrupt governments across our countries. And it takes us to change that. Uh, since NAFTA was signed in the case of Mexico, over three million people have crossed the border from Mexico and the US. And if we add 
Central America could be up to five million people. And if we add folks that are coming from Haiti and South America and, and from uh, Africa and other continents through Mexico these days, it's more than that. It's millions of people who have been displaced as a consequence of these policies that Yesenia just presented. And to continue this reflection, I want to welcome uh, our sister, Carla Garcia. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Carla Garcia is the International Relations Coordinator at OFRANE. She came to the United States in 2013 and works with the Garifuna communities in New York. She has a history of activism and participation in civic action for over 20 years and serves as representative of culture at the national and international level of the Ballet Nacional Folklorico Garifuna. Y so she's also the co-facilitator for the Afro-Descendant Platform that came out of the Peace Summit. Welcome, warrior and leader, Carla Garcia. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you for letting me explain to you our vision as Garifuna community about immigration. I'm going to use Spanglish. That's why I have her here with me. She's going to help me, give me assistance in moments because my English is uh, very fundamental, very limited to. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, this part is practice. You don't pay attention of, of this part. Uh, <laughs> so let me start um, with a reflection. I want to call my ancestors and our ancestors to occupy this space and make us uh, feel their energy and listen to them what they really want from us in the earth not only in our countries or in the United States. Um, people hear witnesses what happened this morning. And we need to understand that everything is based in energy. And the pain, the hardness, the forgiveness, the war, the blood also can control energies and manifest in front of us, even if we don't understand that this is some energy coming through our eyes to make us maybe think more about what is happening. I have a double with. Uh, our ancestors, the ancestors of the world, do you believe that it's a good idea go to Egypt, Egypt, right? To remove bodies from people who live 300, 500, 5,000 years ago. Or it's a good idea go to Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras and profound the cemeteries. And uh, what will happen in 5,000 years? They will come to our bodies, for our bodies. Believe in that. And if everything is energy, for example, the slavery that we are trying to talk about slavery, like something that happened, but it doesn't happen to us. Saying this because I know I just have 15 minutes. Hmm. Uh, I wanna leave. I wanna leave this question in the air. If somebody comes to you with a problem to be solved in a language that you don't understand, with rules that are not your rules. How are you going to do to solve that problem? I can tell about the indigenous and black communities in St. Vincent in the 1600s when the 
colonizers, the people who discover America, came to the islands. And they saw these people looking maybe different, but people, and they tell them, you can live there. But these people said that they discover and they become the owners of the land. We can say in the way that we learn in the universities at school or in this new era that the indigenous community owned the land, owned the spaces, were the owners, right? But in our cosmovision, we don't own anything. Everything is to be shared with others. This is the nonsense that we found in the, the history of every community, the history of every poor population. I want to talk about what happened and what I know happened with the Garifuna community in 2013 when they started to come to the United States in big groups. Nobody called them at that time. Um, nobody said that it was a caravan. But it is the moment when everything started. People went in our communities in Honduras waiting for mothers and child and young people going to the school or coming out from school, going back home, and tell them, told them, you can come to the United States. Right now there's a law that if you, as a mother, have a child and you um, enroll your child at school, the Obama law will protect you. Come to the United States. And this is the way that it happened. In San Pedro Sula, there were a lot of people with money to um, borrow, to loan them the money that they will need to come to the, the border. Nothing happened to those group of immigrants in the, in, the, in the way coming to the United States. Nothing. No matters. No nothing appearing in front of them to maybe cut the, 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 the dream. As soon as they arrived with the coyotes to the, to the south border, they didn't come into the United States without a permission because the border, the police border, went to them, took them, and put it inside of the United States. By that time, a lot of um, young people who already graduate from um, the legal uh, field didn't have jobs. Oh, people is coming through the border. This is the good moment to give jobs to this new generation of lawyers. At the same time, the housing, the court, the immigration court was having less and less and less cases. A big opportunity to fill back the court and to give job to more people to occupy those uh, positions. There was a project in where our women, the women of the Garifuna community were pushed to accept voluntary signing documentation in English, saying that they were signing voluntary, voluntarily to be part of the um, GPS monitoring process. And when they arrived, for example, to New York, three or, or four days, oh, because if they did not accept this voluntary project, they were 
supposed to continue in a jail in the border. So the way to go out and meet their families, it was signing this voluntary documentation. So five days later, um, an appointment in the court. They saw the judge, and the judge sent them downstairs at the Federal Plaza building to get the ankle brace, the ankle monitor. And this company that is private and still private was using the Federal Plaza building to put those ankle brace in the, in the people to know and monitor what is the bad consequence in each person getting an ankle brace. Now the ankle brace is a big business after the, the test in the Garifuna community and the Garifuna women. So why I'm telling this part to you? Because we know and we knew and we tell the community they are removing the people from our communities because they want to own our land. But at the same time, these people must produce because they don't know, they don't speak English. They will not have a document, legal documentation. They will not start working immediately. So they were producing for this country. And the, at the moment that they arrived to the border, they started to produce, giving jobs to other people in this country. And nobody is recognizing that. But at the same time, our communities in where Ofrane is fighting to continue holding and having the land started to um, have less people, especially women in the reproductive um, state, childs, and young people. If you move your next generation to another country with a, with, to learn a different culture, you will not have enough to, to hold the land to continue having the, uh, the fight. And this is what is happening right now in Honduras. The communities are trying to resist all these projects but there's not enough young people to fight for their land. What is happening here? Why they don't go back? Because they still like in a migratory limbo. They go to the court, they just see that they still here and they are in good shape and the, the judge gave to them a letter to return in two or five years. Uh, consent to get a, per, a permission to work, and that's it. Not legal documentation, no nothing, so they cannot go back to Honduras, but they don't have a legal status here. And it's happening since 2013. So why they did this? Do you remember the North Triangle project involving Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. The second big caravan of migration came from the indigenous community of Guatemala, and the third one from El Salvador. Oh, wow. That's a coincidence, right? This is, is exactly what all this day I listen people discussing, how intentionally they are harming us they are harming our communities and displacing us to get the resources, the land, et cetera, et cetera. What is the problem right now? Honduras have a new president, Ms. Omar Castro. But Honduran doesn't have a state. And uh, right now, there's a big movement to remove Xiomara Castro Zelaya from the presidency. In United States who support Juan Orlando Hernandez for 13 years, 
because he was twice president, but he was support before from the United States, was making the job to have the country in the moment that we have now. My concern, because I, I know I have just two minutes, and there's a lot of things that we can say about this. My concern is we're still trying to solve a problem in a different language. Because the Garifuna community, as the indigenous community, is never going to see other person as, as something different or something material that we can, from we can get any um, benefit. Thank you. We're going to see other people as people, as us. So we're still involved in a problem that we don't know how to solve. That's why we need the people who live in the United States, who born in the United States, who understand United States to help solve that part of the problem. We're going to continue fighting for our life, fighting for our communities. <laughs> but we need you as part of our community, not as, a, as part of the United States community, as part of the world community to fight together. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. We heard from Jesenia first how the government of the United States uh, publicly presents a project. Then we heard from Carla what in the reality it's happening. What is the other plan? What's the other alliance for prosperity, right? Which is intentionally pushing people out of their communities, taking their resources while forcing them to work in a legal limbo in the United States. Let's welcome our last panelist. Please, a uh, warm applause for Gustavo Torres, please. <laughs> Gustavo Torres, <clears throat> executive director at CASA, the largest Latino and immigrant organization in the Mid-Atlantic. Gustavo came to the US due to the political and economic unrest in his country of origin, Colombia. He joined CASA staff as a community organizer and became the executive director in 1994. And under his leadership, CASA has grown from a small service organization to, uh, to an organization of uh, staff nearly of 150 people and a membership over 97. Uh, thousand people which operates in multiple states. It's an honor to have you here with us, Gustavo. Uh, thank you. You have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, <laughs> why? Okay, let me see if I can summarize. Let me stand and yes. Buenas tardes. And thank you very much. I just want to uh, share with you our vision and to see if we can, because what I understand that we are here is to try to find the best potential U.S. policy for Latin America. So what I'm going to share with you today is to some ideas that we have, to brainstorm with you, and we need you to be able to make sure that we are going to accomplish that. First of all, I want to invite all of you, May 1st, International Worker Day, we are going to have a rally in support of the immigrant community in front of the White House. Please, please join us. Please join us at noon. It's so very important. The only way how we are going to accomplish whatever I'm going to share with you is because we need to be united. It's the only way how we are going to accomplish that. So please join us one more time. International Worker Day, noon in front of the White House. And let me tell you what we believe. We believe that immigra immigration policies must be grounded in racial, economic, and gender Equity and justice, that's simple. The US policy right now is racist. We know that. So we are proposing to address this issue with five different freedoms to the US government, to you, and to all of us to make sure that we fight for those freedoms. And let me tell you very quickly about the five freedoms that we believe that are very important to change the US policy related with immigration to make sure that we have a different perspective and different world 
because what you see right over here and what our sister shared is totally unacceptable. That is what we face all the time. We have 140,000 members, mostly in the Washington metro area, but also all around the country, and they face the same challenges that you hear from our sisters. So we are proposing five, five freedoms. And let me start it with the first one. The first one is the freedom to transform. Let me describe to you what happened and how our community have been punished. When one of our members commit any crime, they don't qualify for anything in terms of immigration. Nothing, zero, because you are criminal forever, even that you pay for what you did. So we believe that people can transform, and we believe that he, people have the right to a second chance. We believe that when people pay whatever they did, they have the opportunity to receive any immigration policy assistance because right now they don't have any opportunities at all. So that is the first one. The second one, the second freedom, is that we believe the freedom to stay, to stay in our countries if we want it. If we don't want to migrate, we want to stay in our countries because we love our countries. Actually, I'm here not because I want to be here. I'm here because the reality in my country, I'm from Colombia. So the freedom to a state is so very, very important. Number three, freedom, is the freedom to move. Yes, if you want to migrate from your country to here or to wherever you, have, you want to, you need to have this freedom. That is the minimum. I mean, remember, with the, all of these businesses, corporations, and all of that, they move to whatever they want, right? Why human beings cannot have the same freedom? So that is our s number three one. And we want to have that conversation with all of you, but also with the US government. Because that is the way how we change that policy. Number four, the freedom to work, to work with dignity, with rights. Right now, people who are undocumented, you know what right they have? No rights. So they have the right to work with dignity, to unionize, to create co-ops, to do what they, whatever they wanted. It's so very, very important. So that is number four. And number five, freedom, freedom to thrive, wherever you are, to create a dignity for you and your family and your community, to make sure that you have the right to water, clean water, food, to make sure that you have the opportunity to have a space for you to live with dignity. That is our five freedom and principles that I want to share with all of you, but also with the government or the US government. And we believe that it's very important that we work together to accomplish that. Because yes, we know that the system is broke. Yes, we know that we need comprehensive immigration reform now for the 11 million people who are undocumented in this country. We believe that it's very important to recognize that the immigration system is broke and is racist. We know that, but we need to find solutions to address that. And together we can find solutions. We need to work together to make sure that we not only convince but force the US to change those policies because those policies are totally unacceptable. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Three amazing warriors here at the table sharing their thoughts, ideas, their reflections, and inspiring us to get up and uh, fight. Uh, I don't know how we did it, but we did it. It's 4.52 and, and um, we're going to get ready for the, for the closing remarks uh, from uh, our, our very three special leaders. Um, I don't think we're going to have a break. We're going to go straight into it, right? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go straight into it. And uh, let me just close by saying that in the face of 200 years of Monroe Doctrine, it is up to us, the people in the region, 
to change that reality. The change is not gonna come because one day President Biden wakes up and says, I think this is not working. I received sufficient evidence that the, the Monroe Doctrine is hurting people. That's not where things are gonna change, it's gonna come out of our hands, our thoughts, our coming together, resisting, building communities, building solidarity, and sta staying away from collaborating with any of this perverted expressions of oppression, of contemporary oppression. Hundreds of people, including this in this forum, are coming together across the region to say enough is enough. Learn more about next steps on Code Pink, learn, learn more about the Peace Summit and uh, more upcoming efforts. Next year, Mexico and the US I will have uh, presidential elections, both countries, and it's a unique opportunity to speak when one with one voice. It's now or never. Thank you very much. Thank you, great job, Marco, great panel. Thank you all for being here. And now we are going to have our closing remarks from two wonderful women. And we're gonna start with our sister, Claudia de la Cruz, who is the co-executive director of the People's Forum. Has anybody here been to the People's Forum in New York City? It is amazing. It is our People's Forum, and it's such a great model. Uh, she was born in the South Bronx to immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. She is a popular educator, community organizer, and theologian. Wow. For 20 years, she's been committed to movement building and has actively participated in collective grassroots spaces, particularly in the communities of Washington Heights and South Bronx. So let's give it up for Claudia de la Cruz. Well, while folks um, figure out the slide situation, I do want to thank, and I always do, thank the Valavarian Revolution for its commitment to the South Bronx. Um, it did very much the same thing that they did for the indigenous nations, um, the tribes that uh, Comrade Nick Estes was talking about. Um, and we had the pleasure of receiving our Comandante Chavez there in 2005. And so just want to extend my gratitude to the Venezuelan people because it is their effort that allowed us to be able to have heat in the winters. Um, this has been an amazing event. I want to thank the organizers. Shout out to Code Pink. I have the privilege of being a board member and I'm very honored and privileged to be part of, of that collective of warriors. Um, everything that has been touched on by the amazing list of panelists who have presented today brings to mind the words of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he spoke these words in 1967 in one of his most important speeches, speech that is barely ever kind of taught to us in school and is a Beyond Vietnam speech when he told us that the United States of America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. This country was built on slavery, hostility, dominance, violence, rape, coups, military interventions, dictatorships, unitarian coercive measures or sanctions, blockades. It has been built on the dismemberment of humanity and the planet. That is the foundation of the United States of America. And I refuse to call the United States of America, America, because America is a goddamn continent. I think it's important to raise that the globalization of poverty, misery, suffering, the blood and tears, the underdevelopment of the global south has been the down payment for US imperialism. As the presenters shared in the panel on economy, the economic base, the capitalist system is a predatory one. Its very nature is to pillage, to extract, to violate. 
So as we leave this forum, we must be clear that in order to bury 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, we need to dismantle the very system that has produced and maintained it. And it is good for us to be in solidarity with our comrades all over the world. It is good for us to build international projects. But you know what would be better? Do you know what would be better? What? For the US to take the responsibility of building its own revolution. <laughs> US imperialism, the global manifestation of US capitalism is a cancer. It is the most dangerous pandemic to have plagued the planet. One that must be fought and destroyed if we are to save humanity. That is what is at stake. Capitalism needs to use force to sustain itself. And it also needs to spread fears, to lie, and to manipulate. Amongst the many lies that we've been sold, not only in this country but around the world, is that it is easier for the end of the world to arrive than for capitalism to end. And that is the biggest lie that capitalism has sold to us. It has told us that capitalism is eternal, this is the way things are, that at best all we can do is reform capitalism. We have been told that imperialism cannot be defeated and that it is only through imperialist wars and interventions that we gain security and stability. The ruling class has consistently worked to terrorize and lie to us into submission and sink us into hopelessness. And all we need to do is look into history to find out that it is possible, it is possible to bring down empires. All, all empires in history have fallen, but they do not fall on their own volition. They do not fall because they grow a consciousness. They do not grow a consciousness. If we have been listening, we know that the US imperialism has no morals, has no ethics, has no consciousness. Empires fall when the masses of the majority of people, the poor and working class, grow a conscious. When we see ourselves and live in the future, connected to the lives in the future, of our sisters and brothers, those who fight imperialism every day, those living in Cuba under a blockade for over 60 years, and building, building its revolution. Those living in Venezuela resisting attacks since the conception of its revolution and deepening its revolution with people's democracy. Fidel Castro said, and I will raise his name wherever I go, Fidel Castro said, there is very little that those who have chained humanity can teach us. Only those who have broken their chains can teach us. We need to look not into Latin America and the Caribbean as a charity case, as something that we just need to give to. People have resisted for 200 years and beyond. People have learned to live and exist with dignity. That is more than the people from the United States can say. We have a lot to learn from Latin America, the Caribbean, and the global south. The Haitian people, the Haitian people have had to pay for being the first free black nation in this hemisphere. Very few people remember Haiti. We must remember Haiti. So when we talk about burying 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, let us remember our responsibility as people living in the belly of the beast. We are the ones to dismantle this monster. We are the ones to bury the corpse of imperialism. Because it will not die from age. It will reproduce itself. 
If we go back to history, we know the levels of crises that capitalism and imperialism have faced. And they always find a way to recreate themselves. The latest project was the neoliberalist project. We are in the crossroads of history. At this very moment, we are in the crossroads of history. There is a geopolitical fight that's being fought. And it is up to us, the people in the United States of America, those, who are, those of us who are part of the 160 million people who are living in poverty or below the poverty line, to grow a consciousness. Do you know what that consciousness is? My dear friend Marx called it a class consciousness. Where we understand ourselves as part of the international community of working class people. Where we are able to understand that we have more, we have way more in relationship to the global south working class than we do to the government that does not represent us. When we're able to accept that, and we can convincingly share that with others, we are very, very much few steps ahead to be able to build the change that needs to be changed here. We cannot be part of the lie and tell people that there's any reform that could be made within a capitalist system that'll actually take us where we need to go. So if we wanna bury this death machine, we gotta study this dead machine. But we must learn from those who have broken their chains. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Claudia. Learn from those who have broken their chains. And one of the really beautiful things that we have done here today is weaving in and out and recognizing the connection between our indigenous sisters and brothers in, throughout the Americas, including here in the United States. And that's why I'm really pleased to introduce Judy Talagon, who is a Chumash and Filipina land protector from the Santi Nez Band of Chumash Indians. She is the daughter of farm workers and immigrant leaders who grew up among Mexican and Filipina communities in California. She is a longtime activist. I knew her when she took part in shutting down of the uh, quincentennial celebration of the myth of discovery of Co uh, Christopher Columbus. And she is an organizer with California Indians for Cultural and Environmental Protection. Her work is based on very clear principles, creating a culture of resistance, standing in solidarity with activists from the entire hemisphere and the world, and building up women-led, indigenous, land-backed movements next to and in solidarity with black AAPI and Latinx communities. So thank you so much, Judy, for being with us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for welcoming, welcoming me so lovingly. I have allergies. So I'm struggling. I, I will. So, you know, the question is, what is next? Yeah? And uh, so I want to say that I have the beautiful blessing at this time to participate and find the joy of this event in community, that we see each other, you know, we know each other as a collective, as a human collective, in struggle, and finding our indoctrination, locating it, and healing. Yeah? So I am in uh, collaboration now to the what is next. And that is 30 scholar, you know, research scholars from out of Berkeley, California, out of UC Berkeley with Professor Moreno and the Latin X Resource Center. And our curricula is greatly based and framed on abolition. And we are going to reintroduce new characterizations to abuse. But what really brought me back to this, and I think that a lot of us are returning 
with great you know, energy to what is next. What really brought me back is Nick Estes and the collective that authored The Red Deal. And that very action. Ah, yes, thank you, thank you, yes. You know, Melanie Yazi, the, the, I think upwards to over 10 contributors, okay? So that in and of itself is an example of what we need to do in the North. Re-educate, you know, recapture our memory, our collective memory as the collective. So one of the things that we've done, I'm gonna be very action, act, you know, sort of join you into participation today. Do you have a pledge card on you? And if you have it, yes. Okay, so in the meanwhile, while they're pledging, I'm gonna tell that story. So every Friday, we're getting ready to host a People's Tribunal, greatly influenced by the work that we did in 92, because we hosted a People's Tribunal holding the United States on trial for crimes against humanity. Greatly to do with the agenda today. What grew out of today, I will just assert that now, with my drama mean, is that I was able to um, pencil in a date in February with Nicaragua, okay, to get our, um, our scholarship in line with what they're about to do down there, with the return of land to the, to the uh, African indigenous communities, the matriarchy, and we are doing that here, rematriating land, why not begin to expand that knowledge and that experience in the North? That is the driving theme, is that we need to really educate the North. We have no participation in the oppression in the, in the South. Our participation is as, as indoctrinated, you know, US citizens or residents of this particular North. Again, it was the border violence that brought me forth and witnessing at the border and knowing that the wildfire that can be created by us who reside in the north, who are tribally associated, who have that quote unquote, all of these sort of important things to Americans, recognition, uh, federal you know, status, you know, enrollment, but the blood quantum, those things have never been of any real true consequence to us, because we're still here. And if they had, we would have joined, you know, certain extermination. So let's get that card. Here we go. I would love to hear us read this together, starting with I will do pledge card, and then let's say, I, there you go. Pledge to resist imperialist policies to undermine peace in America, knowing that injustices continue to perpetuate it. I commit to organizing people power in order to stop militarization, extraction, and other forms of colonial domination. And so, during I pledge to create inclusive forms of solidarity towards our common goal of peace in the hemisphere. Thank you so much. And as we wrap up here, I want to bring forward uh, two women who've been working nonstop for a long time now. Where is Michelle Elder? And Samantha Weary, Samantha, come up front. And Olivia, you should come up too. Hi, everyone, and thanks for everyone who has stayed throughout this whole day. Um, it's been such uh, an amazing experience to be here sharing with all of you and um, to be learning from so many great thinkers uh, who joined us today. And I just want to um, 
recognize the work that, uh, you know, not just me and Michelle put into this forum, but uh, all the endorsing organizations, the steering committee, um, Greg, um, Oscar, there are so many uh, amazing people that have uh, contributed uh, to making this uh, policy uh, forum uh, what it is and what uh, it has uh, become. So yeah, and of course, Michelle. Michelle has done such an amazing uh, work. Um, she created the website and just all the little details and everything. And of course, Angela and Fred, um, who also created the, the program and um, brought so many amazing ideas to the floor and made it uh, so that it would be a more inclusive uh, forum. Uh, so I just want to give a special shout out to everyone. Who and these wonderful women have an idea that this <clears throat> is the beginning of other types of gatherings like this. And since this was done in such a communal way, we are looking for other organizations that will come forward and say, we want to do something, whether it's bringing in all these issues or more specific, and then we want to all get behind that group and work with them, and it could be anywhere in this country. So we look forward to talking to you about the next forum and the next forum so that we keep going on. And of course, there's many, many other ways that we want to keep working together. Um, we want to make sure that we have a way to work with each of the groups in their, uh, what they're working on. And just even recognize that today there's people who are at a protest around Bukele in El Salvador. Yeah. There's our wonderful sisters who have been working for freedom for Pedro Castillo in Peru and for back to constitutional rule. We have fabulous people who have been working to get Cuba off the state sponsor of terrorism list. We have people who want to free Alex Song and, and get the sanctions on Venezuela lifted and the $3 billion that belongs to the Venezuelan people back to the Venezuelan people that's being held, stolen from them. We've talked about so many wonderful issues. We also want to make sure you know that when you talk about the Americas, you have to talk about culture because there's so much inspiring, wonderful culture throughout the Americas. And that's why it's important that we gather together this evening at Bus Boys and Poets to hear from our cultural artists. And that is at the 14th and V Bus Boys and Poets this evening, starting at 7 p.m. Go, or, go from here. Uh, we're gonna go from here. And we also want to recognize that while we've been learning from these great panelists and speakers, we've also been watching the beautiful art that's been created by our friend Lulo here. So stand up, Lulo, so we can recognize you. And please don't leave without taking a look at this wonderful artistic rendition of what we've been talking about today. Yes. Decolonize, it's even got the Malvinas in there for oh. anybody who <laughs> <laughs> So we've got, um, we also want to say that there is a rally for Julian Assange that's happening on World Press Freedom Day. That's on Wednesday, May 3rd, 12 to 2, at the Department of Justice, and we'll march to the National Press Club. And of course, there is the event uh, t happening this evening of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. If anyone wants to go by there and join the people who will be blockading outside, calling for real movement on the climate crisis. Thank you.
So we've had a wonderful, wonderful time together today. And I've heard people mention twice already how under Hugo Chavez, there were these programs that brought not only heating oil, but really solidarity, north, south, south, north. And so I want to end just by remembering a time that I was in Venezuela when Hugo Chavez was addressing this mass auditorium of people, and he got them all fired up against the empire. Some of you might remember when he went to the United Nations and he talked about George Bush smelling like uh, sulfur. He was the devil. So he was talking about George Bush and the devil and those devils up in the north. And here we were, a group of people from the north that were sitting right there, and we started feeling like, oh, you know, let's kind of be invisible here. And he points to us. <laughs> and he says, but here are the people of Martin Luther King. And when we liberate ourselves from this empire, from the south, that we're going to fight to liberate ourselves, and we are working together with the people in the north who are trying to liberate themselves, we will be liberated in the Global South, and we will liberate the people of Martin Luther King. So get up, and he, and he acknowledged all of us, and we all had a great clap to understand that this liberation is coming up from the South, but it's boiling inside the empire right here in the Entrañas del Imperio in Washington, D.C. So we have so much global solidarity. I've been working on Ukraine, and every time I get really depressed about the war, I start reading about Latin America. So it's inspiring, it's wonderful. We know a lot of you have roots in Latin America, and we thank you so much for carrying those roots here with you today. And as we move forward, let us move forward, oh, uh, do giving donations. <laughs> Because this took a lot of money to put on, we will have donation baskets as you leave or up here as well, if you can put something into there. And we would like your photos. Oh, a group photo. And we have one more important person to thank here. Don't move, Tigberry. We want to thank Tig for all the work in putting the logistics of this together for the last few days, working so hard. And we're going to do, uh, where are we going to do the group photo? Yeah. So we're going to do a group photo here, right over here. And um, we're going to organize this with the tall people in the back so we know that that includes Nick Estes and Greg and <laughs> Leo. Tall people in the back, short ones in front. But let's give one more applause to everybody who worked so hard to make this day possible. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. Ni un paso atrás. Venceremos. Venceremos, pero varios pasos adelante.